A History of Philosophy by Frederick Copleston, S.J. Volume 7. Modern Philosophy, From the Post-Kantian Idealists to Marx, Kierkegaard, and Nietzsche. Frederick Golston, S.J. Preface. As Volume 6 of this History of Philosophy ended with Kant, the natural procedure was to open the present volume with a discussion of post-Kantian German idealism. I might then have turned to the philosophy of the first part of the 19th century in France and Great Britain. But on reflection it seemed to me that 19th century German philosophy could reasonably be treated on its own, and that this would confer on the volume a greater unity than would otherwise be possible. And in point of fact the only non-German speaking philosopher considered in the book is Kierkegaard, who wrote in Danish. The volume has been entitled Fichte to Nietzsche, Els Nietzsche is the last world-famous philosopher who is considered at any length. It might indeed have been called Fitch to Heidegger. For not only have a good many philosophers been mentioned who were chronologically posterior to Nietzsche, but also in the last chapter a glance has been taken at German philosophy in the first half of the 20th century. But I decided that to call the volume Fitch to Heidegger would tend to mislead prospective readers. For it would suggest that 20th century philosophers such as Husserl, N. Hartmann, Jaspers, and Heidegger are treated, so to speak, for their own sake, in the same way Els Fitch, Schelling, and Hegel, whereas in fact they are discussed briefly as illustrating different ideas of the nature and scope of philosophy. In the present work, there are one or two variations from the pattern generally followed in preceding volumes. The introductory chapter deals only with the idealist movement, and it has therefore been placed within part I, not before it. And though in the final chapter there are some retrospective reflections, there is also, as already indicated, a preview of thought in the first half of the 20th century. Hence I have called this chapter Retrospect and Prospect rather than Concluding Review. Apart from the reasons given in the text for referring to 20th century thought there is the reason that I do not propose to include within this history any full-scale treatment of the philosophy of the present century. At the same time I did not wish to end the volume abruptly without any reference at AJL to later developments. The result is, of course, that one lays oneself open to the comment that it would be better to say nothing about these developments than to make some sketchy and inadequate remarks. However, I decided to risk this criticism. To economize on space I have confined the bibliography at the end of the book to general works and to works by and on the major figures. As for minor philosophers, many of their writings are mentioned at the appropriate places in the text. In view of the number both of 19th century philosophers and of their publications, and in view of the vast literature on some of the major figures, anything like a full bibliography is out of the question. In the case of the 20th century thinkers mentioned in the final chapter, some books are referred to in the text or in footnotes, but no explicit bibliography has been given. Apart from the problem of space I felt that it would be inappropriate to supply, for example, a bibliography on Heidegger when he is only briefly mentioned. The present writer hopes to devote a further volume, the eighth in this history, to some aspects of French and British thought in the 19th century. But he does not propose to spread his net any farther. Instead he plans, circumstances permitting, to turn in a supplementary volume to what may be called the philosophy of the history of philosophy, that is, to reflection on the development of philosophical thought rather than to telling the story of this development. A final remark. A friendly critic observed that this work would be more appropriately called a history of Western philosophy or a history of European philosophy than a history of philosophy without addition. For there is no mention, for instance, of Indian philosophy. The critic was, of course, quite right. But I should like to remark that the omission of Oriental philosophy is neither an oversight nor due to any prejudice on the author's part. The composition of a history of Oriental philosophy is a work for a specialist and requires a knowledge of the relevant languages which the present writer does not possess. Bourdieu included a volume on Oriental philosophy in his Histoire de la Philosophique, but it was not written by B.R. Six here. 
Finally I have pleasure in expressing my gratitude to the Oxford University Press for their kind permission to quote from Kierkegaard's The Point of View and Fear and Trembling according to the English translations published by them, and to the Princeton University Press for similar permission to quote from Kierkegaard's Sickness unto Death, Concluding Unscientific Postscript and the Concept of Dread. In the case of quotations from philosophers other than Kierkegaard I have translated the passages myself. But I have frequently given page references to existing English translations for the benefit of readers who wish to consult a translation rather than the original. In the case of minor figures, however, I have generally omitted references to translations. Preliminary Remarks Kant's Philosophy and Idealist Metaphysics The Meaning of Idealism its insistence on system and its confidence in the power and scope of philosophy the idealists and theology the romantic movement and German idealism the difficulty in fulfilling the idealist program the anthropomorphic element in German idealism idealist philosophies of man. I in the German philosophical world during the early part of the 19th century we find one of the most remarkable flowerings of metaphysical speculation which have occurred in the long history of Western philosophy. We are presented with a succession of systems, of original interpretations of reality and of human life and history, which possess a grandeur that can hardly be called in question and which are still capable of exercising on some minds at least a peculiar power of fascination. For each of the leading philosophers of the period professes to solve the riddle of the world, to reveal the secret of the universe and the meaning of human existence. True. Before the death of Schelling in 1854 Auguste Comte in France had already published his course of positive philosophy in which metaphysics was represented as a passing stage in the history of human thought. And Germany was to have its own positivist and materialist movements which, while not killing metaphysics, would force metaphysicians to reflect on and define more closely the relation between philosophy and the particular sciences. But in the early decades of the 19th century the shadow of positivism had not yet fallen across the scene and speculative philosophy enjoyed a period of uninhibited and luxuriant growth. With the great German idealists we find a superb confidence in the power of the human reason and in the scope of philosophy. Looking on reality as the self-manifestation of infinite reason, they thought that the life of self-expression of this reason could be retraced in philosophical reflection. They were not nervous men looking over their shoulders to see if critics were whispering that they were producing poetic effusions under the thin disguise of theoretical philosophy, or that their profundity and obscure language were a mask for lack of clarity of thought. On the contrary, they were convinced that the human spirit had at last come into its own and that the nature of reality was at last clearly revealed to human consciousness. And each set out his vision of the universe with a splendid confidence in its objective truth. It can, of course, hardly be denied that German idealism makes on most people today the impression of belonging to another world, to another climate of thought. And we can say that the death of Hegel in 1831 marked the end of an epoch. For it was followed by the collapse of absolute idealism one and the emergence of other lines of thought. Even metaphysics took a different turn and the superb confidence in the power and range of speculative philosophy which was characteristic of Hegel in particular has never been regained. But though German idealism sped through the sky like a rocket and after a comparatively short space of time disintegrated and fell to earth, its flight was extremely impressive. Whatever its shortcomings, it represented one of the most sustained attempts which the history of thought has known to achieve a unified conceptual mastery of reality and experience as a whole. And even if the presuppositions of idealism are rejected, the idealist systems can still retain the power of stimulating the natural impulse of the reflective mind to strive after a unified conceptual synthesis. Some are indeed convinced that the elaboration of an overall view of reality is not the proper task of scientific philosophy. And even those who do not share this conviction may well think that the achievement of a final systematic synthesis lies beyond the capacity of any one man and is more of an ideal goal than a practical possibility. But we should be prepared to recognize intellectual stature when we meet it. Hegel in particular towers up in impressive grandeur above the vast majority of those who have tried to belittle him. And we can always learn from an outstanding philosopher, even if it is only by reflecting on our reasons for disagreeing with him.
the historical collapse of metaphysical idealism does not necessarily entail the conclusion that the great idealists won the fact that there were later idealist movements in Britain, America, Italy and elsewhere does not alter the fact that after Hegel metaphysical idealism in Germany suffered an eclipse. Have nothing of value to offer. German idealism has its fantastic aspects, but the writings of the leading idealists are very far from being all fantasy. 2. The point which we have to consider here is not, however, the collapse of German idealism but its rise. And this indeed stands in need of some explanation. On the one hand the immediate philosophical background of the idealist movement was provided by the critical philosophy of Immanuel Kant, who had attacked the claims of metaphysicians to provide theoretical knowledge of reality. On the other hand the German idealists looked on themselves as the true spiritual successors of Kant and not as simply reacting against his ideas. What we have to explain, therefore, is how metaphysical idealism could develop out of the system of a thinker whose name is forever associated with skepticism about metaphysics claim to provide us with theoretical knowledge about reality as a whole or indeed about any reality other than the a priori structure of human knowledge and experience. One the most convenient starting point for an explanation of the development of metaphysical idealism out of the critical philosophy is the Kantian notion of the thing in itself. Two in Fichte's view Kant had placed himself in an impossible position by steadfastly refusing to abandon this notion. On the one hand, if Kant had asserted the existence of the thing in itself as cause of the given or material element in sensation, he would have been guilty of an obvious inconsistency. For according to his own philosophy the concept of cause cannot be used to extend our knowledge beyond the phenomenal sphere. On the other hand, if Kant retained the idea of the thing in itself simply as a problematical and limiting notion, this was tantamount to retaining a ghostly relic of the very dogmatism which it was the mission of the critical philosophy to overcome. Kant's Copernican revolution was a great step forward, and for Fichte there could be no question of moving backwards to a pre-Kantian position. If one had any understanding of the development of philosophy and of the demands of modern thought, one could only go forward and complete Kant's work. And this meant eliminating the thing in itself. For, given Kant's premises, there was no room for an unknowable occult entity supposed to be independent of mind. In other words, the critical philosophy had to be transformed into a consistent idealism, and this meant that things had to be regarded in their entirety as products of thought. Now, it is immediately obvious that what we think of as the extramental world cannot be interpreted as the product of conscious creative activity by the human mind. As far as ordinary consciousness is concerned, I find myself in a world of objects which affect me in various ways and which I spontaneously think of as existing independently of my thought and will. Hence the idealist philosopher must go behind consciousness, as it were, and retrace the process of the unconscious activity which grounds it. But we must go further than this and recognize that the production of the world cannot be attributed to the individual self at all, even to its unconscious activity. For if it were attributed to the individual finite self as such, it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to avoid solipsism, a position which can hardly be seriously maintained. Idealism is thus compelled to go behind the finite subject to a super-individual intelligence, an absolute subject. The word subject, however, is not really appropriate, except as indicating that the ultimate productive principle lies, so to speak, on the side of thought and not on the side of the sensible thing. For the word subject and object are correlative. And the ultimate principle is, considered in itself, without object. It grounds the subject-object relationship and, in itself, transcends the relationship. It is subject and object in identity, the infinite activity from which both proceed. Post-Kantian idealism was thus necessarily a metaphysics. Fichte, starting from the position of Kant and developing it into idealism, not unnaturally began by calling his first principle the ego, turning Kant's transcendental ego into a metaphysical or ontological principle. But he explained that he meant by this the absolute ego, not the individual finite ego. But with the other idealists, and with Fichte himself in his later philosophy, 
the word ego is not used in this context. With Hegel the ultimate principle is infinite reason, infinite spirit. And we can say that for metaphysical idealism in general reality is the process of the self-expression or self-manifestation of infinite thought or reason. This does not mean, of course, that the world is reduced to a process of thinking in the ordinary sense. Absolute thought or reason is regarded as an activity, as productive reason which posits or expresses itself in the world. And the world retains all the reality. Which we see it to possess. Metaphysical idealism does not involve the thesis that empirical reality consists of subjective ideas, but it involves the vision of the world and human history as the objective expression of creative reason. This vision was fundamental in the outlook of the German idealist, he could not avoid it. For he accepted the necessity of transforming the critical philosophy into idealism. And this transformation meant that the world in its entirety had to be regarded as the product of creative thought or reason. If, therefore, we look on the need for transforming the philosophy of Kant into idealism as a premise, we can say that this premise determined the basic vision of the post-Kantian idealists. But when it comes to explaining what is meant by saying that reality is a process of creative thought, there is room for different interpretations, for the several particular visions of the different idealist philosophers. The direct influence of Kant's thought was naturally felt more strongly by Fichte than by Schelling or Hegel. For Schelling's philosophizing presupposed the earlier stages of Fichte's thought, and Hegel's absolute idealism presupposed the earlier phases of the philosophies of both Fichte and Schelling. But this does not alter the fact that the movement of German idealism as a whole presupposed the critical philosophy. And in his account of the history of modern philosophy Hegel depicted the Kantian system as representing an advance on preceding stages of thought and as demanding to be itself developed and surpassed in succeeding stages. In this section reference has been made so far only to the process of eliminating the thing in itself and transferring Kant's philosophy into metaphysical idealism. But it was certainly not my intention to suggest that the post-Kantian idealists were influenced only by the idea that the thing in itself had to be eliminated. They were also influenced by other aspects of the critical philosophy. For example, Kant's doctrine of the primacy of the practical reason had a powerful appeal for Fichte's strongly marked ethical outlook. And we find him interpreting the absolute ego as an infinite practical reason or moral will which posits nature as a field and instrument for moral activity. In his philosophy the concepts of action, of duty, and of moral vocation are extremely prominent. And we are perhaps entitled to say that Fichte turned Kant's second critique into a metaphysics, employing his development of the first critique as a means of doing so. With Schelling, however, the prominence given to the philosophy of art, to the role of genius and to the metaphysical significance of aesthetic intuition and artistic creation links him with the third critique rather than with the first or second. But instead of dwelling at length on the particular ways in which different parts or aspects of Kant's philosophy influence this or that idealist, it will be more appropriate in our introductory chapter if we take a broader and more general view of the relation between the critical philosophy and metaphysical idealism. The desire to form a coherent and unified interpretation of reality is natural to the reflective mind. But the actual task to be performed presents itself in different ways at different times. For example, the development of physical science in the post-medieval world meant that the philosopher who wished to construct an overall interpretation had to grapple with the problem of reconciling the scientific view of the world as a mechanical system with the demands of the moral and religious consciousness. Descartes was faced with this problem. And so was Kant. One but though Kant rejected the ways of dealing with this problem which were characteristic of his philosophical predecessors and offered his own original solution, it is arguable that in the long run he left us with a bifurcated reality. Two on the one hand we have the phenomenal world, the world of Newtonian science, governed by necessary causal laws. Three on the other hand there is the supersensuous world of the free moral agent and of God. There is no valid reason for asserting that the phenomenal world is the only reality. For but at the same time there is no theoretical proof of the existence of a supersensuous reality. It is a matter of practical faith, resting on the moral consciousness. 
It is true that in the third critique Kant endeavored to bridge the gulf between the two worlds to the extent in which he considered this to be possible for the human mind. 5. But it is understandable if other philosophers were not satisfied with his performance. And the German idealists were able to proceed beyond Kant by means of their development and transformation of his philosophy. For if reality is the unified process by which absolute thought or reason manifests itself, it is intelligible. And it is intelligible by the human mind, provided that this mind can be regarded as the vehicle, as it were, of absolute thought reflecting on itself. This condition possesses an obvious importance if there is to be any continuity between Kant's idea of the only possible scientific metaphysics of the future and the idealist's conception of metaphysics. For Kant the metaphysics of the future is a transcendental critique of human experience and knowledge. We can say in fact that it is the human mind's reflective awareness of its own spontaneous formative activity. In metaphysical idealism, however, the activity in question is productive in the fullest sense, the thing in itself having been eliminated, and this activity is attributed, not to the finite human mind as such, but to absolute thought or reason. Hence philosophy, which is reflection by the human mind, cannot be regarded as absolute thought's reflective awareness of itself unless the human mind is capable of rising to the absolute point of view and becoming the vehicle, as it were, of absolute thought or reason's reflective awareness of its own activity. If this condition is fulfilled, there is a certain continuity between Kant's idea of the only possible scientific type of metaphysics and the idealist conception of metaphysics. There is also, of course, an obvious inflation, so to speak. That is to say, the Kantian theory of knowledge is inflated into a metaphysics of reality. But the process of inflation retains a certain measure of continuity. While going far beyond anything that Kant himself envisaged, it is not a simple reversion to a pre-Kantian conception of metaphysics. The transformation of the Kantian theory of knowledge into a metaphysics of reality carries with it, of course, certain important changes. For example, if with the elimination of the thing in itself the world becomes the self-manifestation of thought or reason, the Kantian distinction between the a priori and the a posteriori loses its absolute character. And the categories, instead of being subjective forms or conceptual molds of the human understanding, become categories of reality, they regain an objective status. Again, the teleological judgment is no longer subjective, as with Kant. For in metaphysical idealism the idea of purposiveness in nature cannot be simply a heuristic or regulative principle of the human mind, a principle which performs a useful function but the objectivity of which cannot be theoretically proved. If nature is the expression and manifestation of thought or reason in its movement towards a goal, the process of nature must be teleological in character. It cannot indeed be denied that there is a very great difference between Kant's modest idea of the scope and power of metaphysics and the idealist's notion of what metaphysical philosophy is capable of achieving. Kant himself repudiated Fichte's demand for the transformation of the critical philosophy into pure idealism by the elimination of the thing in itself. And it is easy to understand the attitude of the Neo-Kantians who, later in the century, announced that they had had enough of the airy metaphysical speculations of the idealists and that it was time to return to the spirit of Kant himself. At the same time the development of Kant's system into metaphysical idealism is not unintelligible, and the remarks in this section may have helped to explain how the idealists were able to look on themselves as Kant's legitimate spiritual successors. 3. It will be clear from what has been said about the development of metaphysical idealism that the post-Kantian idealists were not subjective idealists in the sense of holding that the human mind knows only its own ideas as distinct from extramentally existing things. Nor were they subjective idealists in the sense of holding that all objects of knowledge are the products of the finite human subject. True. Fichte's use of the word ego in his earlier writings tended to give the impression that this was precisely what he did hold but the impression was mistaken. For Fichte insisted that the productive subject was not the finite ego as such but the absolute ego, a transcendental and super-individual principle. And as for Schelling and Hegel, any reduction of things to products of the individual finite mind was entirely foreign to their thought. 
but though it is easily understood that post-Kantian idealism did not involve subjective idealism in either of the senses alluded to in the last paragraph, it is not so easy to give a general description of the movement which will apply to all the leading idealist systems. For they differ in important respects. Moreover, the thought of Schelling in particular moved through successive phases. At the same time there is, of course, a family likeness between the different systems. And this fact justifies one in venturing on some generalizations. Inasmuch as reality is looked on as the self-expression or self unfolding of absolute thought or reason, there is a marked tendency in German idealism to assimilate the causal relation to the logical relation of implication. For example, the empirical world is conceived by Fichte and by Schelling, in at any rate the earlier phases of the latter's thought, as standing to the ultimate productive principle in the relation of consequent to antecedent. And this means, of course, that the world follows necessarily from the first productive principle, the priority of which is logical and not temporal. Obviously, there is not and cannot be any question of external compulsion. But the absolute spontaneously and inevitably manifests itself in the world. And there is really no place for the idea of creation in time, in the sense of there being an ideally assignable first moment of time. One this notion of reality as the self-unfolding of absolute reason helps to explain the idealist's insistence on system. For if philosophy is the reflective reconstruction of the structure of a dynamic rational process, it should be systematic, in the sense that it should begin with the first principle and exhibit the essential rational structure of reality as flowing from it. True, the idea of a purely theoretical deduction does not in practice occupy such an important place in metaphysical idealism as the foreground dialectical process of Fichte and above all Hegel tends to suggest. For idealist philosophy is the conceptual reconstruction of a dynamic activity, a self-unfolding infinite life, rather than a strict analysis of the meaning and implications of one or more initial basic propositions. But the general worldview is embryonically contained in the initial idea of the world as the process of absolute reason self-manifestation. And it is the business of philosophy to give systematic articulation to this idea, reliving the process, as it were, on the plane of reflective awareness. Hence, though it would be possible to start from the empirical manifestations of absolute reason and work backwards, metaphysical idealism naturally follows a deductive form of exposition, in the sense that it systematically retraces a teleological movement. Now, if we assume that reality is a rational process and that its essential dynamic structure is penetrable by the philosopher, this assumption is naturally accompanied by a confidence in the power and scope of metaphysics which contrasts sharply with Kant's modest estimate of what it can achieve. And this contrast is obvious enough if one compares the critical philosophy with Hegel's system of absolute idealism. Indeed, it is probably true to say that Hegel's confidence in the power and reach of philosophy was unequaled by any previous philosopher of note. At the same time we have seen in the last section that there was a certain continuity between Kant's philosophy and metaphysical idealism. And we can even say, though it is a paradoxical statement, that the closer idealism kept to Kant's idea of the only possible form of scientific metaphysics, the greater was its confidence in the power and scope of philosophy. For if we assume that philosophy is thought's reflective awareness of its own spontaneous activity, and if we substitute a context of idealist metaphysics for the context of Kant's theory of human knowledge and experience, we then have the idea of the rational process, which is reality, becoming aware of itself in and through man's philosophical reflection. In this case the history of philosophy is the history of absolute reason self-reflection. In other words, the universe knows itself in and through the mind of man and philosophy can be interpreted as the self-knowledge of the absolute. True, this conception of philosophy is characteristic more of Hegel than of the other leading idealists. Fichte ended by insisting on a divine absolute which in itself transcends the reach of human thought, and in his later philosophy of religion Schelling emphasized the idea of a personal God who reveals himself to man. It is with Hegel that the idea of the philosopher's conceptual mastery of all reality and the interpretation of this mastery as the self-reflection of the absolute become most prominent. 
but to say this is simply to say that it is in Hegelianism, the greatest achievement of metaphysical idealism, that the faith in the power and scope of speculative philosophy which inspired the idealist movement finds its purest and most grandiose expression. 4. Mention has just been made of Fichte's later doctrine of the absolute and of Schelling's philosophy of religion. And it is appropriate to say something here of the relations between German idealism and theology. For it is important to understand that the idealist movement was not simply the result of a transformation of the critical philosophy into metaphysics. All three of the leading idealists started as students of theology, Fichte at Jena, Schelling, and Hegel at Tübingen. And though it is true that they turned very quickly to philosophy, theological themes played a conspicuous role in the development of German idealism. Nietzsche's Statement that the philosophers in question were concealed theologians was misleading in some respects, but it was not altogether without foundation. The importance of the role played by theological themes in German idealism can be illustrated by the following contrast. Though not a professional scientist Kant was always interested in science. His first writings were mainly concerned with scientific topics, one and one of his primary questions was about the conditions which render scientific knowledge possible. Hegel, however, came to philosophy from theology. His first writings were largely theological in character, and he was later to declare that the subject matter of philosophy is God and nothing but God. Whether the term God, as here used, is to be understood in anything approaching a theistic sense is not a question which need detain us at present. The point to be made is that Hegel's point of departure was the theme of the relation between the infinite and the finite, between God and creatures. His mind could not remain satisfied with a sharp distinction between the infinite being on the one hand and finite beings on the other, and he tried to bring them together, seeing the infinite in the finite and the finite in the infinite. In the theological phase of his development he was inclined to think that the elevation of the finite to the infinite could take place only in the life of love, and he then drew the conclusion that philosophy must in the long run yield to religion. As a philosopher, he tried to exhibit the relation between the infinite and the finite conceptually, in thought, and tended to depict philosophical reflection as a higher form of understanding than the way of thinking which is characteristic of the religious consciousness. But the general theme of the relation between the infinite and the finite which runs through his philosophical system was taken over, as it were, from his early theological reflections. It is not, however, simply a question of Hegel. In Fichte's earlier philosophy the theme of the relation between the infinite and the finite is not indeed conspicuous, for he was primarily concerned with the completion, as he saw it, of Kant's deduction of consciousness. But in his later thought the idea of one infinite divine life comes to the fore, and the religious aspects of his philosophy were developed. As for Schelling, he did not hesitate to say that the relation between the divine infinite and the finite is the chief problem of philosophy. And his later thought was profoundly religious in character, the ideas of man's alienation from and return to God playing a prominent role. Being philosophers, the idealists tried, of course, to understand the relation between the infinite and the finite. And they tended to view it according to the analogy of logical implication. Further, if we make the necessary exception for Schelling's later religious philosophy, we can say that the idea of a personal God who is both infinite and fully transcendent seemed to the idealists to be both illogical and unduly anthropomorphic. Hence we find a tendency to transform the idea of God into the idea of the absolute, in the sense of the all-comprehensive totality. At the same time the idealists had no intention of denying the reality of the finite. Hence the problem which faced them was that of including, as it were, the finite within the life of the infinite without depriving the former of its reality. And the difficulty of solving this problem is responsible for a good deal of the ambiguity in metaphysical idealism when it is a question of defining its relation to theism on the one hand and pantheism on the other. But in any case it is clear that a central theological theme, namely the relation between God and the world, looms large in the speculations of the German idealists. It has been said above that Nietzsche's description of the German idealists as concealed theologians is misleading in some respects. 
for it suggests that the idealists were concerned with reintroducing Orthodox Christianity by the back door, whereas in point of fact we find a marked tendency to substitute metaphysics for faith and to rationalize the revealed mysteries of Christianity, bringing them within the scope of the speculative reason. To use a modern term, we find a tendency to demythologize Christian dogmas, turning them in the process into a speculative philosophy. Hence we may be inclined to smile at J. H. Sterling's picture of Hegel as the great philosophical champion of Christianity. We may be more inclined to accept McTaggart's view, and also Kierkegaard's, that the Hegelian philosophy undermined Christianity from within as it were, by professing to lay bare the rational content of the Christian doctrines in their traditional form. And we may feel that the connection which Fitch sought to establish between his later philosophy of the Absolute and the first chapter of St. John's Gospel was somewhat tenuous. At the same time there is no cogent reason for supposing, for instance, that Hegel had his tongue in his cheek when he referred to St. Anselm and to the process of faith-seeking understanding. His early essays showed marked hostility to positive Christianity, but he came to change his attitude and to take the Christian faith under his wing, so to speak. It would be absurd to claim that Hegel was in fact an Orthodox Christian. But he was doubtless sincere when he represented the relation of Christianity to Hegelianism as being that of the absolute religion to the absolute philosophy, two different ways of apprehending and expressing the same truth content. From an orthodox theological standpoint Hegel must be judged to have substituted reason for faith, philosophy for revelation, and to have defended Christianity by rationalizing it and turning it, to borrow a phrase from McTaggart, into exoteric Hegelianism. But this does not alter the fact that Hegel thought of himself as having demonstrated the truth of the Christian religion. Nietzsche's statement, therefore, was not altogether wide of the mark, especially if one takes into account the development in the religious aspects of Fichte's thought and the later phases of Schelling's philosophy. And in any case the German idealists certainly attributed significance and value to the religious consciousness and found a place for it in their systems. They may have turned from theology to philosophy, but they were very far from being irreligious men or rationalists in a modern sense. 5. But there is another aspect of metaphysical idealism which must also be mentioned, namely its relation to the Romantic movement in Germany. The description of German idealism as the philosophy of Romanticism is indeed open to serious objection. In the first place it suggests the idea of a one-way influence. That is to say, it suggests that the great idealist systems were simply the ideological expression of the Romantic spirit, whereas in point of fact the philosophies of Fichte and Schelling exercised a considerable influence on some of the Romantics. In the second place, the leading idealist philosophers stood in somewhat different relations to the Romantics. We can say indeed that Schelling gave notable expression to the spirit of the Romantic movement. But Fichte indulged in some sharp criticism of the Romantics, even if the latter had derived inspiration from certain of his ideas. And Hegel had scant sympathy with some aspects of Romanticism. In the third place it is arguable that the term philosophy of Romanticism would be better applied to the speculative ideas developed by Romantics such as Friedrich Schlegel, 1772-1829, and Novalis, 1772-1801, than to the great idealist systems. At the same time there was undoubtedly some spiritual affinity between the idealist and romantic movements. The romantic spirit as such was indeed an attitude towards life and the universe rather than a systematic philosophy. One may perhaps borrow Rudolf Carnap's terms and speak of it as a Lebensgeschlechtel or Lebensseinstellion. One and it is perfectly understandable that Hegel saw a considerable difference between systematic philosophical reflection and the utterances of the Romantics. But when we look back on the German scene in the first part of the 19th century, we are naturally struck by affinities as well as by differences. After all, metaphysical idealism and Romanticism were more or less contemporary German cultural phenomena, and an underlying spiritual affinity is only what one might expect to find. The romantic spirit is notoriously difficult to define. Nor indeed should one expect to be able to define it. But one can, of course, mention some of its characteristic traits. For example, 
as against the Enlightenment's concentration on the critical, analytic, and scientific understanding the Romantics exalted the power of the creative imagination and the role of feeling and intuition. To the artistic genius took the place of L.E. philosophy. But the emphasis which was laid on the creative imagination and on artistic genius formed part of a general emphasis on the free and full development of the human personality, on man's creative powers and on enjoyment of the wealth of possible human experience. In other words, stress was laid on the originality of each human person rather than on what is common to all men. And this insistence on the creative personality was sometimes associated with a tendency to ethical subjectivism. That is to say, there was a tendency to depreciate fixed universal moral laws or rules in favor of the free development of the self in accordance with values rooted in and corresponding to the individual personality. I do not mean to imply by this that the Romantics had no concern for morality and moral values. But there was a tendency, with F. Schlegel for example, to emphasize the free pursuit by the individual of his own moral ideal, the fulfillment of his own idea, rather than obedience to universal laws dictated by the impersonal practical reason. In developing their ideas of the creative personality some of the Romantics derived inspiration and stimulus from Fichte's early thought. This is true of both F. Schlegel and Novalis. But it does not follow, of course, that the use which they made of Fichte's ideas always corresponded with the philosopher's intentions. An example will make this clear. As we have seen, in his transformation of the Kantian philosophy into pure idealism Fichte took as his ultimate creative principle the transcendental ego, considered as unlimited activity. And in his systematic deduction or reconstruction of consciousness he made copious use of the idea of the productive imagination. Novala seized on these ideas and represented Fichte as opening up to view the wonders of the creative self. But he made an important change. Fichte was concerned with explaining on idealist principles the situation in which the finite subject finds itself in a world of objects which are given to it and which affect it in various ways, as in sensation. He therefore represented the activity of the so-called productive imagination, when it posits the object as affecting the finite self, as taking place below the level of consciousness. By transcendental reflection the philosopher can be aware that this activity takes place, but neither he nor anyone else is aware of it as taking place. For the positing of the object is logically prior to all awareness or consciousness. And this activity of the productive imagination is certainly not modifiable at the will of the finite self. Novalis, however, depicted the activity of the productive imagination as modifiable by the will. Just as the artist creates works of art, so is man a creative power not only in the moral sphere but also, in principle at least, in the natural sphere. Fichte's transcendental idealism was thus turned into Novalis's magical idealism. In other words, Novala seized on some of Fichte's philosophical theories and used them in the service of a poetic and romantic extravaganza, to exalt the creative self. Further, the Romantics' emphasis on the creative genius links them with Schelling much more than with Fichte. As will be seen in due course, it was the former and not the latter who laid stress on the metaphysical significance of art and on the role of artistic genius. When Friedrich Schlegel asserted that there is no greater world than the world of art and that the artist exhibits the idea in finite form, and when Novalis asserted that the poet is the true magician, the embodiment of the creative power of the human self, they were speaking in ways which were more in tune with the thought of Schelling than with the strongly ethical outlook of Fichte. Emphasis on the creative self was, however, only one aspect of Romanticism. Another important aspect was the Romantics' conception of nature. Instead of conceiving nature simply as a mechanical system, so that they would be forced to make a sharp contrast, as in Cartesianism, between man and nature, the Romantics tended to look on nature as a living organic whole which is in some way akin to spirit and which is clothed in beauty and mystery. And some of them showed a marked sympathy with Spinoza, that is, a romanticized Spinoza. This view of nature as an organic totality akin to spirit again links the Romantics with Schelling. The philosopher's idea of nature below man as slumbering spirit and the human spirit as the organ of nature's consciousness of herself was thoroughly romantic in tone. It is significant that the poet Hold Erlen, 
1771-1843, was a friend of Schelling when they were fellow students, at Tübingen. And the poet's view of nature as a living comprehensive whole seems to have exercised some influence on the philosopher. In turn Schelling's philosophy of nature exercised a powerful stimulative influence on some of the Romantics. As for the Romantics' sympathy with Spinoza, this was shared by the theologian and philosopher Schleier Macher. But it was certainly not shared by Fichte who had a profound dislike for anything approaching a divinization of nature, which he looked on simply as a field and instrument for free moral activity. In this respect he was anti-romantic in his outlook. The Romantic's attachment to the idea of nature as an organic living totality does not mean, however, that they emphasized nature to the detriment, so to speak, of man. We have seen that they also stressed the free creative personality. In the human spirit nature reaches, as it were, its culmination. Hence the Romantic idea of nature could be and was allied with a marked appreciation of the continuity of historical and cultural development and of the significance of past cultural periods for the unfolding of the potentialities of the human spirit. Hold Erlen, for example, had a Romantic enthusiasm for the genius of ancient Greece, one an enthusiasm which was shared by Hegel in his student days. But special attention can be drawn here to the reawakened interest in the Middle Ages. The man of the Enlightenment had tended to see in the medieval period a dark night which preceded the dawn of the Renaissance and the subsequent emergence of lay philosopher. But for Novalis the Middle Ages represented, even if imperfectly, an ideal of the organic unity of faith and culture, an ideal which should be recovered. Further, the Romantics showed a strong attachment to the idea of the spirit of a people, Volksgeist, and an interest in the cultural manifestation of this spirit, such as language. In this respect they continued the thought of Herder I and other predecessors. The idealist philosophers not unnaturally shared this appreciation of historical continuity and development. For history was for them the working out in time of a spiritual idea, a telos, or end. Each of the great idealists had his philosophy of history, that of Hegel being particularly notable. As Fichte looked on nature primarily as an instrument for moral activity, he naturally laid more emphasis on the sphere of the human spirit and on history as a movement towards the realization of an ideal moral world order. In Schelling's philosophy of religion history appears as the story of the return to God of fallen humanity, of man alienated from the true center of his being. With Hegel the idea of the dialectic of national spirits plays a prominent role, though this is accompanied by an insistence on the part played by so-called world historical individuals. And the movement of history as a whole is depicted as a movement towards the realization of spiritual freedom. In general, we can say, the great idealists regarded their epoch as a time in which the human spirit had become conscious of the significance of its activity in history and of the meaning or direction of the whole historical process. Above all perhaps Romanticism was characterized by a feeling for and longing for the infinite. And the ideas of nature and of human history were brought together in the conception of them as manifestations of one infinite life, as aspects of a kind of divine poem. Thus the notion of infinite life served as a unifying factor in the Romantic world outlook. At first sight perhaps the Romantics' attachment to the idea of the Volksgeist may appear to be at variance with their emphasis on the free development of the individual personality. But there was really no radical incompatibility. For the infinite totality was conceived, generally speaking, as infinite life which manifested itself in and through finite beings. But not as annihilating them or as reducing them to mere mechanical instruments and the spirits of peoples were conceived as manifestations of the same infinite life, as relative totalities which required for their full development the free expression of the individual personalities which were the bearers, so to speak, of these spirits. And the same can be said of the state, considered as the political embodiment of the spirit of a people. The typical romantic was inclined to conceive the infinite totality aesthetically, as an organic whole with which man felt himself to be one, the means of apprehending this unity being intuition and feeling rather than conceptual thought. For conceptual thought tends to fix and perpetuate defined limits and boundaries, whereas Romanticism tends to dissolve limits and boundaries in the infinite flow of life. 
In other words, romantic feeling for the infinite was not infrequently a feeling for the indefinite. And this trait can be seen as well in the tendency to obscure the boundary between the infinite and the finite as in the tendency to confuse philosophy with poetry or, within the artistic sphere itself, to intermingle the arts. Partly, of course, it was a question of seeing affinities and of synthesizing different types of human experience. Thus F. Schlegel regarded philosophy as akin to religion on the ground that both are concerned with the infinite and that every relation of man to the infinite can be said to belong to religion. Indeed art too is religious in character, for the creative artist sees the infinite in the finite, in the form of beauty. At the same time the Romantic's repugnance to definite limits and clear-cut form was one of the reasons which led Goethe to make his famous statement that the classical is the healthy and the Romantic the diseased. For the matter of that, some of the Romantics themselves came to feel the need for giving definite shape to their intuitive and rather hazy visions of life and reality and for combining the nostalgia for the infinite and for the free expression of the individual personality with the recognition of definite limits. And certain representatives of the movement, such as F. Schlegel, found in Catholicism a fulfillment of this need. The feeling for the infinite obviously constitutes common ground for Romanticism and idealism. The idea of the infinite absolute, conceived as infinite life, comes to the fore in Fichte's later philosophy, and the absolute is a central theme in the philosophies of Schelling, Schleiermacher, and Hegel. Further, we can say that the German idealists tend to conceive the infinite not as something set over against the finite but as infinite life or activity which expresses itself in and through the finite. With Hegel especially there is a deliberate attempt to mediate between the finite and the infinite, to bring them together without either identifying the infinite with the finite or dismissing the latter as unreal or illusory. The totality lives in and through its particular manifestations, whether it is a question of the infinite totality, the absolute, or of a relative totality such as the state. The spiritual affinity between the romantic and idealist movements is thus unquestionable. And it can be illustrated by many examples. For instance, when Hegel depicts art, religion, and philosophy as concerned with the absolute, though in different ways, we can see an affinity between his view and the ideas of F. Schlegel to which reference was made in the last paragraph. At the same time it is necessary to emphasize an important contrast between the great idealist philosophers and the romantics, a contrast which can be illustrated in the following manner. Friedrich Schlegel assimilated philosophy to poetry and dreamed of their becoming one. In his view philosophizing was primarily a matter of intuitive insights, not of deductive reasoning or a proof. For every proof is a proof of something, and the intuitive grasp of the truth to be proved precedes all argument, which is a purely secondary affair. One as Schlegel put it, Leibniz asserted and Wolf proved. Evidently, this remark was not intended as a compliment to Wolf. Further, philosophy is concerned with the universe, the totality. And we cannot prove the totality, it is apprehended only in intuition nor can we describe it in the same way in which we can describe a particular thing and its relations to other particular things. The totality can in a sense be displayed or shown, as in poetry, but to say precisely what it is transcends our power. The philosopher, therefore, is concerned with attempting to say what cannot be said. And for this reason philosophy and the philosopher himself are for the true philosopher a matter for ironic wit. When, however, we turn from Friedrich Schlegel, the Romantic, to Hegel, the absolute idealist, we find a resolute insistence on systematic conceptual thought and a determined rejection of appeals to mystical intention and feeling. Hegel is indeed concerned with the totality, the absolute, but he is concerned with thinking it, with expressing the life of the infinite and its relation to the finite in conceptual thought. It is true that he interprets art, including poetry, as having the same subject matter as philosophy, namely absolute spirit. But he also insists on a difference of form which it is essential to preserve. Poetry and philosophy are distinct, and they should not be confused. 
It may be objected that the contrast between the Romantics' idea of philosophy and that of the great idealists is not nearly so great as a comparison between the views of F. Schlegel and Hegel tends to suggest. Fichte postulated a basic intellectual intuition of the pure or absolute ego an idea which was exploited by some of the Romantics. Schelling insisted, at least in one stage of his philosophizing, that the absolute can be apprehended in itself only in mystical intuition. And he also emphasized an aesthetic intuition through which the nature of the absolute is apprehended not in itself but in symbolic form. For the matter of that, romantic traits can be discerned even within the Hegelian dialectical logic, which is a logic of movement, designed to exhibit the inner life of the spirit and to overcome the conceptual antitheses which ordinary logic tends to render fixed and permanent. Indeed, the way in which Hegel depicts the human spirit as passing successively through a variety of attitudes and as restlessly moving from position to position can reasonably be regarded as an expression of the romantic outlook. Hegel's logical apparatus itself is alien to the romantic spirit, but this apparatus belongs to the foreground of his system. Underneath we can see a profound spiritual affinity with the romantic movement. It is not, however, a question of denying the existence of a spiritual affinity between metaphysical idealism and romanticism. We have already argued that there is such an affinity. It is a question of pointing out that, in general, the idealist philosophers were concerned with systematic thought whereas the romantics were inclined to emphasize the role of intuition and feeling and to assimilate philosophy to poetry. Schelling and Schleiermacher stood indeed closer to the romantic spirit than did Fichte or Hegel. It is true that Fichte postulated a basic intellectual intuition of the pure or absolute ego, but he did not think of this as some sort of privileged mystical insight. For him it was an intuitive grasp of an activity which manifests itself to the reflective consciousness. What is required is not some mystical or poetic capacity but transcendental reflection, which is open in principle to all. And in his attack on the Romantics Fichte insisted that his philosophy, though demanding this basic intellectual intuition of the ego as activity, was a matter of logical thought which yielded science, in the sense of certain knowledge. Philosophy is the knowledge of knowledge, the basic science, it is not an attempt to say what cannot be said. As for Hegel, it is doubtless true that we, looking back, can discern romantic traits even within his dialectic. But this does not alter the fact that he insisted that philosophy is not a matter of apocalyptic utterances or poetic rhapsodies or mystical intuitions but of systematic logical thought which thinks its subject matter conceptually and makes it plain to view. The philosopher's business is to understand reality and to make others understand it, not to edify or to suggest meaning by the use of poetic images. 6. As we have seen, the initial transformation of Kant's philosophy into pure idealism meant that reality had to be looked on as a process of productive thought or reason. In other words, being had to be identified with thought. And the natural program of idealism was to exhibit the truth of this identification by means of a deductive reconstruction of the essential dynamic structure of the life of absolute thought or reason. Further, if the Kantian conception of philosophy as thought's reflective awareness of its own spontaneous activity was to be retained, philosophical reflection had to be represented as the self-awareness or self-consciousness of absolute reason in and through the human mind. Hence it pertained also to the natural program of idealism to exhibit the truth of this interpretation of philosophical reflection. When, however, we turn to the actual history of the idealist movement, we see the difficulty encountered by the idealists in completely fulfilling this program. Or, to put the matter in another way, we see marked divergences from the pattern suggested by the initial transformation of the critical philosophy into transcendental idealism. For example, Fichte starts with the determination not to go beyond consciousness, in the sense of postulating as his first principle a being which transcends consciousness. He thus takes as his first principle the pure ego as manifested in consciousness, not as a thing but as an activity. But the demands of his transcendental idealism force him to push back, as it were, the ultimate reality behind consciousness. And in the later form of his philosophy we find him postulating absolute infinite being which transcends thought. With Schelling the process is in a sense reversed. 
That is to say, while at one stage of his philosophical pilgrimage he asserts the existence of an absolute which transcends human thought and conceptualization, in his subsequent religious philosophy he attempts to reconstruct reflectively the essence and inner life of the personal deity. At the same time, however, he abandons the idea of deducing in a a priori manner the existence and structure of empirical reality and emphasizes the idea of God's free self-revelation. He does not entirely abandon the idealist tendency to look on the finite as though it were a logical consequence of the infinite, but once he has introduced the idea of a free personal God his thought necessarily departs to a large extent from the original pattern of metaphysical idealism. Needless to say, the fact that both Fichte and Schelling, especially the latter, developed and changed their initial positions does not by itself constitute any proof that the developments and changes were unjustified. My point is rather that these illustrate the difficulty in carrying through to completion what I have called the idealist program. One can say that neither with Fichte nor with Schelling is being in the long run reduced to thought. It is with Hegel that we find by far the most sustained attempt to fulfill the idealist program. He has no doubt that the rational is the real and the real the rational. And in his view it is quite wrong to speak of the human mind as merely finite and on this ground to question its power to understand the self-unfolding life of the infinite absolute. The mind has indeed its finite aspects, but it is also infinite, in the sense that it is capable of rising to the level of absolute thought, at which level the absolute's knowledge of itself and man's knowledge of the absolute are one. And Hegel makes what is undoubtedly a most impressive attempt to show in a systematic and detailed way how reality is the life of absolute reason in its movement towards the goal of self-knowledge, thus becoming in actual existence what it always is in essence, namely self-thinking thought. Clearly, the more Hegel identifies the absolute's knowledge of itself with man's knowledge of the absolute, the more completely does he fulfill the demand of the idealist program that philosophy should be represented as the self-reflection of absolute thought or reason. If the absolute were a personal god, eternally enjoying perfect self-awareness quite independently of the human spirit, man's knowledge of god would be an outside view, so to speak. If, however, the absolute is all reality, the universe, interpreted as the self-unfolding of absolute thought which attains self-reflection in and through the human spirit, man's knowledge of the absolute is the absolute's knowledge of itself. And philosophy is productive thought thinking itself. But what is then meant by productive thought? It is arguable at any rate that it can hardly mean anything else but the universe considered teleologically, that is, as a process moving towards self-knowledge, this self-knowledge being in effect nothing but man's developing knowledge of nature, of himself and of his history. And in this case there is nothing behind the universe, as it were, no thought or reason which expresses itself in nature and human history in the way that an efficient cause expresses itself in its effect. Thought is teleologically prior, in the sense that man's knowledge of the world process is represented as the goal of the process and as giving it its significance. But that which is actually or historically prior is being in the form of objective nature. And in this case, the whole pattern of idealism, as suggested by the initial transformation of Kant's philosophy, is changed. For this transformation inevitably suggests the picture of an activity of infinite thought which produces or creates the objective world, whereas the picture described above is simply the picture of the actual world of experience interpreted as a teleological process. The telos or goal of the process is indeed depicted as the world's self-reflection in and through the human mind. But this goal or end is an ideal which is never complete at any given moment of time. Hence the identification of being and thought is never actually achieved. 7. Another aspect of the divergences from the natural pattern of post-Kantian idealism can be expressed in this way. F. H. Bradley, the English absolute idealist, maintain that the concept of God inevitably passes into the concept of the Absolute. That is to say, if the mind tries to think the infinite in a consistent manner, it must in the end acknowledge that the infinite cannot be anything else but the universe of being, reality as a whole, the totality. And with this transformation of God into the Absolute religion disappears. Short of the Absolute God cannot rest, and, having reached that goal, 
he is lost and religion with him one a similar view was expressed by R.G. Collingwood. God and the Absolute are not identical but irretrievably distinct. And yet they are identical. In this sense, God is the imaginative or intuitive form in which the Absolute reveals itself to their religious consciousness too if we preserve speculative metaphysics, we must admit in the long run that theism is a halfway house between the frank anthropomorphism of polytheism on the one hand and the idea of the all-inclusive absolute on the other. It is indeed obvious that in the absence of any clear idea of the analogy of being the notion of a finite being which is ontologically distinct from the infinite cannot stand. But let us pass over this point, important as it is, and note instead that post-Kantian idealism in what one might call its natural form is thoroughly anthropomorphic. For the pattern of human consciousness is transferred to reality as a whole. Let us suppose that the human ego comes to self-consciousness only indirectly. That is to say, attention is first directed to the not-self. The not-self has to be posited by the ego or subject, not in the sense that the not-self must be ontologically created by the self but in the sense that it must be recognized as an object if consciousness is to arise at all. The ego can then turn back upon itself and become reflectively aware of itself in its activity. In post-Kantian idealism this process of human consciousness is used as a key idea for the interpretation of reality as a whole. The absolute ego or absolute reason or whatever it may be called is regarded as positing, in an ontological sense, the objective world of nature as a necessary condition for returning to itself in and through the human spirit. This general scheme follows naturally enough from the transformation of the Kantian philosophy into metaphysical idealism. But inasmuch as Kant was concerned with human knowledge and consciousness, the inflation of his theory of knowledge into cosmic metaphysics inevitably involves interpreting the process of reality as a whole according to the pattern of human consciousness. And in this sense post-Kantian idealism contains a marked element of anthropomorphism, a fact which it is just as well to notice in view of the not uncommon notion that absolute idealism is much less anthropomorphic than theism. Of course, we cannot conceive God other than analogically, and we cannot conceive the divine consciousness except according to an analogy with human consciousness. But we can endeavor to eliminate in thought the aspects of consciousness which are bound up with finitude. And it is arguable, to put it mildly, that to attribute to the infinite a process of becoming self-conscious is an evident expression of anthropomorphic thinking. Now, if there is a spiritual reality which is at any rate logically prior to nature and which becomes self-conscious in and through man, how are we to conceive it? If we conceive it as an unlimited activity which is not itself conscious but grounds consciousness, we have more or less fitched theory of the so-called absolute ego. But the concept of an ultimate reality which is at the same time spiritual and unconscious is not easily understood. Nor, of course, does it bear much resemblance to the Christian concept of God. If, however, we maintain with Schelling in his later religious philosophy that the spiritual reality which lies behind nature is a personal being, the pattern of the idealist scheme is inevitably changed. For it cannot then be maintained that the ultimate spiritual reality becomes self-conscious in and through the cosmic process. And inasmuch as Schelling outlived Hegel by more than 20 years we can say that the idealist movement which immediately followed the critical philosophy of Kant ended, chronologically speaking, in a reapproximation to philosophical theism. As we have seen, Bradley maintained that the concept of God is required by the religious consciousness but that, from the philosophical point of view, it must be transformed into the concept of the absolute. Schelling would have accepted the first contention but rejected the second, at least as understood by Bradley. For in his later years Schelling's philosophy was pretty well a philosophy of the religious consciousness. And he believed that the religious consciousness demanded the transformation of his own former idea of the absolute into the idea of a personal god. In his theosophical speculations he undoubtedly introduced obvious anthropomorphic elements, as will be seen later. But at the same time the movement of his mind towards theism represented a departure from the peculiar brand of anthropomorphism which was characteristic of post-Kantian idealism. There is, however, a third possibility. We can eliminate the idea of a spiritual reality, whether unconscious or conscious, 
which produces nature, and we can at the same time retain the idea of the Absolute becoming self-conscious. The Absolute then means the world, in the sense of the universe. And we have the picture of man's knowledge of the world and of his own history as the self-knowledge of the Absolute. In this picture, which represents the general line of one of the main interpretations of Hegel's absolute idealism, one nothing is added, as it were, to the empirical world except a teleological account of the world process. That is to say, no existent transcendent being is postulated, but the universe is interpreted as a process moving towards an ideal goal, namely complete self-reflection in and through the human spirit. This interpretation can hardly be taken as merely equivalent to the empirical statements that in the course of the world's history man has as a matter of fact appeared and that as a matter of fact he is capable of knowing and of increasing his knowledge of himself, his history and his environment. For presumably none of us, whether materialists or idealists, whether theists, pantheists or atheists, would hesitate to accept these statements. At the very least the interpretation is meant to suggest a teleological pattern, a movement towards human knowledge of the universe, considered as the universe's knowledge of itself. But unless we are prepared to admit that this is only one possible way of regarding the world process and thus to lay ourselves open to the objection that our choice of this particular pattern is determined by an intellectualist prejudice in favor of knowledge for the sake of knowledge, that is, by a particular valuational judgment, we must claim, it appears, that the world moves by some inner necessity towards the goal of self-knowledge in and through man. But what ground have we for making this claim unless we believe either that nature itself is unconscious mind, or, as Schelling put it, slumbering spirit, which strives towards consciousness or that behind nature there is unconscious mind or reason which spontaneously posits nature as a necessary precondition for attaining consciousness in and through the human spirit. And if we accept either of these positions, we transfer to the universe as a whole the pattern of the development of human consciousness. This procedure may indeed be demanded by the transformation of the critical philosophy into metaphysical idealism, but it is certainly not less anthropomorphic in character than philosophical theism. 8. In this chapter we have been mainly concerned with German idealism as a theory, or rather set of theories, about reality as a whole the self-manifesting absolute. But a philosophy of man is also a prominent feature of the idealist movement. And this is indeed only what one would expect if one considers the metaphysical premises of the several philosophers. According to Fichte, the absolute ego is an unlimited activity which can be represented as striving towards consciousness of its own freedom. But consciousness exists only in the form of individual consciousness. Hence the absolute ego necessarily expresses itself in a community of finite subjects or selves, each of which strives towards the attainment of true freedom. And the theme of moral activity inevitably comes to the fore. Fichte's philosophy is essentially a dynamic ethical idealism. Again, for Hegel the absolute is definable as spirit or as self-thinking thought. Hence it is more adequately revealed in the human spirit and its life than in nature and more emphasis must be placed on the reflective understanding of man's spiritual life, the life of man as a rational being, than on the philosophy of nature. As for Schelling, when he comes to assert the existence of a personal and free God, he occupies himself concurrently with the problem of freedom in man and with man's fall from and return to God. In the idealist philosophies of man and society insistence on freedom is a conspicuous feature. But it does not follow, of course, that the word freedom is used throughout in the same sense. With Fitch the emphasis is on individual freedom as manifested in action. And we can doubtless see in this emphasis a reflection of the philosopher's own dynamic and energetic temperament. For Fitch man is from one point of view a system of natural drives, instincts and impulses, and if he is looked at simply from this point of view, it is idle to talk about freedom. But as spirit man is not tied, so to speak, to the automatic satisfaction of one desire after another, he can direct his activity to an ideal goal and act in accordance with the idea of duty. As with Kant, freedom tends to mean rising above the life of sensual impulse and acting as a rational, moral being. And Fichte is inclined to speak as though activity were its own end, 
emphasizing free action for the sake of free action. But though Fichte's primary emphasis is on the individual's activity and on his rising above the slavery, of natural drive and impulse to a life of action in accordance with duty, he sees, of course, that some content has to be given to the idea of free moral action. And he does this by stressing the concept of moral vocation. A man's vocation, the series of actions which he ought to perform in the world, is largely determined by his social situation, by his position, for example, as the father of a family. And in the end we have the vision of a multiplicity of moral vocations converging towards a common ideal end, the establishment of a moral world order. As a young man Fitched was an enthusiastic supporter of the French Revolution which he regarded as liberating men from forms of social and political life which hindered their free moral development. But then the question arose, what form of social, economic, and political organization is best fitted to favor man's moral development? And Fitched found himself compelled to lay increasing emphasis on the positive role of political society as a morally educative power. But though in his later years reflection on contemporary political events, namely the Napoleonic domination and the War of Liberation, was partly responsible for the growth in his mind of a nationalistic outlook and for a strong emphasis on the cultural mission of a unified German state in which alone the Germans could find true freedom, his more characteristic idea was that the state is a necessary instrument to preserve the system of rights as long as man has not attained his full moral development. If man as a moral being were fully developed, the state would wither away. When we turn to Hegel, however, we find a different attitude. Hegel too was influenced in his youth by the ferment of the French Revolution and the drive to freedom. And the term freedom plays a conspicuous role in his philosophy. As will be seen in due course, he represents human history as a movement towards the fuller realization of freedom. But he distinguishes sharply between negative freedom, as mere absence of restraint, and positive freedom. As Kant saw, moral freedom involves obeying only that law which one gives oneself as a rational being. But the rational is the universal. And positive freedom involves identifying oneself with ends that transcend one's desires as a particular individual. It is attained, above all, by identifying one's particular will with Rousseau's general will which finds expression in the state. Morality is essentially social morality. The formal moral law receives its content and field of application in social life, especially in the state. Both Fichte and Hegel, therefore, attempt to overcome the formalism of the Kantian ethic by placing morality in a social setting. But there is a difference of emphasis. Fichte places the emphasis on individual freedom and action in accordance with duty mediated by the personal conscience. We have to add as a corrective that the individual's moral vocation is seen as a member I of a system of moral vocations, and so in a social setting. But in Fichte's ethics the emphasis is placed on the individual's struggle to overcome himself, to bring his lower self, as it were, into tune with the free will which aims at complete freedom. Hegel, however, places the emphasis on man as a member of political society and on the social aspects of ethics. Positive freedom is something to be attained through membership in a greater organic whole. As a corrective or counterweight to this emphasis we must add that for Hegel no state can be fully rational unless it recognizes the value of and finds room for subjective or individual freedom. When at Berlin Hegel lectured on political theory and described the state in highfalutin terms, he was concerned with making his hearer socially and politically conscious and with overcoming what he regarded as an unfortunate one-sided emphasis on the inwardness of morality rather than with turning them into totalitarians. Further political institutions constitute, according to Hegel, the necessary basis for man's higher spiritual activities, art, religion, and philosophy, in which the freedom of the spirit reaches its supreme expression. What one misses, however, in both Fichte and Hegel is perhaps a clear theory of absolute moral values. If we talk with Fichte about action for action's sake, freedom for the sake of freedom, we may show an awareness of the unique character of each human being's moral vocation. But at the same time we run the risk of emphasizing the creative personality and the uniqueness of its moral vocation at the expense of the universality of the moral law. If, 
however, we socialize morality with Hegel, we give it concrete content and avoid the formalism of the Kantian ethic, but at the same time we run the risk of implying that moral values and standards are simply relative to different societies and cultural periods. Obviously, some would maintain that this is in fact the case. But if we do not agree, we require a clearer and more adequate theory of absolute values than Hegel actually provides. Schelling's outlook was rather different from that either of Fichte or of Hegel. At one period of his philosophical development he utilized a good many of the former's ideas and represented the moral activity of man as tending to create a second nature, a moral world order, a moral world within the physical world. But the difference between his attitude and Fichte's showed itself in the fact that he proceeded to add a philosophy of art and of aesthetic intuition to which he attributed a great metaphysical significance. With Fichte the emphasis was placed on the moral struggle and on free moral action, with Schelling it was placed on aesthetic intuition as a key to the ultimate nature of reality, and he exalted the artistic genius rather than the moral hero. When, however, theological problems came to absorb his interest, his philosophy of man naturally took on a marked religious coloring. Freedom, he thought, is the power to choose between good and bad. And personality is something to be won by the birth of light out of darkness, that is, by a sublimation of man's lower nature and its subordination to the rational will. But these themes are treated in a metaphysical setting. For example, the views on freedom and personality to which allusion has just been made lead Schelling into theosophical speculation about the nature of God. In turn, his theories about the divine nature react on his view of man. To return to Hegel, the greatest of the German idealists. His analysis of human society and his philosophy of history are certainly very impressive. Many of those who listen to his lectures on history must have felt that the significance of the past and the meaning of the movement of history were being revealed to them. Moreover, Hegel was not exclusively concerned with understanding the past. As has already been remarked, he wished to make his students socially, politically, and ethically conscious. And he doubtless thought that his analysis of the rational state could furnish standards and aims in political life, especially in German political life. But the emphasis is placed on understanding. Hegel is the author of the famous saying that the owl of Minerva spreads her wings only with the falling of the dusk, and that when philosophy spreads her grey on grey, then has a shape of life grown cold. He had a vivid realization of the fact that political philosophy is apt to canonize, as it were, the social and political forms of a society or culture which is about to pass away. When a culture or society has become mature and ripe, or even overripe, it becomes conscious of itself in and through philosophical reflection, just at the moment when the movement of life is demanding and bringing forth new societies or new social and political forms. With Karl Marx we find a different attitude. The business of the philosopher is to understand the movement of history in order to change existing institutions and forms of social organization in accordance with the demands of the teleological movement of history. Marx does not, of course, deny the necessity and value of understanding, but he emphasizes the revolutionary function of understanding. In a sense Hegel looks backward, Marx forward. Whether Marx's idea of the philosopher's function is tenable or not is a question which we need not discuss here. It is sufficient to note the difference between the attitudes of the great idealist and the social revolutionary. If we wish to find among the idealist philosophers something comparable to Marx's missionary zeal, we have to turn to Fichte rather than to Hegel. As will be seen in the relevant chapters, Fichte had a passionate belief in the saving mission of his own philosophy for human society. But Hegel felt, as it were, the weight and burden of all history on his shoulders. And looking back on the history of the world, his primary aim was to understand it. Further, though he certainly did not imagine that history had stopped with the coming of the 19th century, he was too historically minded to have much faith in the finality of any philosophical utopia. Life and writings on looking for the fundamental principle of philosophy, the choice between idealism and dogmatism the pure ego and intellectual intuition comments on the theory of the pure ego, 
Phenomenology of Consciousness and Idealist Metaphysics The Three Fundamental Principles of Philosophy Explanatory Comments on Fichte's Dialectical Method The Theory of Science and Formal Logic The General Idea of the Two Deductions of Consciousness The Theoretical Deduction The Practical Deduction Comments on Fichte's Deduction of Consciousness Johann Gottlieb Fichte was born in 1762 at Rammenau in Saxony. He came of a poor family, and in the ordinary course of events he could hardly have enjoyed facilities for pursuing advanced studies. But as a small boy he aroused the interest of a local nobleman, the Baron von Miltes, who undertook to provide for his education. At the appropriate age Fichte was sent to the famous school at Forda where Nietzsche was later to study. And in 1780 he enrolled as a student of theology in the University of Jena, moving later to Wittenberg and subsequently to Leipzig. During his studies Fichte came to accept the theory of determinism. To remedy the sad state of affairs a good clergyman recommended to him an edition of Spinoza's Ethics which was furnished with a refutation by Wolff. But as the refutation seemed to Fichte to be extremely weak, the effect of the work was the very opposite of that intended by the pastor. Determinism, however, was not really in tune with Fichte's active and energetic character or with his strong ethical interests, and it was soon replaced by an insistence on moral freedom. He was later to show himself a vigorous opponent of Spinozism, but it always represented for him one of the great alternatives in philosophy. For financial reasons Fichte found himself compelled to take a post as tutor in a family at Zurich where he read Rousseau and Montesquieu and welcomed the news of the French Revolution with its message of liberty. His interest in Kant was aroused when a student's request for the explanation of the critical philosophy led him to study it for the first time. And in 1791, when returning to Germany from Warsaw, where he had a brief and rather humiliating experience as tutor in a nobleman's family, he visited Kant at Königsberg. But he was not received with any enthusiasm. And he therefore attempted to win the great man's favor by writing an essay to develop Kant's justification of faith in the name of the practical reason. The resulting essay towards a critique of all revelation, ver such einer Kritik aller Offenbarung, pleased Kant, and after some difficulties with the theological censorship it was published in 1792. As the name of the author was not given, some reviewers concluded that the essay had been written by Kant. And when Kant proceeded to correct this error and to praise the real author, Fichte's name became at once widely known. In 1793 Fichte published his contributions designed to correct the judgment of the public on the French Revolution. This work won for him the reputation of being a Democrat and Jacobin, a politically dangerous figure. In spite of this, however, he was appointed professor of philosophy at Jena in 1794, partly owing to a warm recommendation by Goethe. In addition to his more professional courses of lectures Fichte gave a series of conferences on the dignity of man and the vocation of the scholar, which were published in the year of his appointment to the chair. He was always something of a missionary or preacher. But the chief publication of 1794 was the basis of the entire theory of science, Grundlager Gesamten Wissenschaftslehre, in which he presented his idealist development of the critical philosophy of Kant. His predecessor in the chair of philosophy at Jena, K. L. Reinhold, 1758-1823, who had accepted an invitation to Kiel, had already demanded that the Kantian criticism should be turned into a system, that is to say, that it should be derived systematically from one fundamental principle and in his theory of science Fichte undertook to fulfill this task more successfully than Reinhold had done. One the theory of science was conceived as exhibiting the systematic development from one ultimate principle of the fundamental propositions which lie at the basis of and make possible all particular sciences or ways of knowing. But to exhibit this development is at the same time to portray the development of creative thought. Hence the theory of science is not only epistemology but also metaphysics. But Fichte was very far from concentrating exclusively on the theoretical deduction of consciousness. He laid great stress on the moral end of the development of consciousness or, in more concrete terms, on the moral purpose of human existence. And we find him publishing in 1796 the basis of natural right, Grundlage de Natur Rex, 
and in 1798 the system of ethics, Da System der Sittenlehre. Both subjects are said to be treated according to the principles of the theory of science. And so no doubt they are. But the works are much more than mere appendages to the Wissenschaftslehre. For they display the true character of Fichte's philosophy, that is, as a system of ethical idealism. Complaints have often been made, and not without reason, of the obscurity of the metaphysical idealists. But a prominent feature of Fichte's literary activity was his unremitting efforts to clarify the ideas and principles of the theory of science. One for instance, in 1797 he published two introductions to the Wissenschaftslehre and in 1801 his Sonnenklare Bericht, a report, clear as the sun, for the general public on the real essence of the latest philosophy, an attempt to compel the reader to understand. The title may have been over-optimistic, but at any rate it bore witness to the author's efforts to make his meaning clear. Moreover, in the period 1801-13 Fichte composed, for his lecture courses, several revised versions of the Wissenschaftslehre. In 1810 he published the theory of science in its general lines, Die Wissenschaftslehre in Irem Allgemeinen Umrisse, and the Facts of Consciousness, Tatsachen de Bus Sains, 2nd edition, 1813. In 1799 Fichte's career at Jena came to an abrupt end. He had already aroused some antagonism in the university by his plans to reform the students' societies and by his Sunday discourses which seemed to the clergy to constitute an act of trespass on their preserves. But his crowning offense was the publication in 1798 of an essay on the ground of our belief in a divine world order, Über den Grund unsers Glaubens und in Gottlich Weltregierung. The appearance of this essay led to a charge of atheism, on the ground that Fichte identified God with a moral world order to be created and sustained by the human will. The philosopher tried to defend himself, but without success. And in 1799 he had to leave Jena and went to Berlin. In 1800 Fichte published The Vocation of Man, Die Bestimmung de Mens Chen. The work belongs to his so-called popular writings, addressed to the general educated public rather than to professional philosophers, and it is a manifesto in favor of the author's idealist system as contrasted with the romantic's attitude to nature and to religion. Fichte's exalted language may indeed easily suggest a romantic pantheism, but the significance of the work was understood well enough by the romantics themselves. Schleiermacher, for example, saw that Fichte was concerned with repudiating any attempt to achieve a fusion of Spinozism and idealism, and in a sharply critical review he maintained that Fichte's hostile reaction to the idea of the universal necessity of nature was really caused by his predominating interest in man as a finite, independent being who had at all costs to be exalted above nature. In Schleiermacher's opinion Fichte should have sought for a higher synthesis which would include the truth in Spinozism while not denying moral freedom, instead of simply opposing man to nature. In the same year, 1800, Fichte published his work on the closed commercial state, Der Gesklossen Handelsstaat, in which he proposed a kind of state socialism. It has already been remarked that Fichte was something of a missionary. He regarded his system not only as the philosophical truth in an abstract, academic sense, but also as the saving truth, in the sense that the proper application of its principles would lead to the reform of society. In this respect at least he resembles Plato. Fichte had once hoped that Freemasonry might prove an apt instrument for promoting moral and social reform by taking up and applying the principles of the Wissenschaftslehre. But he was disappointed in this hope and turned instead to the Prussian government. And his work was really a program offered to the government for implementation. In 1804 Fichte accepted the offer of a chair at Erlangen. But he was not actually nominated professor until April 1805, and he employed the interval by lecturing at Berlin on the characteristics of the present age, Grundsiege de Gegenartigenzeit Alters. In these lectures he attacked the view of romantics such as Novalis, Tyke, and the two Schlegels. Tyke introduced Novalis to Boma's writings, and some of the romantics were enthusiastic admirers of the mystical shoemaker of Gorlitz. But their enthusiasm was not shared by Fichte nor had he any sympathy with Novalis's dream of the restoration of a theocratic Catholic culture. 
his lectures were also directed against the philosophy of nature which had been developed by Schelling, his former disciple. But these polemics are in a sense incidental to the general philosophy of history which is sketched in the lectures. Fichte's present age represents one of the epochs in the development of man towards the goal of history described as the ordering of all human relations with freedom according to reason. The lectures were published in 1806. At Erlang and Fichte lectured in 1805 on the nature of the scholar, Über das Wesen de Gelerten. And in the winter of 1805-6 he gave a course of lectures at Berlin on the way to the blessed life or the doctrine of religion, die Anweijung zum Seligen Leben, Oder auch die Religion Slayer. At first sight at least this work on religion seems to show a radical change from the philosophy expounded in Fichte's early writings. We hear less about the ego and much more about the absolute and life in God. Indeed, Schelling accused Fichte of plagiarism, that is, of borrowing ideas from Schelling's theory of the absolute and trying to graft them onto the Wissenschaftslehre, oblivious of the incompatibility between the two elements. Fichte, however, refused to admit that his religious ideas, as set forth in the doctrine of religion, were in any way inconsistent with his original philosophy. When Napoleon invaded Prussia in 1806, Fichte offered to accompany the Prussian troops as a lay preacher or orator. But he was informed that the king considered it a time for speaking by acts rather than by words, and that oratory would be better suited for celebrating victory. When events took a menacing turn Fichte left Berlin, but he returned in 1807, and in the winter of 1807-8 he delivered his addresses to the German nation, Rieden und die Deutsche Nation. These discourses, in which the philosopher speaks in exalted and glowing terms of the cultural mission of the German people, one have lent themselves to subsequent exploitation in an extreme nationalist sense. But in justice to him we should remember the circumstances in which they were delivered, namely the period of Napoleonic domination. The year 1810 saw the foundation of the University of Berlin, and Fichte was appointed dean of the philosophical faculty. From 1811 to 1812 he was rector of the university. At the beginning of 1814 he caught typhus from his wife who had contracted the disease while nursing the sick, and on January 29 of that year he died. To Fichte's initial conception of philosophy has little in common with the romantic idea of the kinship between it and poetry. Philosophy is, or at least ought to be, a science. In the first place, that is to say, it should be a body of propositions which form a systematic whole of such a kind that each proposition occupies its proper place in a logical order. And in the second there must be a fundamental or logically prior proposition. Every science must have a fundamental proposition Grundsatz. And it cannot have more than one fundamental proposition. For otherwise it would be not one but several sciences one we might indeed wish to question the statement that every science must have one, and only one basic proposition, but this is at any rate part of what Fichte means by a science. This idea of science is obviously inspired by a mathematical model. Indeed, Fichte takes geometry as an example of a science. But it is, of course, a particular science, whereas philosophy is for Fichte the science of science, that is, the knowledge of knowledge or doctrine of knowledge, Wissenschaftslehre. In other words, philosophy is the basic science. Hence the fundamental proposition of philosophy must be indemonstrable and self-evidently true. Other propositions will possess only immediate certainty, derived from it, whereas it must be immediately certain too for if its fundamental proposition were demonstrable in another science, philosophy would not be the basic science. As will be seen in the course of the exposition of his thought, Fichte does not actually adhere to the program suggested by this concept of philosophy. That is to say, his philosophy is not in practice a strict logical deduction such as could in principle be performed by a machine. But this point must be left aside for the moment. The immediate question is, what is the basic proposition of philosophy? But before we can answer this question we must decide in what direction we are going to look for the proposition which we are seeking. And here, according to Fichte, one is faced with an initial option, one's choice depending on what kind of a man one is. 
a man of one type will be inclined to look in one direction and a man of another type in another direction. But this idea of an initial option stands in need of some explanation. And the explanation throws light on Fichte's conception of the task of philosophy and of the issue with which contemporary thought is faced. In his first introduction to the theory of science Fichte tells us that philosophy is called upon to make clear the ground of all experience, Erfahrung. But the word experience is here used in a somewhat restricted sense. If we consider the contents of consciousness, we see that they are of two kinds. We can say in brief, some of our presentations Vorstellungen are accompanied by the feeling of freedom, while others are accompanied by the feeling of necessity one if I construct in imagination a griffin or a golden mountain, or if I make up my mind to go to Paris rather than to Brussels, such presentations seem to depend on myself. And, as depending on the subject's choice, they are said to be accompanied by the feeling of freedom. If we ask why they are what they are, the answer is that the subject makes them what they are. But if I take a walk along a London street, it does not depend simply on myself what I see or hear. And such presentations are said to be accompanied by the feeling of necessity. That is to say, they appear to be imposed upon me. The whole system of these presentations is called by Fichte experience even if he does not always use the term in this limited sense. And we can ask, what is the ground of experience? How are we to explain the obvious fact that a very large class of presentations seem to be imposed on the subject? To answer this question is the task of philosophy too now, two possibilities lie open to us. Actual experience is always experience of something by an experiencer, consciousness is always consciousness of an object by a subject or, as Fitch sometimes puts it, intelligence but by a process which Fichte calls abstraction the philosopher can isolate conceptually the two factors which in actual consciousness are always conjoined. He can thus form the concepts of intelligence in itself and thing in itself. And two paths lie before him. Either he can try to explain experience, in the sense described in the last paragraph, as the product of intelligence in itself, that is, of creative thought or he can try to explain experience as the effect of the thing in itself. The first path is obviously that of idealism. The second is that of dogmatism. And in the long run dogmatism spells materialism and determinism. If the thing, the object, is taken as the fundamental principle of explanation, intelligence will ultimately be reduced to a mere epiphenomenon. This uncompromising either-or attitude is characteristic of Fichte there is for him a clear-cut option between two opposed and mutually exclusive positions. True, some philosophers, notably Kant, have endeavored to effect a compromise, to find, that is to say, a middle path between pure idealism and a dogmatism which ends in deterministic materialism. But Fichte has no use for such compromises. If a philosopher wishes to avoid dogmatism with all its consequences, and if he is prepared to be consistent, he must eliminate the thing in itself as a factor in the explanation of experience. The presentations which are accompanied by a feeling of necessity, by the feeling of being imposed upon or affected by an object existing independently of mind or thought, must be accounted for without any recourse to the Kantian idea of the thing in itself. But on what principle is the philosopher to make his choice between the two possibilities which lie open to him? He cannot appeal to any basic theoretical principle. For we are assuming that he has not yet found such a principle but has to decide in what direction he is going to look for it. The issue must, therefore, be decided by inclination and interest. One that is to say, the choice which the philosopher makes depends on what kind of a man he is. Needless to say, Fichte is convinced that the superiority of idealism to dogmatism as an explanation of experience becomes evident in the process of working out the two systems. But they have not yet been worked out. And in looking for the first principle of philosophy we cannot appeal to the theoretical superiority of a system which has not yet been constructed. What Fichte means is that the philosopher who is maturely conscious of his freedom as revealed in moral experience will be inclined to idealism, while the philosopher who lacks this mature moral consciousness will be inclined to dogmatism. 
The interest in question is thus interest in and for the self, which Fichte regards as the highest interest. The dogmatist, lacking this interest, emphasizes the thing, the not-self. But the thinker who has a genuine interest in and for the free moral subject will turn for his basic philosophical principle to intelligence, the self, or ego, rather than to the not-self. Fichte's preoccupation with the free and morally active self is thus made clear from the start. Underlying and inspiring his theoretical inquiry into the ground of experience there is a profound conviction of the primary significance of man's free moral activity. He continues Kant's insistence on the primacy of the practical reason, the moral will. But he is convinced that to maintain this primacy one has to take the path to pure idealism. For behind Kant's apparently innocent retention of the thing in itself Fichte sees the lurking specter of Spinozism, the exaltation of nature and the disappearance of freedom. If we are to exorcise the specter, compromise must be rejected. We can, of course, detach Fichte's idea of the influence exercised by inclination and interest from his historically conditioned picture of the initial option with which philosophers are faced. And the idea can then be seen as opening up fascinating vistas in the field of what Carl Jaspers calls the psychology of worldviews. But in a book of this kind one must resist the temptation to embark on a discussion of this attractive topic. 3. Assuming that we have chosen the path of idealism, we must turn for the first principle of philosophy to intelligence in itself. But it is better to drop this cumbersome term and to speak, as Fichte proceeds to do, of the I or ego. We are committed, therefore, to explaining the genesis of experience from the side, so to speak, of the self. In reality Fichte is concerned with deriving consciousness in general from the ego. But in speaking of experience, in the restricted sense explained above, he lays his finger on the crucial difficulty which pure idealism has to face, namely the evident fact that the self finds itself in a world of objects which affect it in various ways. If idealism is incapable of accounting adequately for this fact, it is evidently untenable. But what is the ego which is the foundation of philosophy? To answer this question we obviously have to go behind the objectifiable self, the ego as object of introspection or of empirical psychology, to the pure ego. Fichte once said to his students, gentlemen, think the wall. He then proceeded, gentlemen, think him who thought the wall. Clearly, we could proceed indefinitely in this fashion. Gentlemen, think him who thought him who thought the wall, and so on. In other words, however hard we may try to objectify the self, that is, to turn it into an object of consciousness, there always remains an I or ego which transcends objectification and is itself the condition of all objectifiability and the condition of the unity of consciousness. And it is this pure or transcendental ego which is the first principle of philosophy. It is clearly idle to object against Fichte that we cannot find a pure or transcendental ego by peering about. For it is precisely Fichte's contention that the pure ego cannot be found in this way, though it is the necessary condition of our being able to do any peering about. But for this very reason it may appear that Fichte has gone beyond the range of experience, in a wide sense, or consciousness and has failed to observe his own self-imposed limitations. That is to say, having reaffirmed the Kantian view that our theoretical knowledge cannot extend beyond experience, he now seems to have transgressed this limit. But this, Fichte insists, is not the case. For we can enjoy an intellectual intuition of the pure ego. This is not, however, a mystical experience reserved for the privileged few. Nor is it an intuition of the pure ego as an entity existing behind or beyond consciousness. Rather is it an awareness of the pure ego or I principle as an activity within consciousness. And this awareness is a component element in all self-consciousness. I cannot take a pace, I cannot move hand or foot, without the intellectual intuition of my self-consciousness in these actions. It is only through intuition that I know that I perform the action. Everyone who ascribes activity to himself appeals to this intuition. In it is the foundation of life, and without it is death one in other words, anyone who is conscious of an action as his own is aware of himself acting. 
In this sense he has an intuition of the self as activity. But it does not follow that he is reflectively aware of this intuition as a component element in consciousness. It is only the philosopher who is reflectively aware of it, for the simple reason that transcendental reflection, by which the attention is reflected onto the pure ego, is a philosophical act. But this reflection is directed, so to speak, to ordinary consciousness, not to a privileged mystical experience. Hence, if the philosopher wishes to convince anyone of the reality of this intuition, he can only draw the man's attention to the data of consciousness and invite him to reflect for himself. He cannot show the man the intuition existing in a pure state, unmixed with any component elements, for it does not exist in this state. Nor can he convince the other man by means of some abstract proof. He can only invite the man to reflect on his own self-consciousness and to see that it includes an intuition of the pure ego, not as a thing, but as an activity. That there is such a power of intellectual intuition cannot be demonstrated through concepts, nor can its nature be developed by means of concepts. Everyone must find it immediately in himself or he will never be able to know it. One Fichte's thesis can be clarified in this way. The pure ego cannot be turned into an object of consciousness in the same way that a desire, for example, can be objectified. It would be absurd to say that through introspection I see a desire, an image, and a pure ego. For every act of objectification presupposes the pure ego. And for this reason it can be called the transcendental ego. But it does not follow that the pure ego is an inferred occult entity. For it manifests itself in the activity of objectification. When I say, I am walking, I objectify the action, in the sense that I make it object for as you object. And the pure eye reveals itself to reflection in this activity of objectification. An activity is intuited, but no entity behind consciousness is inferred. Hence Fitch concludes that the pure ego is not something which acts but simply an activity or doing. For idealism the intelligence is a doing thun and absolutely nothing else, one should not even call it an active thing in Z At first sight at least Fitch appears to contradict Kant's denial that the human mind possesses any faculty of intellectual intuition. In particular, he seems to be turning into an object of intuition the transcendental ego which for Kant was simply a logical condition of the unity of consciousness and could be neither intuited nor proved to exist as a spiritual substance. But Fichte insists that his contradiction of Kant is really only verbal. For when Kant denied that the human mind possesses any faculty of intellectual intuition, he meant that we do not enjoy any intellectual intuition of supersensible entities transcending experience. And the Wissenschaftslayer does not really affirm what Kant denied. For it is not claimed that we intuit the pure ego as a spiritual substance or entity transcending consciousness but simply as an activity within consciousness, which reveals itself to reflection. Further, apart from the fact that Kant's doctrine of pure apperception 3 gives us at any rate a hint of intellectual intuition, we can easily indicate the place, Fitch claims, at which Kant ought to have spoken of and admitted this intuition. For he asserted that we are conscious of a categorical imperative, and if he had considered the matter thoroughly, he should have seen that this consciousness involves the intellectual intuition of the pure ego as activity. Indeed, Fitch goes on to suggest a specifically moral approach to the topic. In the consciousness of this law is grounded the intuition of self-activity and freedom. It is only through the medium of the moral law that I apprehend myself. And if I apprehend myself in this way, I necessarily apprehend myself as self-active. Z1 once again, therefore, the strongly ethical bent of Fitch's mind finds clear expression. Four. If we look at the matter from the point of view of phenomenology of consciousness, Fitch is, in the opinion of the present writer, perfectly justified in affirming the I-subject or transcendental ego. Hume, looking into his mind, so to speak, and finding only psychical phenomena, tried to reduce the self to the succession of these phenomena. Two, And it is understandable that he acted in this way. For part of his program was to apply to man the empirical method, as he conceived it, which had proved so successful in experimental philosophy or natural science. 
but the direction of his attention to the objects or data of introspection led him to slur over the fact, all important for the philosopher, that psychical phenomena become phenomena, appearing to a subject, only through the objectifying activity of a subject which transcends objectification in the same sense. Obviously, there is no question of reducing the human being to a transcendental or metaphysical ego. And the problem of the relation between the self as pure subject and other aspects of the self is one that cannot be evaded. But this does not alter the fact that a recognition of the transcendental ego is essential to an adequate phenomenology of consciousness. And in regard to this point Fitch shows a degree of insight which Hume lacked. But Fitch is not, of course, simply concerned with the phenomenology of consciousness, that is, with a descriptive analysis of consciousness. He is concerned also with developing a system of idealist metaphysics. And this point has an important bearing on his theory of the transcendental ego. From a purely phenomenological point of view talk about the transcendental ego no more commits us to saying that there is one and only one such ego than a medical writer's generalizations about the stomach commit him to holding that there is one and only one stomach. But if we propose to derive the whole sphere of the objective, including nature and all selves in so far as they are objects for a subject, from the transcendental ego, we must either embrace solipsism or interpret the transcendental ego as a super-individual productive activity which manifests itself in all finite consciousnesses. As, therefore, Fitch has no intention of defending solipsism, he is bound to interpret the pure ego as a super-individual absolute ego. To be sure, Fitch's use of the term I or ego not unnaturally suggested to many of his readers that he was talking about the individual self or ego. And this interpretation was facilitated by the fact that the more metaphysical aspects of his thought were comparatively inconspicuous in his earlier writings. But the interpretation, Fitch insisted, was erroneous. Lecturing in the winter of 1810-11 and looking back at the criticism that had been leveled against the Wissenschaft Slayer he protested that he had never intended to say that the creative ego is the individual finite self. People have generally understood the theory of science as attributing to the individual effects which could certainly not be ascribed to it, such as the production of the whole material WORLD they have been completely mistaken, it is not the individual but the one immediate spiritual life which is the creator of all phenomena, including phenomenal individuals one it will be noticed that in this passage the word life is used instead of ego. Starting, as he did, from the position of Kant and being concerned with transforming it into pure idealism, he not unnaturally began by talking about the pure or absolute ego. But in the course of time he saw that it was inappropriate to describe the infinite activity which grounds consciousness, including the finite self, as itself an ego or subject. However, we need not dwell at present on this point. It is sufficient to note Fitch's protest against what he considered to be a fundamental misinterpretation of his theory. The absolute ego is not the individual finite self but an infinite, better, unlimited, activity. Fitch's Wissenschaftslayer is thus both a phenomenology of consciousness and an idealist metaphysics. And to a certain extent at any rate the two aspects can be separated. Hence it is possible to attach some value to a good deal of what Fitch has to say without committing oneself to his metaphysical idealism. We have already indicated this in regard to the theory of the transcendental ego. But the distinction has a wider field of application. 5. In the second section of this chapter it was remarked that philosophy, according to Fitch, must have a fundamental and indemonstrable proposition. And the thought may have occurred to the reader that whatever else the ego may be, it is not a proposition. This is, of course, true. We have still to ascertain what is the basic proposition of philosophy. But we know at any rate that it must be the expression of the original activity of the pure ego. Now, we can distinguish between the spontaneous activity of the pure ego on the one hand and the philosopher's philosophical reconstruction or thinking of this activity on the other. The spontaneous activity of the pure ego in grounding consciousness is not, of course, itself conscious. As spontaneous activity the pure ego does not exist for itself. It comes to exist for itself, as an ego, 
only in the intellectual intuition by which the philosopher in transcendental reflection apprehends the ego's spontaneous activity. It is through the act of the philosopher, through an activity directed towards an activity, that the ego first comes to be originally ersprunglich for itself. One in intellectual intuition, therefore, the pure ego is said to posit itself, sich setzen. And the fundamental proposition of philosophy is that the ego simply posits in an original way its own being. Two in transcendental reflection the philosopher goes back, as it were, to the ultimate ground of consciousness. And in his intellectual intuition the pure ego affirms itself. It is not demonstrated as a conclusion from premises, it is seen as affirming itself and so as existing. To posit itself and to be are, as said of the ego, completely the same three but though by means of what Fichte calls an activity directed towards an activity for the pure ego is, so to speak, made to affirm itself, the ego's original spontaneous activity is not in itself conscious. Rather is it the ultimate ground of consciousness, that is, of ordinary consciousness, one's natural awareness of oneself in a world. But this consciousness cannot arise unless the non-ego is opposed to the ego. Hence the second basic proposition of philosophy is that a non-ego is simply opposite to the ego. 5. This oppositing must, of course, be done by the ego itself. Otherwise pure idealism would have to be abandoned. Now, the non-ego of which the second proposition speaks is unlimited, in the sense that it is objectivity in general rather than a definite object or set of finite objects. And this unlimited non-ego is opposite to the ego within the ego. For we are engaged in the systematic reconstruction of consciousness, and consciousness is a unity, comprising both ego and non-ego. Hence the unlimited activity which constitutes the pure or absolute ego must posit the non-ego within itself. But if both are unlimited, each will tend, as it were, to fill all reality to the exclusion of the other. They will tend to cancel one another out, to annihilate one another. And consciousness will be rendered impossible. Hence, if consciousness is to arise, there must be reciprocal limitation of ego and NPN ego. Each must cancel the other out, but only in part. In this sense both ego and non-ego must be divisible, Thilbar. And in his basis of the entire theory of science Fichte offers the following formulation of the third basic proposition of philosophy. I posit in the ego a divisible non-ego as opposed to a divisible ego one that is to say, the absolute ego posits within itself a finite ego and a finite non-ego as reciprocally limiting and determining one another. Fichte obviously does not mean that there can be only one of each. Indeed, as will be seen later, he maintains that for self-consciousness the existence of the other, and so of a plurality of finite selves, is required. His point is that there can be no consciousness unless the absolute ego, considered as unlimited activity, produces within itself the finite ego and the finite non-ego. 6. If we mean by consciousness, as Fichte means by it, human consciousness, the assertion that the non-ego is a necessary condition of consciousness is not difficult to understand. To be sure, the finite ego can reflect on itself, but this reflection is for Fichte a bending back of the attention from the not-self. Hence the non-ego is a necessary condition even of self-consciousness. Too but we can very well ask why there should be consciousness at all. Or, to put the question in another way, how can the second basic proposition of philosophy be deduced from the first? Fichte answers that no purely theoretical deduction is possible. We must have recourse to a practical deduction. That is to say, we must see the pure or absolute ego as an unlimited activity striving towards consciousness of its own freedom through moral self-realization. And we must see the positing of the non-ego as a necessary means to the attainment of this end. True. The absolute ego in its spontaneous activity does not act consciously for any end at all. But the philosopher consciously rethinking this activity sees the total movement as directed towards a certain goal. And he sees that self-consciousness demands the non-ego, from which the otherwise unlimited activity of the ego, comparable to a straight line stretching out indefinitely, can recoil, as it were, onto itself. 
he sees too that moral activity requires an objective field, a world, in which actions can be performed. Now, the second basic proposition of philosophy stands to the first as antithesis to thesis. And we have seen that the ego and non-ego tend to cancel one another out, if both are unlimited. It is this fact that drives the philosopher to enunciate the third basic proposition, which stands to the first and second propositions as synthesis to thesis and antithesis. But Fitch does not mean to imply that the non-ego ever exists in such a way that it annihilates the pure ego or threatens to do so. It is because this annihilation would take place if an unlimited non-ego were posited within the ego that we are compelled to proceed to the third proposition. In other words, the synthesis shows what the antithesis must mean if the contradiction between an unlimited ego and an unlimited non-ego is not to arise. If we assume that consciousness is to arise at all, the activity which grounds consciousness must produce the situation in which an ego and a non-ego limit one another. Looked at under one aspect, therefore, Fichte's dialectic of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis one takes the form of a progressive determination of the meanings of the initial propositions and the contradictions which arise are resolved in the sense that they are shown to be only apparent. All contradictions are reconciled by determining more closely the contradictory propositions to speaking, for example, of the statements that the ego posits itself as infinite and that it posits itself as finite, Fichte remarks that were it posited as both infinite and finite in one and the same sense, the contradictions could not be resolved. 8. The apparent contradiction is resolved by so defining the meanings of the two statements that their mutual compatibility becomes evident. In the case in question we have to see the one infinite activity expressing itself in and through finite selves. Yet it would not be accurate to say that in actual fact Fichte's dialectic consists simply in the progressive determination or clarification of meanings. For he introduces by the way ideas which cannot be obtained through strict analysis of the initial proposition or propositions. For instance, in order to proceed from the second basic proposition to the third Fichte postulates a limiting activity on the part of the ego, though the idea of limitation cannot be obtained simply through logical analysis of either the first or the second proposition. This procedure was criticized by Hegel as being insufficiently speculative, that is, philosophical. In Hegel's opinion it was unworthy of a philosopher to offer a deduction which was admittedly no strict theoretical deduction one and to introduce, like a deus ex machina, undeducate activities of the ego to make possible the transition from one proposition to another. It can hardly be denied, I think, that Fichte's actual procedure does not square very well with his initial account of the nature of philosophy as a deductive science. At the same time we must remember that for him the philosopher is engaged in consciously reconstructing, as it were, an active process, namely the grounding of consciousness, which in itself takes place unconsciously. In doing so the philosopher has his point of departure, the self-positing of the absolute ego, and his point of arrival, human consciousness as we know it. And if it is impossible to proceed from one step to another in the reconstruction of the productive activity of the ego without attributing to the ego a certain function or mode of activity, then this must be done. Thus even if the concept of limitation is not obtained through strict logical analysis of the first two basic propositions, it is nonetheless required, from Fichte's point of view, to clarify their meaning. 7. When outlining Fichte's theory of the three basic propositions of philosophy I omitted the logical apparatus which is employed in the basis of the entire theory of science and which figures prominently in some accounts of his philosophy. For this apparatus is not really necessary, as is shown by the fact that Fichte himself omits it in some of the expositions of his system. At the same time something ought to be said about it because it serves to clarify Fichte's idea of the relations between philosophy and formal logic. In the basis of the entire theory of science Fichte approaches. The first fundamental proposition of philosophy by reflecting on an indemonstrable logical proposition, the truth of which would be admitted by all. This is the principle of identity, stated in the form A is A or A equals A. Nothing is said about the content of A, nor is it asserted that A exists. What is asserted is a necessary relation between A and itself. If there is an A, it is necessarily self-identical. 
and this necessary relation between A as subject and A as predicate is referred to by Fichte as X. This judgment is asserted or posited only in and through the I or ego. Thus the existence of the ego is affirmed in its activity of judging, even if no value has been assigned to A. If the proposition A equals A is certain, so also must the proposition I am be certain one in affirming the principle of identity the ego affirms or posits itself as self-identical. While, therefore, the formal principle of identity is used by Fichte as a means or device for arriving at the first basic proposition of philosophy, the principle of identity is not itself this proposition. Indeed, it is sufficiently obvious that one would not get very far with a deduction or reconstruction of consciousness if one proposed to use the formal principle of identity as a starting point or foundation. At the same time the relation between the formal principle of identity and the first basic proposition of philosophy is closer, according to Fichte, than the description of the former as a means or device for arriving at the latter tends to suggest. For the principle of identity is, so to speak, the first basic proposition of philosophy with variables substituted for definite values or content. That is to say, if we took the first basic proposition of philosophy and rendered it purely formal, we would obtain the principle of identity. And in this sense the latter is grounded in the former and derivable from it. Similarly, what Fichte calls the formal axiom of opposition, not and not equals a, is used to arrive at the second basic proposition. For the positing of not A presupposes the positing of A and is thus an oppositing to A. And this oppositing takes place only in and through the ego. At the same time the formal axiom of opposition is said to be grounded in the second proposition of philosophy which affirms the ego's oppositing to itself of the non-ego in general. Again, the logical proposition which Fichte calls the axiom of the ground or of sufficient reason, A in part equals A, and conversely, is said to be grounded in the third basic proposition of philosophy, in the sense that the former is derived by abstracting definite content from the latter and substituting variables instead. In brief, therefore, Fichte's view is that formal logic is dependent on and derived from the Wissenschaftslehre, and not the other way round. This view of the relation between formal logic and basic philosophy is indeed somewhat obscured by the fact that in the basis of the entire theory of science Fichte starts by reflecting on the principle of identity. But in his subsequent discussion he proceeds to make his view of the derivative character of formal logic quite clear. And this view is in any case entailed by his insistence that the Wissenschaftslehre is the fundamental science. We may add that in his deduction of the fundamental propositions of philosophy Fichte begins to deduce the categories. In his opinion Kant's deduction was insufficiently systematic. If, however, we start with the self-positing of the ego, we can deduce them successively in the course of the reconstruction of consciousness. Thus the first basic proposition gives us the category of reality. For that which is posited through the mere positing of a thing, is its reality, its essence wesson. 1. The second proposition obviously gives us the category of negation and the third that of limitation or determination. 8. The idea of reciprocal limitation provides the basis for the twofold deduction of consciousness which Fichte considers necessary. Take the statement that the absolute ego posits within itself a finite ego and a finite non-ego as reciprocally limiting or determining one another. This implies two propositions. One is that the absolute ego posits itself as limited by the non-ego. The other is that the absolute ego posits, within itself, the non-ego as limited or determined by the, finite, ego. And these two propositions are respectively the basic propositions of the theoretical and practical deductions of consciousness. If we consider the ego as affected by the non-ego, we can proceed to the theoretical deduction of consciousness which considers what Fichte calls the real series of acts, that is, the acts of the ego as determined by the non-ego. Sensation, for example, belongs to this class of acts. If, however, we consider the ego as affecting the non-ego, we can proceed to the practical deduction of consciousness which considers the ideal series of acts, including, for instance, desire and free action. The two deductions are, of course, complementary, 
forming together the total philosophical deduction or reconstruction of consciousness. At the same time the theoretical deduction is subordinated to the practical. For the absolute ego is an infinite striving towards self-realization through free moral activity, and the non-ego, the world of nature, is a means or instrument for the attainment of this end. The practical deduction gives us the reason why the absolute ego posits the non-ego as limiting and affecting the finite ego, and it leads us to the confines of ethics. Indeed, Fichte's theories of rights and of morals are a continuation of the practical deduction as contained in the Wissenschaftslehre proper. As already mentioned, Fichte's philosophy is essentially a dynamic ethical idealism. It is not possible to discuss here all the stages of Fichte's deduction of consciousness. And even if it were possible, it would scarcely be desirable. But in the next two sections some features of the theoretical and practical deductions will be mentioned, to give the reader some idea of Fichte's line of thought. 9. In Fichte's idealist system all activity must be referred ultimately to the ego itself, that is, to the absolute ego, and the non-ego must exist only for consciousness. For to admit the idea of a non-ego which exists quite independently of all consciousness and which affects the ego would be to readmit the idea of the thing in itself and to abandon idealism. At the same time it is obvious that from the point of view of ordinary consciousness there is a distinction between presentation, Vorstellian, and thing. We have the spontaneous belief that we are acted upon by things which exist independently of the ego. And to all appearances this belief is fully justified. Hence it is incumbent on Fitch to show, in a manner consistent with the idealist position, how the point of view of ordinary consciousness arises, and how from this point of view our spontaneous belief in an objective nature is in a sense justified. For the aim of idealist philosophy is to explain the facts of consciousness on idealist principles, not to deny them. Obviously, Fitch must attribute to the ego the power of producing the idea of an independently existing non-ego when in point of fact it is dependent on the ego, so that the non-ego's activity is ultimately the activity of the ego itself. Equally obviously, this power must be attributed to the absolute ego rather than to the individual self, and it must work spontaneously, inevitably, and without consciousness. To put the matter crudely, when consciousness comes on the scene the work must be already done. It must take place below the level of consciousness. Otherwise it would be impossible to explain our spontaneous belief in a nature existing independently of the ego. In other words, for empirical consciousness nature must be something given. It is only the philosopher who in transcendental reflection retraces with consciousness the productive activity of the absolute ego, which in itself takes place without consciousness. For the non-philosopher, and for the empirical consciousness of the philosopher himself, the natural world is something given, a situation in which the finite ego finds itself. This power is called by Fitch the power of imagination or, more appropriately, the productive power of imagination or power of productive imagination. The power of imagination was prominent in the philosophy of Kant, where it served as an indispensable link between sensibility and understanding. One but with Fitch it assumes an all-important role in grounding ordinary or empirical consciousness. It is not, of course, a kind of third force in addition to the ego and non-ego, it is the activity of the ego itself, that is, the absolute ego. In his earlier writings Fitch may sometimes give the impression that he is talking about the activity of the individual self, but when he reviews the development of his thought he protests that he never meant this. In what he calls a pragmatic history of consciousness two Fitched pictures the ego as spontaneously limiting its own activity and thus positing itself as passive, as affected. Its state is then that of sensation, empfindung. But the ego's activity reasserts itself, as it were, and objectifies sensation. That is to say, in the outwardly directed activity of intuition the ego spontaneously refers sensation to a non-ego. And this act grounds the distinction between representation or image, build, and thing. In empirical consciousness, the finite self regards the distinction between image and thing as a distinction between a subjective modification and an object which exists independently of its own activity. 
for it is ignorant of the fact that the projection of the non-ego was the work of the productive imagination functioning on an infraconscious level. Now, consciousness requires not simply an indeterminate non-ego but definite and distinct objects. And if there are to be distinguishable objects, there must be a common sphere in which and in relation to which objects mutually exclude one another. Hence the power of imagination produces space, extended, continuous and indefinitely divisible, as a form of intuition. Similarly, there must be an irreversible time series of such a kind that successive acts of intuition are possible and that if a particular act of intuition occurs at any moment, every other possibility is excluded as far as this moment is concerned. Hence the productive imagination conveniently posits time as a second form of intuition. Needless to say, the forms of space and time are produced spontaneously by the activity of the pure or absolute ego, they are not consciously and deliberately posited. The development of consciousness, however, requires that the product of the creative imagination should be rendered more determinate. And this is effected by means of the powers of understanding and judgment. At the level of understanding the ego fixes, fixiert, presentations as concepts, while the power of judgment is said to turn these concepts into thought objects, in the sense that they come to exist not only in but also for the understanding. Both understanding and judgment, therefore, are required for understanding in the full sense. Nothing in the understanding, no power of judgment, no power of judgment, nothing in the understanding for the understanding. Sensible intuition is riveted, as it were, to particular objects, but at the level of understanding and judgment we find abstraction from particular objects and the making of universal judgments. Thus in the pragmatic history of consciousness we have seen the ego rising above the unconscious activity of the productive imagination and acquiring, so to speak, a certain freedom of movement. Self-consciousness, however, requires more than the power to abstract from particular objects in favor of the universal. It presupposes the power to abstract from the object in general, in order to achieve reflection on the subject. And this power of absolute abstraction, as Fichte calls it, is reason, Vernunfied. When reason abstracts from the sphere of the non-ego, the ego remains, and we have self-consciousness. But one cannot totally eliminate the ego object and identify oneself in consciousness with the ego subject. That is to say, pure self-consciousness, in which the I subject would be completely transparent to itself, is an ideal which can never be actually achieved, but to which one can only approximate. The more a determinate individual can think himself, as object, away, the closer does his empirical self-consciousness approximate to pure self-consciousness when it is, of course, the power of reason which enables the philosopher to apprehend the pure ego and to retrace, in transcendental reflection, its productive activity in the movement towards self-consciousness. But we have seen that the intellectual intuition of the absolute ego is never unmixed with other elements. Not even the philosopher can achieve the ideal of what Fichte calls pure self-consciousness. Io. The practical deduction of consciousness goes behind, as it were, the work of the productive imagination and reveals its ground in the nature of the absolute ego as an infinite striving, ein unendliches Streben. True, if we speak of striving, we naturally tend to think of striving after something. That is to say, we presuppose the existence of the non-ego. But if we start with the absolute ego as infinite striving, we obviously cannot presuppose the existence of the non-ego. For to do this would be to reintroduce the Kantian thing in itself. At the same time striving, Fichte insists, demands a counter-movement, a counter-striving, a check or obstacle. For if it met with no resistance, no obstacle, or check, it would be satisfied and would cease to be a striving. But the absolute ego cannot cease to be a striving. Hence the very nature of the absolute ego necessitates the positing of the non-ego by the productive imagination, that is, by the absolute ego in its real activity. The matter can be expressed in this way. The absolute ego is to be conceived as activity. And this activity is fundamentally an infinite striving. But striving, 
according to Fichte, implies overcoming, and overcoming requires an obstacle to overcome. Hence the ego must posit the non-ego, nature, as an obstacle to be overcome, as a check to be transcended. In other words, nature is a necessary means or instrument to the moral self-realization of the ego. It is a field for action. Fitch does not, however, proceed directly from the idea of the ego as striving to the positing of the non-ego. He argues first that striving takes the determinate form of infraconscious impulse or drive, shrib, and that this impulse exists for the ego in the form of feeling, gefeil. Now, impulse or drive aims, as Fitch puts it, at being causality, at affecting something outside itself. Yet it cannot, considered simply as impulse, affect anything. Hence the feeling of impulse or drive is a feeling of constraint, of not being able, of being hindered. And the feeling ego is compelled to posit the non-ego as a felt I know not what, a felt obstacle or check. And impulse can then become impulse towards the object. 1. It is worth noting that for fitched feeling is the basis of all belief in reality. The ego feels impulse or drive as power or force, craft, which is hindered. The feeling of force and the feeling of hindrance go together. And the total feeling is the foundation of belief in reality. Here lies the ground of all reality. Only through the relation of feeling to the ego. Is reality possible for the ego, whether of the ego or of the non-ego too belief in reality is based ultimately on feeling, not on any theoretical argument. Now, the feeling of impulse as force represents a rudimentary grade of reflection. For the ego is itself the impulse which is felt. Hence the feeling is self-feeling. And in successive sections of the practical deduction of consciousness Fitch traces the development of this reflection. We see, for instance, impulse or drive as such becoming more determinate in the form of distinct impulses and desires, and we see the development in the ego of distinct feelings of satisfaction. But inasmuch as the ego is infinite striving, it is unable to rest in any particular satisfaction or group of satisfactions. And we see it as reaching out towards an ideal goad through its free activity. Yet this goal always recedes. Indeed, it must do so, if the ego is infinite or endless striving. In the end, therefore, we have action for the sake of action, though in his ethical theory Fitch shows how the infinite striving of the absolute ego after complete freedom and self-possession is fulfilled, so far as it can be, through the series of determinate moral actions in the world which it has posited, through, that is to say, the convergence of the determinate moral vocations of finite subjects towards an ideal goal. In its detailed development Fitch's practical deduction of consciousness is notoriously difficult to follow. But it is clear enough that for him the ego is from the start the morally active ego. That is to say, it is potentially this. And it is the actualization of the ego's potential nature which demands the positing of the non ego and the whole work of the productive imagination. Behind, as it were, the theoretical activity of the ego lies its nature as striving, as impulse or drive. For example, the production of the presentation. Vorstellian, is the work of the theoretical power, not of the practical power or impulse as such. But the production presupposes the drive to presentation, der Vorstellungstrieb. Conversely, the positing of the sensible world is necessary in order that the fundamental striving or drive can take the determinate form of free moral activity directed towards an ideal goal. Thus the two deductions are complementary, though the theoretical deduction finds its ultimate explanation in the practical. In this sense Fitch endeavors to satisfy in his own way the demands of Kant's doctrine of the primacy of the practical reason. We can also say that in his practical deduction of consciousness Fitch tries to overcome the dichotomy, present in the Kantian philosophy, between the higher and lower nature of man, between man as a moral agent and man as a complex of instincts and impulses. For it is the self-same fundamental drive which is represented as assuming different forms up to that of free moral activity. In other words, Fitch sees the moral life as a development out of the life of instinct and impulse rather than as a counterblast to it. And he even finds a prefiguring of the categorical imperative on the level of physical longing, 
sinan, and desire. In his ethics he has, of course, to allow for the fact that there may be, and often is, a conflict between the voice of duty and the claims of sensual desire. But he tries to resolve the problem within the framework of a unified view of the ego's activity in general. 2. From one point of view Fichte's deduction of consciousness can be regarded as a systematic exhibition of the conditions of consciousness as we know it. And if it is regarded simply in this way, questions about the temporal or historical relations between the different conditions are irrelevant. For example, Fitch takes it that the subject-object relationship is essential to consciousness. And in this case there must be both subject and object, ego and non-ego, if there is to be consciousness. The historical order in which these conditions appear is irrelevant to the validity of this statement. But, as we have seen, the deduction of consciousness is also idealist metaphysics, and the pure ego has to be interpreted as a super-individual and transfinite activity, the so-called absolute ego. Hence it is understandable if the student of Fichte asks whether the philosopher regards the absolute ego as positing the sensible world before the finite ego or simultaneously with it or through it. At first sight at least this may seem to be a silly question. The temporal, historical point of view, it may be said, presupposes for Fichte the constitution of empirical consciousness. Hence the transcendental deduction of empirical consciousness necessarily transcends the temporal and historical order and possesses the timelesser. S of a logical deduction. After all, the time series is itself deduced. Fichte has no intention of denying the point of view of empirical consciousness, for which nature precedes finite selves. He is concerned with grounding it, not with denying it. But the matter is not quite so simple. In the Kantian philosophy it is the human mind which exercises a constitutive activity in giving its a priori form to phenomenal reality. True, in this activity the mind acts spontaneously and unconsciously, and it acts as mind as such, as the subject as such, rather than as the mind of Tom or John. But it is nonetheless the human mind, not the divine mind, which is said to exercise this activity. And if we eliminate the thing in itself and hypostatize Kant's transcendental ego as the metaphysical absolute ego, it is quite natural to ask whether the absolute ego posits nature immediately or through the infraconscious levels, as it were, of the human being. After all, Fichte's deduction of consciousness not infrequently suggests the second of these alternatives. And if this is what the philosopher really means, he is faced with an obvious difficulty. Happily, Fichte answers the question in explicit terms. At the beginning of the practical deduction of consciousness he draws attention to an apparent contradiction. On the one hand the ego as intelligence is dependent on the non-ego. On the other hand the ego is said to determine the non-ego and must thus be independent of it. The contradiction is resolved, that is, shown to be only apparent, when we understand that the absolute ego determines immediately the non-ego which enters into representation, das Vorzustelend Nichtage, whereas it determines the ego as intelligence, the ego as representing, das Vorstelend Ich, immediately, that is, by means of the non-ego. In other words, the absolute ego does not posit the world through the finite ego, but immediately. And the same thing is clearly stated in a passage of the lectures on the facts of consciousness, to which allusion has already been made. The material world has been deduced earlier on as an absolute limitation of the productive power of imagination. But we have not yet stated clearly and explicitly whether the productive power in this function is the self-manifestation of the one life. As such or whether it is the manifestation of individual life, whether, that is to say, a material world is posited through one self-identical life or through the individual as such. It is not the individual as such but the one life which intuits the objects of the material world one the development of this point of view obviously requires that Fichte should move away from his Kantian point of departure, and that the pure ego, a concept arrived at through reflection on human consciousness, should become absolute being which manifests itself in the world. And this is indeed the path which Fichte takes in the later philosophy, to which the lectures on the facts of consciousness belong. But, as will be seen later, 
he never really succeeds in kicking away the ladder by which he has climbed up to metaphysical idealism. And though he clearly thinks of nature as being posited by the absolute as a field for moral activity, he maintains to the end that the world exists only in and for consciousness. Apart, therefore, from the explicit denial that materia things are posited through the individual as such, his position remains ambiguous. For though consciousness is said to be the absolute's consciousness, the absolute is also said to be conscious through man, and not in itself considered apart from man. Introductory remarks the common moral consciousness and the science of ethics man's moral nature the supreme principle of morality and the formal condition of the morality of actions conscience as an unerring guide the philosophical application of the formal moral law the idea of moral vocation and Fichte's general vision of reality a community of selves in a world as a condition of self-consciousness the principle or rule of right the deduction and nature of the state the closed commercial state Fichte and nationalism I in the section on Fichte's life and writings we saw that he published The Basis of Natural Right in 1796, two years before the publication of The System of Ethics. In his opinion the theory of rights and of political society could be, and ought to be, deduced independently of the deduction of the principles of morality. This does not mean that Fichte thought of the two branches of philosophy as having no connection at all with each other. For one thing the two deductions possess a common root in the concept of the self as striving and as free activity. For another thing the system of rights and political society provides a field of application for the moral law. But it was Fichte's opinion that his field is external to morality, in the sense that it is not a deduction from the fundamental ethical principle but a framework within which, and in regard to which, the moral law can be applied. For example, man can have moral duties towards the state and the state should bring about those conditions in which the moral life can develop. But the state itself is deduced as a hypothetically necessary contrivance or means to guard and protect the system of rights. If man's moral nature were fully developed, the state would wither away. Again, though the right of private property receives from ethics what Fitch calls a further sanction, its initial deduction is supposed to be independent of ethics. One main reason why Fichte makes this distinction between the theory of rights and political theory on the one hand and ethics on the other is that he looks on ethics as concerned with interior morality, with conscience, and the formal principle of morality. Whereas the theory of rights and of political society is concerned with the external relations between human beings. Further, if the comment is made that the doctrine of rights can be regarded as applied ethics, in the sense that it is deducible as an application of the moral law, Fichte refuses to admit the truth of this contention. The fact that I have a right does not necessarily mean that I am under an obligation to exercise it. And the common good may demand on occasion a curtailment of or limitation on the exercise of rights. But the moral law is categorical, it simply says, do this or do not do that. Hence the system of rights is not deducible from the moral law, though we are, of course, morally obliged to respect the system of rights as established in a community. In this sense the moral law adds a further sanction to rights, but it is not their initial source. In Hegel's opinion Fitch did not really succeed in overcoming the formalism of the Kantian ethics, even if he provided some of the material for doing so. And it was indeed Hegel rather than Fichte who synthesized the concepts of right, interior morality, and society in the general concept of man's ethical life. But the chief reason why I have dwelt in the first section of this chapter on Fichte's distinction between the doctrine of rights and ethical theory is that I propose to treat of the philosopher's moral theory before outlining his theory of rights and of the state. And this procedure might otherwise give the erroneous impression that Fichte regarded the theory of rights as a deduction from the moral law. 2. A man can have knowledge, Fichte says, of his moral nature, of his subjection to a moral imperative, in two ways. In the first place he can possess this knowledge on the level of common moral consciousness. That is to say, he can be aware through his conscience of a moral imperative telling him to do this or not to do that. And this immediate awareness is quite sufficient for a knowledge of one's duties and for moral behavior. In the second place a man can assume the ordinary moral consciousness as something given and inquire into its grounds. 
and a systematic deduction of the moral consciousness from its roots in the ego is the science of ethics and provides learned knowledge. One in one sense, of course, this learned knowledge leaves everything as it was before. It does not create obligation, nor does it substitute a new set of duties for those of which one is already aware through conscience. It will not give a man a moral nature. But it can enable him to understand his moral nature. 3. What is meant by man's moral nature? Fitch tells us that there is in man an impulsion to perform certain actions simply for the sake of performing them, without regard to external purposes or ends, and to leave undone other actions simply for the sake of leaving them undone, again without regard to external purposes or ends. And the nature of man in so far as this impulsion necessarily manifests itself within him is his moral or ethical nature. One to understand the grounds of this moral nature is the task of ethics. The ego is activity, striving. And as we saw when considering the practical deduction of consciousness, the basic form taken by the striving which constitutes the ego is infraconscious impulse or drive. Hence from one point of view man is a system of impulses, the impulse which can be ascribed to the system as a whole being that of self-preservation. Considered in this light, man can be described as an organized product of nature. And as conscious of myself as a system of impulses I can say, I find myself as an organized product of nature too that is to say, I posit or affirm myself as being this when I consider myself as object. But man is also intelligence, a subject of consciousness. And as subject of consciousness the ego necessarily tends or is impelled to determine itself through itself alone, that is, it is a striving after complete freedom and independence. Inasmuch, therefore, as the natural impulses and desires which belong to man as a product of nature aim at satisfaction through some relation to a determinate natural object and consequently appear to depend on the object, we understandably contrast these impulses with the spiritual impulse of the ego as intelligence, the impulse, that is to say, to complete self-determination. We speak of lower and higher desires, of the sphere of necessity and the sphere of freedom, and introduce a dichotomy into human nature. Fitch does not deny, of course, that such distinctions have, so to speak, a cash value. For one can look at man from two points of view, as object, and as subject. As we have seen, I can be conscious of myself as an object in nature, as an organized product of nature, and I can be aware of myself as a subject for whose consciousness nature, including myself as object, exists. To this extent Kant's distinction between the phenomenal and noumenal aspects of man is justified. At the same time Fichte insists that this distinction is not ultimate. For instance, the natural impulse which aims at satisfaction and the spiritual impulse which aims at complete freedom and independence are from the transcendental or phenomenal point of view one impulse. It is a great mistake to suppose that man as an organized product of nature is the sphere of mere mechanism. As Fichte puts it, I do not hunger because food exists for me, but a certain object becomes food for me because I am hungry when the organism asserts itself, it tends to activity. And it is fundamentally the same impulse to self-activity which reappears in the form of the spiritual impulse to the realization of complete freedom. For this basic impulse cannot be stilled and brought to quiescence by temporary sense satisfaction, but reaches out, as it were, to infinity. It is true, of course, that the basic impulse or striving could not take the form of the higher spiritual impulse without consciousness. Consciousness is indeed a dividing line between man as an organized product of nature and man as a rational ego, as spirit. But from the philosophical point of view there is ultimately only one impulse, and man is subject and object in one. My impulse as a being of nature and my tendency as pure spirit asterisk are they two different impulses? No. From the transcendental point of view both are one and the same original impulse which constitutes my being, it is only regarded from two different sides. That is to say, I am subject-object, and in the identity and inseparability of both consists my true being. If I regard myself as an object, completely determined through the laws of sense intuition and discursive thinking, then that which is actually my one impulse becomes for me a natural impulse, 
because from this point of view I myself am nature. If I regard myself as subject, the impulse becomes for me a purely spiritual impulse or the law of self-determination. All the phenomena of the ego rest simply on the reciprocity of these two impulses, and this is really the reciprocal relation of one and the same impulse to itself too. This theory of the unity of man in terms of one impulse has an important bearing on ethics. Fitch makes a distinction between formal and material freedom. Formal freedom requires only the presence of consciousness. Even if a man always followed his natural impulses as directed to pleasure, he would do so freely, provided that he did so consciously and deliberately. One material freedom, however, is expressed in a series of acts tending to the realization of the ego's complete independence. And these are moral acts. Now, if we press this distinction, we should be faced with the difficulty of giving any content to the moral act. For we should have on the one hand actions performed in accordance with natural impulse, which are rendered determinate by their reference to particular objects, and on the other actions which exclude all determination by particular objects and are performed solely in accordance with the idea of freedom for freedom's sake. And this second class of actions would appear to be completely indeterminate. But Fitch answers that we have to effect a synthesis which is demanded by the fact that the impulse or tendency which constitutes man's nature is ultimately one impulse. The lower impulse or lower form of the one impulse must sacrifice its end, namely pleasure, while the higher impulse or form of the one impulse must sacrifice its purity, that is, its lack of determination by any object. Expressed in this abstract way Fitch's idea of a synthesis may seem extremely obscure. But the fundamental notion is clear enough. For example, it is clearly not demanded of the moral agent that he should cease to perform all those actions to which natural impulse prompts him, such as eating and drinking. It is not demanded of him that he should try to live as a disembodied spirit. What is demanded is that his actions should not be performed simply for the sake of immediate satisfaction, but that they should be members of a series converging towards the ideal end which man sets before himself as a spiritual subject. In so far as he fulfills this demand man realizes his moral nature. This suggests, of course, that the moral life involves substituting one end for another, a spiritual ideal for natural satisfaction and pleasure. And this idea may seem to be at variance with Fitch's picture of morality as demanding the performance of certain actions simply for the sake of performing them and the non-performance of other actions simply for the sake of not performing them. But the spiritual ideal in question is for Fitch's self-activity, action determined through the ego alone. And his point is that such action must take the form of a series of determinate actions in the world, though at the same time they must be determined by the ego itself and express its freedom rather than subjection to the natural world. This means in effect that the actions should be performed for the sake of performing them. One can say, therefore, that Fitch makes a resolute attempt to exhibit the unity of human nature and to show that there is continuity between the life of man as a natural organism and the life of man as spiritual subject of consciousness. At the same time the influence of the Kantian formalism is strongly marked. And it shows itself clearly in Fitch's account of the supreme principle of morality. 4. Speaking of the ego when it is thought only as object Fitch asserts that the essential character of the ego, by which it is distinguished from everything external to itself, consists in a tendency to self-activity selbsthatikite for the sake of self-activity, and it is this tendency which is thought when the ego is thought in and for itself without relation to anything outside it. One but it is the ego as subject, as intelligence, which thinks itself as object. And when it thinks itself as a tendency to self-activity for the sake of self-activity, it necessarily thinks itself as free, as able to realize absolute self-activity, as a power of self-determination. Further, the ego cannot conceive itself in this way without conceiving itself as subject to law, the law of determining itself in accordance with the concept of self-determination. That is to say, if I conceive my objective essence as a power of self-determination, the power of realizing absolute self-activity, I must also conceive myself as obliged to actualize this essence. We have, therefore, the two ideas of freedom and law. 
but just as the ego as subject and the ego as object, though distinguished in consciousness, are inseparable and ultimately one, so are the ideas of freedom and law inseparable and ultimately one. When you think yourself as free, you are compelled to think your freedom as falling under a law, and when you think this law, you are compelled to think yourself as free. Freedom does not follow from the law any more than the law follows from freedom. They are not two ideas, of which the one can be thought as dependent on the other, but they are one and the same idea, it is a complete synthesis too. By this somewhat tortuous route Fitch deduces the fundamental principle of morality, the necessary idea of the intelligence that it ought to determine its freedom purely and without exception in accordance with the concept of independence Selbstständigkeit. 1. The free being ought to bring its freedom under a law, namely the law of complete self-determination or absolute independence, absence of determination through any external object. And this law should admit of no exception because it expresses the very nature of the free being. Now, a finite rational being cannot ascribe freedom to itself without conceiving the possibility of a series of determinate free actions, caused by a will which is capable of exercising real causal activity. But the realization of this possibility demands an objective world in which the rational being can tend towards its goal through a series of particular actions. The natural world, the sphere of the non-ego, can thus be regarded as the material or instrument for the fulfillment of our duty, sensible things appearing as so many occasions for specifying the pure ought. We have already seen that according to Fitch the absolute ego posits the world as an obstacle or check which renders possible the recoil of the ego onto itself in self-consciousness. And we now see the positing of the world in a more specifically ethical context. It is the necessary condition for the rational being's fulfillment of its moral vocation. Without the world it could not give content, as it were, to the pure ought. To be a moral action, each of these particular actions must fulfill a certain formal condition. Act always according to your best conviction of your duty or act according to your conscience. This is the formal condition of the morality of our actions. To the will which so acts is the good will. Fitched is obviously writing under the influence of Kant. 5. Act according to your conscience. Fitch defines conscience as the immediate consciousness of our determinate duty. 3. That is to say, conscience is the immediate awareness of a particular obligation. And from this definition it obviously follows that conscience never errs and cannot err. For if conscience is defined as an immediate awareness of one's duty, it would be contradictory to say that it can be a non-awareness of one's duty. It is clear that Fitch wishes to find an absolute criterion of right and wrong. It is also clear that he wishes, like Kant, to avoid heteronomy. No external authority can be the required criterion. Further, the criterion must be at the disposal of all, unlearned as well as learned. Fitch fixes, therefore, upon conscience and describes it as an immediate feeling, Gavtil. For inasmuch as the practical power has priority over the theoretical power, it is the former which must be the source of conscience. And as the practical power does not judge, conscience must be a feeling. Fitch's description of conscience as an immediate feeling does indeed fit in with the way in which the ordinary man is accustomed to speak about his moral convictions. A man might say, for example, I feel that this is the right thing to do. I feel that any other course of action would be wrong. And he may very well feel certain about it. At the same time one might wish to comment that feeling is scarcely an unerring criterion of duty. Fitched, however, argues that the immediate feeling in question expresses the agreement or harmony between our empirical ego and the pure ego. And the pure ego is our only true being, it is all possible being and all possible truth one hence the feeling which constitutes conscience can never be erroneous or deceptive. To understand Fitch's theory we must understand that he is not excluding from man's moral life all activity by the theoretical power. The ego's fundamental tendency to complete freedom and independence stimulates this power to look for the determinate content of duty. After all, we can and do reflect about what we ought to do in this or that set of circumstances. But any theoretical judgment which we make may be mistaken. 
The function of argument is to draw attention to the different aspects of the situation under discussion and so to facilitate the attunement, so to speak, of the empirical ego with the pure ego. This attunement expresses itself in a feeling, the immediate consciousness of one's duty. And this immediate awareness puts a stop to theoretical inquiry and argument which might otherwise be prolonged indefinitely. Fitched will not admit that anyone who has an immediate consciousness of his duty can resolve not to do his duty precisely because it is his duty. Such a maxim would be diabolical, but the concept of the devil is self-contradictory too at the same time no man, indeed no finite being so far as we know, is confirmed in good. Three conscience as such cannot err, but it can be obscured or even vanish. Thus the concept of duty may remain, though the consciousness of its connection with some particular action may be obscured. To put the matter crudely, I may not give my empirical ego the chance to click with the pure ego. One further, the consciousness of duty may practically vanish, in which case we then act either according to the maxim of self-advantage or according to the blind impulse to assert everywhere our lawless will. To thus even if the possibility of diabolical evil is excluded, the doctrine of infallibility of conscience does not exclude the possibility of acting wrongly. For I may be accountable for allowing my conscience to become obscured or even to vanish altogether. According to Fitched, therefore, the ordinary man has at his disposal, if he chooses to make use of it, an infallible criterion for assessing his particular duties, which does not depend on any knowledge of the science of ethics. But the philosopher can inquire into the grounds of this criterion. And we have seen that Fitched offers a metaphysical explanation. 6. Conscience is thus the supreme judge in the practical moral life. But its dictates are not arbitrary and capricious. For the feeling of which Fitched speaks is really the expression of our implicit awareness that a particular action falls inside or outside the series of actions which fulfill the fundamental impulse of the pure ego. Hence even if conscience is a sufficient guide for moral conduct, there is no reason why the philosopher should be unable to show theoretically that actions of a certain type belong or do not belong to the class of actions which lead to the ego's moral goal. He cannot deduce the particular obligations of particular individuals. This is a matter for conscience. But a philosophical application of the fundamental principle of morality is possible, within the limits of general principles or rules. To take an example. I am under an obligation to act, for only through action can I fulfill the moral law. And the body is a necessary instrument for action. On the one hand, therefore, I ought not to treat my body as if it were itself my final end. On the other hand I ought to preserve and foster the body as a necessary instrument for action. Hence self-mutilation, for example, would be wrong unless it were required for the preservation of the body as a whole. Whether in this or that particular instance self-mutilation is justified is, however, a matter for conscience rather than for the philosopher. I can only consider the situation under its different aspects and then act according to my immediate consciousness of my duty, confident, according to Fitched, that this immediate feeling cannot err. Similarly, one can formulate general rules in regard to the use of the cognitive powers. Fitched's profound respect for the vocation of the scholar is expressed in his insistence on the need for combining complete freedom of thought and research with the conviction that knowledge of MYDUTY must be the final end of all my knowledge, all my thought and research. One the synthesizing rule is that the scholar should pursue his researches in a spirit of devotion to duty and not out of mere curiosity or to have something to do. 7. The philosopher, therefore, can lay down certain general rules of conduct as applications of the fundamental principle of morality. But an individual's moral vocation is made up of countless particular obligations, in regard to which conscience is the unerring guide. Thus each single individual has his own real moral vocation, his own personal contribution to make to converging series of actions which tend to realize a moral world order, the perfect rule of reason in the world. The attainment of this ideal goal requires, as it were, a division of moral labor. And we can reformulate the fundamental principle of morality in this way, 
always fulfill your moral vocation to the general outlines of Fichte's vision of reality should now be clear. The ultimate reality, which can be described, according to our point of view, as the absolute ego or as infinite will, strives spontaneously towards perfect consciousness of itself as free, towards perfect self-possession. But self-consciousness, in Fichte's view, must take the form of finite self-consciousness, and the infinite will self-realization can take place only through the self-realization of finite wills. Hence the infinite activity spontaneously expresses itself in a multiplicity of finite selves or rational and free beings. But self-consciousness is not possible without a non-ego, from which the finite ego can recoil onto itself. And the realization of the finite free will through action requires a world in and through which action is possible. Hence the absolute ego or infinite will must posit the world, nature, if it is to become conscious of its own freedom through finite selves. And the moral vocations of finite selves in a common goal can be seen as the way in which the absolute ego or infinite will moves towards its goad. Nature is simply the condition, though a necessary condition, for the expression of the moral will. The really significant feature in empirical reality is the moral activity of human beings, which is itself the expression of the infinite will, the form which the infinite will, an activity or doing rather than a being which acts, spontaneously and necessarily assumes. 8. We can turn now to the theory of right and the deduction of the state, to a consideration, that is to say, of the framework within which man's moral life is developed. But the theory of right and political theory, treating, as they do, of relations between human beings, presupposes a plurality of selves. Hence it is appropriate to begin by saying a little more about Fichte's deduction of this plurality. As we have seen, the absolute ego must limit itself in the form of the finite ego if self-consciousness is to arise. But no free being becomes conscious of itself without at the same time becoming conscious of other similar beings. 1. It is only by distinguishing myself from other beings which I recognize as rational and free that I can become conscious of myself as a determinate free individual. Intersubjectivity is a condition of self-consciousness. A community of selves is thus required if self-consciousness is to arise. Intelligence, as existing, is a manifold. In fact it is a closed manifold, that is, a system of rational beings. 2. For they are all limitations of the one absolute ego, the one infinite activity. This recognition of oneself as a member of a community or system of rational beings requires in turn, as a precondition, the sensible world. For I perceive my freedom as manifested in actions which interlock, so to speak, with the actions of others. And for such a system of actions to be possible there must be a common sensible world in which distinct rational beings can express themselves. 9. Now, if I cannot become conscious of myself as free without regarding myself as a member of a community of free rational beings, it follows that I cannot ascribe to myself alone the totality of infinite freedom. I limit myself in my appropriation of freedom by the fact that I also recognize the freedom of others three at the same time I must also conceive each member of the community as limiting the external expression of his freedom in such a way that all other members can express their freedom. This idea of each member of the community of rational beings limiting the expression of his freedom in such a way that all other members can also express their freedom is the concept of right. And the principle or rule of right, Rex Regal, is stated by Fichte in this way, limit your freedom through the concept of the freedom of all other persons with whom you come into relation 1. The concept of right for Fichte is essentially a social concept. It arises together with the idea of other rational beings who are capable of interfering with one's own activity, and with whose activities one is oneself capable of interfering. If I think away all other rational beings save myself, I have powers, and I may have a moral duty to exercise them or some of them. But it is inappropriate in this context to speak of my having a right to exercise them. For instance, I have the power of free speech. But if I think away all other rational beings, it is absurd, according to Fichte, to speak of my having a right to free speech. 
for the concept makes no sense unless I conceive the existence of other beings capable of interfering with my exercise of the power to speak my mind freely. Similarly, it makes no sense to speak of a right to private property except in a social context. True, if I were the only rational being I should have a duty to act and to use material things, expressing my freedom in and through them. I should have possessions. But the concept of the right of private property in the strict sense arises only when I conceive other human beings to whom I have to ascribe similar rights. What can private property mean outside a social context? Now, though the existence of a community of free selves demands that each member should take the rule of right as the operative principle of his conduct, no individual will is necessarily governed by the rule. Fitch argues, however, that the union of many wills into one can produce a will constantly directed by the rule. If a million men are together, it may well be that each one wills for himself as much freedom as possible. But if we unite the will of all in one concept as one will, this will divides the sum of possible freedom into equal parts. It aims at all being free in such a way that the freedom of each individual is limited by the freedom of all the rest one this union expresses itself in mutual recognition of rights. And it is this mutual recognition which gives rise to the right of private property, considered as the right to exclusive possession of certain things. 3. The right of exclusive possession is brought into being through mutual recognition, and it does not exist without this condition. All property is grounded on the union of many wills into one will 110. If the stability of rights rests on sustained common recognition, reciprocal loyalty and trust are required in the persons concerned. But these are moral conditions on which one cannot count with certainty. Hence there must be some power which can enforce respect for rights. Further, this power must be the expression of the freedom of the human person, it must be established freely. We thus require a compact or contract whereby the contracting parties agree that anyone who infringes the rights of another should be treated in accordance with coercive law. But such a contract can be effective only when it takes the form of the social contract whereby the state is established, too furnished with the requisite power to secure the attainment of the end desired by the general will, namely the stability of the system of rights and the protection of the freedom of all. The union of all wills into one thus takes the form of the general will as embodied in the state. The influence of Rousseau III is obvious, both in Fichte's theory of the general will and in his idea of the social contract. But the ideas are not introduced simply out of reverence for the name of the French philosopher. For Fichte's deduction of the state consists in a progressive argument showing that the state is a necessary condition for maintaining relations of right without which a community of free persons cannot be conceived and this community is itself depicted as a necessary condition for the self-realization of the absolute ego as infinite freedom. The state must thus be interpreted as the expression of freedom. And Rousseau's theories of the social contract and general will lend themselves for this purpose. Fitch does indeed speak of the state as a totality, and he compares it with an organized product of nature. We cannot say, therefore, that the organic theory of the state is absent from Fichte's political thought. At the same time he emphasizes the fact that the state not only expresses freedom but also exists to create a state of affairs in which each citizen can exercise his personal freedom so far as this is consistent with the freedom of others. Further, the state, considered as a coercive power, is only hypothetically necessary. That is to say, it is necessary on the hypothesis that man's moral development has not reached a point at which each member of society respects the rights and liberties of others from moral motives alone. If this condition were fulfilled, the state, as a coercive power, would no longer be necessary. Indeed, as one of the functions of the state is to facilitate man's moral development, we can say that for Fitch the state should endeavor to bring about the conditions for its own demise. To use Marxist language, Fitch looks forward to the withering away of the state, at least as an ideal possibility. He cannot, therefore, regard it as an end in itself. Given these premises, Fitch naturally rejects despotism. What may seem surprising in a sympathizer with the French Revolution is that he also rejects democracy. 
No state may be ruled either despotically or democratically one but by democracy he understands direct rule by the whole people. And his objection to it is that in a literal democracy there would be no authority to compel the multitude to observe its own laws. Even if many citizens were individually well disposed, there would be no power capable of preventing the degeneration of the community into an irresponsible and capricious mob. Provided, however, that the two extremes of unqualified despotism and democracy are avoided, we cannot say what form of constitution is the best. It is a matter of politics, not of philosophy. At the same time reflection on the possibility of abuse of power by the civil authority led Fitch to lay great stress on the desirability of establishing a kind of Supreme Court or Tribunal, the F or 8. This would possess no legislative, executive, or judicial power in the ordinary sense. Its function would be to watch over the observance of the laws and constitution, and in the event of a serious abuse of power by the civil authority the efforts would be entitled to suspend it from the exercise of its functions by means of a state interdict. Recourse would then be had to a referendum to ascertain the people's will concerning a change in the constitution, the law, or the government, as the case might be. That Fitch shows no inclination to deify the state is clear enough. But his political theory, as so far outlined, may suggest that he is committed to minimizing the functions of the state by defending a purely laissez-faire policy. But this conclusion does not represent his mind. He does indeed maintain that the purpose of the state is to maintain public security and the system of rights. And from this it follows that interference with the freedom of the individual should be limited to what is required for the fulfillment of this purpose. But the establishment and maintenance of a system of rights and its adjustment to the common good may require a very considerable amount of state activity. It is idle, for example, to insist that everyone has a right to live by his labor if conditions are such that many people cannot do so. Further, though the state is not the fount of the moral law, it is its business to promote the conditions which facilitate the moral development without which there is no true freedom. In particular it should attend to the matter of education. 2. Hence it is not really so astonishing if in his closed commercial state we find Fitch envisaging a planned economy. He presupposes that all human beings have a right not simply to live but to live a decent human life. APD the question then arises how this right can be most effectively realized. In the first place, as Plato recognized centuries ago, there must be division of labor, giving rise to the main economic classes. One and in the second place a state of harmony or balance must be maintained. If one economic class grows disproportionately large, the whole economy may be upset. In the system of ethics Fitch emphasized the individual's duty to choose his profession in accordance with his talents and circumstances. In the closed commercial state he is concerned rather with the common good, and he stresses the state's need to watch over and regulate the division of labor for the good of the community. True, changing circumstances will demand changes in the state's regulations. But supervision and planning are in any case indispensable. In Fitch's opinion a balanced economy, once established, cannot be maintained unless the state has the power to prevent its being upset by any individual or set of individuals. And he draws the conclusion that all commercial relations with foreign countries should be in the hands of the state or subject to strict state control. In the rational state immediate trade with a foreign subject cannot be permitted to the individual citizen to Fitch's ideal is. That of a closed economy in the sense of a self-sufficient economic community. One but if there has to be trade with foreign countries, it should not be left to the private initiative and judgment of individuals. What Fitch envisages, therefore, is a form of national socialism. And he thinks of a planned economy as calculated to provide the material conditions required for the higher intellectual and moral development of the people. In fact, by the rational state, der Vernunft state, he really means a state directed according to the principles of his own philosophy. We may not feel particularly optimistic about the results of state patronage of a particular philosophical system. But in Fitch's opinion rulers who were really conversant with the principles of transcendental idealism would never abuse their power by restricting private freedom more than was required for the attainment of an end which is itself the expression of freedom. 12. 
Regarded from the economic point of view, Fichte can be spoken of as one of Germany's first socialist writers. Politically speaking, however, he moved from an earlier cosmopolitan attitude towards German nationalism. In the basis of natural right he interpreted the idea of the general will as leading to the idea of the union of all human wills in a universal community, and he looked forward to a confederation of nations. The system of rights, he thought, could be rendered really stable only through the establishment of a worldwide community. And to a certain extent he always retained this wide outlook. For his ideal was always that of the advance of all men to spiritual freedom. But he came to think that the ideals of the French Revolution, which had aroused his youthful enthusiasm, had been betrayed by Napoleon and that the Germans were better qualified than the French for leading mankind towards its goal. After all, were not the Germans best suited for understanding the principles of the Wissenschaftslehre and so for enlightening mankind and teaching it by example what the saving truth could effect? In other words, he thought of Germany as having a cultural mission. And he was convinced that this mission could not be effectively fulfilled without the political unity of the German people. Cultural and linguistic unity go together, and no culture can be unified and lasting without the backbone of political unity. Hence Fichte looked forward to the formation of one German Reich which would put an end to the existing division of the Germans into a multiplicity of states. And he hoped for the emergence of a leader who would achieve this political unification of the Germans into one rational state. If we look back on Fichte's hopes and dreams in the light of Germany's history in the first half of the 20th century, they obviously tend to appear as sinister and ominous. But, as has already been remarked, we should bear in mind the historical circumstances of his own time. In any case further reflections on this matter can be left to the reader. Fichte's early ideas on religion got in the first version of the theory of science the charge of atheism and Fichte's reply the infinite will in the vocation of man the development of the philosophy of being, 1801-5 the doctrine of religion later writings explanatory and critical comments on Fichte's philosophy of being. One in 1790 Fichte wrote some notes or aphorisms on religion and deism, aphorism and iber religion und deismus, which express clearly enough a sense of tension between simple Christian piety and speculative philosophy or, to use a rather hackneyed phrase, between the god of religion and the god of the philosophers. The Christian religion seems to be designed more for the heart than for the understanding one the heart seeks a god who can respond to prayer, who can feel compassion and love, and Christianity fulfills this need. But the understanding, as represented by what Fichte calls deism, presents us with the concept of a changeless necessary being who is the ultimate cause of all that happens in the world. Christianity offers us the picture of an anthropomorphic deity, and this picture is well adapted to religious feeling and its exigencies. Speculative philosophy offers us the idea of a changeless first cause and of a system of finite beings which is governed by determinism. And this idea of the understanding does not meet the needs of the heart. True, the two are compatible, in the sense that speculative philosophy leaves untouched the subjective validity of religion. And for the pious Christian who knows little or nothing of philosophy there is no problem. But what of the man whose heart desires a God conceived in human terms but who is at the same time so constituted that the inclination to philosophical reflection is part of his nature? It is all very well to say that he should set limits to philosophical reflection. But can he do so, even if he wishes? Fichte's own reflection, however, led him in the direction of the Kantian conception of God and of religion rather than in that of deism, which belonged to the pre-Kantian era and in his essay. Towards a critique of all revelation, Versuch einer Kritik aller Offenbarung, 1792, he attempted to develop Kant's point of view. In particular he made a distinction between theology and religion. The idea of the possibility of a moral law demands belief in God not only as the power which dominates nature and is able to synthesize virtue and happiness but also as the complete embodiment of the moral ideal, as the all-holy being and supreme good. But assent to propositions about God, such as God is holy and just, is not the same thing as religion which according to the meaning of the word religio should be something which binds us, and indeed binds us more strongly than we would otherwise be bound. 
1 and this binding is derived from the acceptance of the rational moral law as God's law, as the expression of the divine will. Needless to say, Fitch does not mean that the content of the moral law is arbitrarily determined by the divine will, so that it cannot be known without revelation. Nor does he propose to substitute the concept of heteronomy, of an authoritarian ethics, for the Kantian concept of the autonomy of the practical reason. To justify his position, therefore, he has recourse to the idea of a radical evil in man, that is, to the idea of the ingrained possibility of evil, owing to the strength of natural impulse and passion, and to the idea of the consequent obscuring of man's knowledge of the moral law. The concept of God as the moral legislator and of obedience to the all-holy will of God helps man to fulfill the moral law and grounds the additional element of binding which is peculiar to religion. Further, as the knowledge of God and his law can be obscured, God's revelation of himself as moral legislator is desirable if it is possible. This may sound as though Fichte is going well beyond Kant. But the difference is much less than may appear at first. Fitch does not decide where revelation is to be found. But he gives general criteria for deciding whether an alleged revelation is really what it claims to be. For example, no alleged revelation can possibly be what it is claimed to be if it contradicts the moral law. And any alleged revelation which goes beyond the idea of the moral law as the expression of the divine will is not revelation. Hence Fitch does not really transcend the limits of Kant's conception of religion and the sympathy which he was later to show for Christian dogmas is absent at this stage of his thought. Obviously, it can be objected against Fichte's position that to decide whether revelation really is revelation or not we have first to know the moral law. Hence revelation adds nothing except the idea of fulfilling the moral law as the expression of the all-holy will of God. True, this additional element constitutes what is peculiar to religion. But it seems to follow, on Fichte's premises, that religion is, as it were, a concession to human weakness. For it is precisely human weakness which needs strengthening through the concept of obedience to the divine legislator. Hence if Fichte is not prepared to abandon the Kantian idea of the autonomy of the practical reason and if at the same time he wishes to retain and support the idea of religion, he must revise his concept of God. And as will be seen presently, his own system of transcendental idealism, in its first form at least, left him no option but to do this. 2. In Fichte's first exposition and explanations of the Wissenschaftslayer there is very little mention of God. Nor indeed is there much occasion for mentioning God. For Fichte is concerned with the deduction or reconstruction of consciousness from a first principle which is immanent in consciousness. As we have seen, the pure ego is not a being which lies behind consciousness but an activity which is imminent in consciousness and grounds it. And the intellectual intuition by which the pure ego is apprehended is not a mystical apprehension of the deity but an intuitive grasping of the pure I principle revealing itself as an activity or doing, thun. Hence if we emphasize the phenomenological aspect of Fichte's theory of science or knowledge, there is no more reason for describing his pure ego as God than there is for so describing Kant's transcendental ego. The phenomenological aspect is not indeed the only aspect. In virtue of his elimination of the thing in itself and his transformation of the critical philosophy into idealism Fichte is bound to attribute to the pure ego an ontological status and function which was not attributed by Kant to the transcendental ego as logical condition of the unity of consciousness. If the thing in itself is to be eliminated, sensible being must be derived, in all the reality which it possesses, from the ultimate principle on the side of the subject, that is, from the absolute ego. But the word absolute must be understood as referring in the first place to that which is fundamental in the transcendental deduction of consciousness from a principle which is immanent in consciousness, not as referring to a being beyond all consciousness. To postulate such a being in a system of transcendental idealism would be to abandon the attempt to reduce being to thought. It is true, of course, that the more the metaphysical implications of the theory of the absolute ego are asterisk developed, the more does it take on, as it were, the character of the divine. For it then appears as the infinite activity which produces within itself the world of nature and of finite selves. 
but while Fichte is primarily engaged in transforming the system of Kant into idealism and in deducing experience from the transcendental ego, it would hardly occur to him to describe this ego as God. For, as the very use of the word ego shows, the notion of the pure, transcendental, or absolute ego is so entangled, as it were, with human consciousness that such a description necessarily appears as extremely inappropriate. Further, the term God signifies for Fitch a personal self-conscious being. But the absolute ego is not a self-conscious being. The activity which grounds consciousness and is a striving towards self-consciousness cannot itself be conscious. The absolute ego, therefore, cannot be identified with God. What is more, we cannot even think the idea of God. The concept of consciousness involves a distinction between subject and object, ego and non-ego. And self-consciousness presupposes the positing of the non-ego and itself involves a distinction between the I-subject and the me-object. But the idea of God is the idea of a being in which there is no such distinction and which is perfectly self-luminous quite independently of the existence of a world. And we are unable to think such an idea. We can talk about it, of course, but we cannot be said to conceive it. For once we try to think what is said, we necessarily introduce the distinctions which are verbally denied. The idea of a subject to which nothing is opposed is thus the unthinkable idea of the Godhead. 1. It should be noted that Fitch does not say that God is impossible. When Jean-Paul Sartre says that self-consciousness necessarily involves a distinction and that the idea of an infinite self-consciousness in which there is perfect coincidence of subject and object without any distinction is a contradictory idea, he intends this as a proof of atheism, if, that is to say, theism is understood as implying the idea which is alleged to be contradictory. But Fitch carefully avoids saying that it is impossible that there should be a god. He appears to leave open the possibility of a being which transcends the range of human thought and conception. In any case Fitch does not assert atheism. At the same time it is easily understandable that Fitch was accused of atheism. And we can turn to a brief consideration of the famous atheism controversy which resulted in the philosopher having to abandon his chair at Jena. 3. In his paper on the basis of our belief in a divine providence, 1798, Fitch gave an explicit account of his idea of God. Let us assume first of all that we are looking at the world from the point of view of ordinary consciousness, which is also that of empirical science. From this point of view, that is, for empirical consciousness, we find ourselves as being in the world, the universe, and we cannot transcend it by means of any metaphysical proof of the existence of a supernatural being. The world is, simply because it is, and it is what it is, simply because it is what it is. From this point of view we start with an absolute being, and this absolute being is the world, the two concepts are identical one to explain the world as the creation of a divine intelligence is, from the scientific point of view, simply nonsense, total or unsin. The world is a self-organizing whole which contains in itself the ground of all the phenomena which occur in it. Now let us look at the world from the point of view of transcendental idealism. The world is then seen as existing only for consciousness and as posited by the pure ego. But in this case the question of finding a cause of the world apart from the ego does not arise. Therefore neither from the scientific nor from the transcendental point of view can we prove the existence of a transcendent divine creator. There is, however, a third point of view, the moral. And when looked at from this point of view the world is seen to be the sensible material for, the performance of, our duty. Two and the ego is seen to belong to a supersensible moral order. It is this moral order which is God. The living and operative moral order is itself God. We need no other God, and we cannot conceive any other three this is the true faith, this moral order is the divine. It is constructed by right action one to speak of God as substance or as personal or as exercising with foresight a benevolent providence is so much nonsense. Belief in divine providence is the belief that moral action always has good results and that evil actions can never have good results. That such statements led to a charge of atheism is not altogether surprising. 
for to most of Fichte's readers God seemed to have been reduced to a moral ideal. And this is not what is generally meant by the ism. After all, there are atheists with moral ideals. Fichte, however, was indignant at the accusation and answered it at considerable length. His replies did not achieve the desired result of clearing his name in the eyes of his opponents, but this is irrelevant for our purposes. We are concerned only with what he said. In the first place Fichte explained that he could not describe God as personal or as substance because personality was for him something essentially finite and substance meant something extended in space and time, a material thing. In fact, none of the attributes of things or beings could be predicated of God. Speaking in a purely philosophical manner one would have to say of God, he is not a being but a pure activity, the life and principle of a supersensible world order one in the second place Fichte maintained that his critics had misunderstood what he meant by a moral world order. They had interpreted him as saying that God is a moral order in a sense analogous to the order created by a housewife when she arranges the furniture and other objects in a room. But what he had really meant was that God is an active ordering, an or do ordinance, a living and active moral order, not an ordo ordinatus, something merely constructed by human effort. God is ein tatiges ordnen, an active ordering, rather than an ordnung, an order constructed by man. 2. And the finite ego, considered as acting in accordance with duty, is a member of that supersensible world order. 3. In Fichte's idea of God as the moral world order we can perhaps see the fusion of two lines of thought. First there is the concept of the dynamic unity of all rational beings. In the basis of the entire theory of science Fichte had not much occasion for dwelling on the plurality of selves. For he was primarily concerned with an abstract. Has simply neglected grammatical propriety, we must recognize that he is not saying that God, identified with the moral order, is no more than a creation or construction of man. Deduction of experience in the sense already explained but in the basis of natural right he insisted, as we have seen, on the necessity of a plurality of rational beings. Man becomes man only amongst men, and as he can be nothing else but man and would not exist at all if he were not man, there must be a plurality of men if there is to be man at all one hence Fichte was naturally impelled to reflect on the bond of union between men. In the science of ethics he was primarily concerned with the moral law as such and with personal morality, but he expressed his conviction that all rational beings have a common moral end, and he spoke of the moral law as using the individual as a tool or instrument for its self-realization in the sensible world. And from this notion there is an easy transition to the idea of a moral world order which fulfills itself in and through rational beings and unites them in itself. The second line of thought is Fichte's strongly moralistic conception of religion. At the time when he wrote the essay which occasioned the atheism controversy he tended, like Kant before him, to equate religion with morality. Not prayer but the performance of one's duty is true religion. True, Fichte allowed that the moral life has a distinguishable religious aspect, namely the belief that whatever appearances may suggest performance of one's duty always produces a good result because it forms part, as it were, of a self-realizing moral order. But, Given Fichte's moralistic interpretation of religion, faith in this moral world order would naturally count for him as faith in God, especially as on his premises he could not think of God as a personal transcendent being. This moralistic conception of religion finds clear expression in an essay to which the title from a private paper, 1800, has been given. The place or locus of religion, Fichte asserts, is found in obedience to the moral law and religious faith is faith in a moral order. In action considered from a purely natural and non-moral point of view man reckons on the natural order, that is, on the stability and uniformity of nature. In moral action he reckons on a supersensible moral order in which his action has a part to play and which ensures its moral fruitfulness. Every belief in a divine being which contains more than this concept of the moral order is to that extent imagination and superstition too obviously, those who described Fichte as an atheist were from one point of view quite justified. For he refused to assert what the ism was generally taken to mean. 
at the same time his indignant repudiation of the charge of atheism is understandable. For he did not assert that nothing exists except finite selves and the sensible world. There is, at least as an object of practical faith, a supersensible moral world order which fulfills itself in and through man. 4. But if the moral world order is really an ordo ordinance, a truly active ordering, it must obviously possess an ontological status. And in the vocation of man, 1800, it appears as the eternal and infinite will. This will binds me in union with itself, it also binds me in union with all finite beings like myself and is the common mediator between us all one it is infinite reason. But dynamic creative reason is will. Fichte also describes it as creative life. If we took some of Fichte's expressions literally, we should probably be inclined to interpret his doctrine of the infinite will in a theistic sense. He even addresses the sublime and living will, named by no name and compassed by no concept. Too but he still maintains that personality is something limited and finite and cannot be applied to God. The infinite differs from the finite in nature and not merely in degree. Further, the philosopher repeats that true religion consists in the fulfillment of one's moral vocation. At the same time this idea of doing one's duty and so fulfilling one's moral vocation is undoubtedly infused with a spirit of devout abandonment to and trust in the divine will. To appreciate the role of the vocation of man in the development of Fichte's later philosophy it is important to understand that the doctrine of the infinite will is described as a matter of faith. This somewhat strange and turgid work, which is introduced by the remarks that it is not intended for professional philosophers and that the eye of the dialogue portions should not be taken without more ado to represent the author himself, is divided into three parts, entitled respectively doubt, knowledge, and faith. In the second part idealism is interpreted as meaning that not only external objects but also one's own self, so far as one can have any idea of it, exist only for consciousness and the conclusion is drawn that everything is reduced to images or pictures, builder, without there being any reality which is pictured. All reality is transformed into a wonderful dream, without a life which is dreamed of and without a mind which dreams it, into a dream which consists of a dream of itself. Intuition is the dream, thought the source of all the being. And all the reality which I imagine to myself, of my being, my power, my purpose is the dream of that dream one in other words, subjective idealism reduces everything to presentations without there being anything which does the presenting or to which the presentations are made. For when I try to grasp the self for whose consciousness the presentations exist, this self necessarily becomes one of the presentations. Knowledge, therefore, that is, idealist philosophy, can find nothing abiding, no being but the mind cannot rest in such a position. And practical or moral faith, based on consciousness of myself as a moral will subject to the moral imperative, asserts the infinite will which underlies the finite self and creates the world in the only way in which it can do so, in the finite reason. Too Fitch thus retains idealism but at the same time goes beyond the ego philosophy to postulate the infinite underlying and all-comprehensive will. And with this postulate the atmosphere, so to speak, of his original philosophy changes dramatically. I do not mean to imply that there is no connection. For the theory of the will can be regarded as implicit in the practical deduction of consciousness in the original Wissenschaftslehr. At the same time the ego retreats from the foreground and an infinite reality, which is no longer described as the absolute ego, takes its place. Only reason exists, the infinite in itself, the finite in it and through it. Only in our minds does he create a world, at least that from which and that by which we unfold it, the voice of duty, and harmonious feelings, intuition, and laws of thought three as already mentioned, this dynamic panentheistic idealism is for Fitch a matter of practical faith, not of knowledge. To fulfill properly our moral vocations, we require faith in a living and active moral order which can only be interpreted as infinite dynamic reason, that is, as infinite will. This is the one true being behind the sphere of presentation, creating and sustaining it through finite selves which themselves exist only as manifestations of the infinite will. 
the development of Fichte's later philosophy is largely conditioned by the need to think this concept of absolute being, to give it philosophical form. In the vocation of man it remains within the sphere of moral faith. 5. In the exposition of the theory of science for which he composed in 1801 Fichte clearly states that all knowledge presupposes its own being. 1. For knowledge is a being slash or itself and in itself, 2. It is being's self-penetration 3. And is thus the expression of freedom. Absolute knowledge, therefore, presupposes absolute being, the former is the latter's self-penetration. Here we have a clear reversal of the position adopted by Fichte in the earlier form of his doctrine of knowledge. At first he maintained that all being is being for consciousness. Hence it was not possible for him to admit the idea of an absolute divine being behind or beyond consciousness. For the very fact of conceiving such a being made it conditioned and dependent. In other words, the idea of absolute being was for him contradictory. Now, however, he asserts the primacy of being. Absolute being comes to exist for itself in absolute knowledge. Hence the latter must presuppose the former. And this absolute being is the divine. It does not follow, of course, that absolute being is for Fichte a personal god. Being penetrates itself, comes to knowledge or consciousness of itself, in and through human knowledge of reality. In other words, absolute being expresses itself in and bears within itself all finite rational beings, and their knowledge of being is being's knowledge of itself. At the same time Fichte insists that absolute being can never be wholly understood or comprehended by the finite mind. In this sense God transcends the human mind. Evidently, there is some difficulty here. On the one hand absolute being is said to penetrate itself in absolute knowledge. On the other hand absolute knowledge seems to be ruled out. If, therefore, we exclude Christian theism, according to which God enjoys perfect self-knowledge independently of the human spirit, it appears that Fichte should logically adopt the Hegelian conception of philosophical knowledge as penetrating the inner essence of the absolute and as being the absolute's absolute knowledge of itself. But in point of fact Fichte does not do this. To the very end he maintains that absolute being in itself transcends the reach of the human mind. We know images, pictures, rather than the reality in itself. In the lectures on the Wissenschaft Slayer which he delivered in 1804 Fichte emphasizes the idea of absolute being as light, for an idea which goes back to Plato and the Platonic tradition in metaphysics. This living light in its radiation is said to divide itself into being and thought, Denken. But conceptual thought, Fichte insists, can never grasp absolute being in itself, which is incomprehensible. And this incomprehensibility is the negation of the concept. One one might expect Fichte to draw the conclusion that the human mind can approach the absolute only by way of negation. But in point of fact he makes a good many positive statements, telling us, for example, that being and life and esse are one, and that the absolute in itself can never be subject to division. Two it is only in its appearance, in the radiation of light, that division is introduced. In the nature of the scholar, 1806, the published version of lectures delivered at Erlangen in 1805, we are again told that the one divine being is life and that this life is itself changeless and eternal. But it externalizes itself in the life of the human race throughout time, an endlessly self-developing life which always advances towards a higher self-realization in a never-ending stream of time. Three in other words, this external life of God advances towards the realization of an ideal which can be described, in anthropomorphic language, as the idea and fundamental notion of God in the production of the world, God's purpose and plan for the world. For in this sense the divine idea is the ultimate and absolute foundation of all appearances registered six. These speculations were worked out more at length in the way to the blessed life or the doctrine of religion, 1806, which comprises a series of lectures delivered at Berlin. God is absolute being. And to say this is to say that God is infinite life. For being and life are one and the same. Eight in itself this life is one, indivisible and unchanging. But it expresses or manifests itself externally. 
and the only way in which it can do this is through consciousness which is the existence, Dasian, of God. Being exists with Da and the existence of being is necessarily consciousness or reflection. 7 In this external manifestation distinction or division appears. For consciousness involves the subject-object relation. The subject in question is obviously the limited or finite subject, namely the human spirit. But what is the object? It is indeed being. For consciousness, the divine Dasian, is consciousness of being. But being in itself, the immediate infinite life, transcends the comprehension of the human mind. Hence the object of consciousness must be the image or picture or schema of the absolute. And this is the world. What does this consciousness contain? I think that each of you will answer, the world and nothing but the world. In consciousness the divine life is inevitably transformed into an abiding world one in other words, being is objectified for consciousness in the form of the world. Although Fichte insists that the absolute transcends the grasp of the human mind, he says a good deal about it. And even if the finite spirit cannot know the infinite life as it is in itself, it can at least know that the world of consciousness is the image or schema of the absolute. Hence there are two main forms of life which lie open to man. It is possible for him to immerse himself in apparent life, das Scheinleben, life in the finite and changeable, life directed towards the gratification of natural impulse. But because of its unity with the infinite divine life the human spirit can never be satisfied with love of the finite and sensible. Indeed, the endless seeking for successive finite sources of satisfaction shows that even apparent life is informed or carried along, as it were, by the longing for the infinite and eternal which is the innermost root of all finite existence. Two hence man is capable of rising to true life, das waraftaj laban, which is characterized by love of God. For love, as Fichte puts it, is the heart of life. If it is asked in what this true life precisely consists, Fichte's reply is still given primarily in terms of morality. That is to say, true life consists primarily in a man's fulfilling his moral vocation, by which he is liberated from the servitude of the sensible world and in which he strives after the attainment of ideal ends. At the same time the markedly moralistic atmosphere of Fichte's earlier accounts of religion tends to disappear or at any rate to diminish. The religious point of view is not simply identical with the moral point of view. For it involves the fundamental conviction that God alone is, that God is the one true reality. True, God as he is in himself is hidden from the finite mind. But the religious man knows that the infinite divine life is immanent in himself, and his moral vocation is for him a divine vocation. In the creative realization of ideals or values through action 3 he sees the image or schema of the divine life. But though the doctrine of religion is permeated with a religious atmosphere, there is a marked tendency to subordinate the religious point of view to the philosophical. Thus, according to Fichte, while the religious point of view involves belief in the absolute as the foundation of all plurality and finite existence, philosophy turns this belief into knowledge. And it is in accordance with this attitude that Fichte attempts to show the identity between Christian dogmas and his own system. To be sure, this attempt can be regarded as the expression of a growth in sympathy with Christian theology, but it can also be regarded as an essay in demythologization. For instance, in the sixth lecture Fichte refers to the prologue to St. John's Gospel and argues that the doctrine of the Divine Word, when translated into the language of philosophy, is identical with his own theory of the divine existence or Dacian. And the statement of St. John that all things were made in and through the word means, from the speculative point of view, that the world and all that is in it exist only in the sphere of consciousness as the existence of the absolute. However, with the development of the philosophy of being there goes a development in Fichte's understanding of religion. From the religious point of view moral activity is love of God and fulfillment of his will, and it is sustained by faith and trust in God. We exist only in and through God, infinite life, and the feeling of this union is essential to the religious or blessed life, Da Selige Laban. 7. The way to the blessed life is a series of popular lectures, in the sense that it is not a work for professional philosophers. 
and Fitched is obviously concerned with edifying and uplifting his hearers, as well as with reassuring them that his philosophy is not at variance with the Christian religion. But the fundamental theories are common to Fitched's later writings, they are certainly not put forward simply for the sake of edification. Thus in the Facts of Consciousness, 1810, we are told that knowledge is certainly not merely knowledge of itself. It is knowledge of a being, namely of the one being which truly is, God. One but this object of knowledge is not grasped in itself, it is splintered, as it were, into forms of knowledge. And the demonstration of the necessity of these forms is precisely philosophy or the Wissenschaftslehre, too similarly, in the theory of science in its general outline, 1810, we read that only one being exists purely through itself, God. And neither within him nor outside him can a new being arise one the only thing which can be external to God is the schema or picture of being itself, which is God's being outside his being, to the divine self-externalization in consciousness. Thus the whole of the productive activity which is reconstructed or deduced in the theory of science is the schematizing or picturing of God, the spontaneous self-externalization of the divine life. In the system of ethics of 1812 we find Fitch saying that while from the scientific point of view the world is primary and the concept a secondary reflection or picture, from the ethical point of view the concept is primary. In fact the concept is ground of the world or of being. 3. And this assertion, if taken out of its context, appears to contradict the doctrine which we have been considering, namely that being is primary. But Fitched explains that the proposition in question, namely that the concept is ground of being, can be expressed in this way, reason or the concept is practical. For he further explains that though the concept or reason is in fact itself the picture of a higher being, the picture of God, ethics can and should know nothing of this. Ethics must know nothing of God, but take the concept itself as the absolute five in other words, the doctrine of absolute being, as expounded in the Wissenschaftslehre, transcends the sphere of ethics which deals with the causality of the concept, the self-realizing idea or ideal. 8. Fitch's later philosophy has sometimes been represented as being to all intents and purposes a new system which involved a break with the earlier philosophy of the ego. Fitch himself, however, maintained that it was nothing of the kind. In his view the philosophy of being constituted a development of his earlier thought rather than a break with it. If he had originally meant, as most of his critics took him to mean, that the world is the creation of the finite self as such, his later theory of absolute being would indeed have involved a radical change of view. But he had never meant this. The finite subject and its object, the two poles of consciousness, had always been for him the expression of an unlimited or infinite principle. And his later doctrine of the sphere of consciousness as the existence of infinite life or being was a development, not a contradiction, of his earlier thought. In other words, the philosophy of being supplemented the Wissenschaftslehre rather than took its place. It is indeed arguable that unless Fichte was prepared to defend a subjective idealism which it would have been difficult to dissociate from a solipsistic implication, he was bound in the long run to transgress his initial self-imposed limits, to go behind consciousness and to find its ground in absolute being. Further, he explicitly admitted that the absolute ego, as transcending the subject-object relationship which it grounds, must be the identity of subjectivity and objectivity. Hence it is not unnatural that in proportion as he developed the metaphysical aspect of his philosophy he should tend to discard the word ego as an appropriate descriptive term for his ultimate principle. For this word is too closely associated with the idea of the subject as distinct from the object. In this sense his later philosophy was a development of his earlier thought. At the same time it is also arguable that the philosophy of being is superimposed on the Wissenschaftslehre in such a way that the two do not really fit together. According to the Wissenschaftslehre the world exists only for consciousness. And this thesis really depends on the premise that being must be reduced to thought or consciousness. Fitch's philosophy of absolute being, however, clearly implies the logical priority of being to thought. True 
in his later philosophy Fitch does not deny his former thesis that the world has reality only within the sphere of consciousness. On the contrary, he reaffirms it. What he does is to depict the whole sphere of consciousness as the externalization of absolute being in itself. But it is very difficult to understand this idea of externalization. If we take seriously the statement that absolute being is and eternally remains one and immutable, we can hardly interpret Fitched as meaning that being becomes conscious. And if the sphere of consciousness is an eternal reflection of God, if it is the divine self-consciousness eternally proceeding from God as the Plotinian noose emanates eternally from the One, it seems to follow that there must always have been a human spirit. Fitched could, of course, depict absolute being as an infinite activity moving towards self-consciousness in and through the human spirit. But then it would be natural to conceive the infinite life as expressing itself immediately in objective nature as a necessary condition for the life of the human spirit. In other words, it would be natural to proceed in the direction of Hegel's absolute idealism. But this would involve a greater change in the Wissenschaftslayer than Fichte was prepared to make. He does indeed say, that it is the one life, and not the individual as such, which intuits the material world. But he maintains to the end that the world, as the image or schema of God, has reality only within the sphere of consciousness. And as absolute being in itself is not conscious, this can only mean human consciousness. Until this element of subjective idealism is abandoned, the transition to the absolute idealism of Hegel is not possible. There is indeed another possibility, namely that of conceiving absolute being as eternally self-conscious. But Fichte can hardly take the path of traditional theism. For his idea of what self-consciousness essentially involves prevents him from attributing it to the one. Hence consciousness must be derivative. And this is human consciousness. But there can be no being apart from God. Hence human consciousness must be in some sense the Absolute's consciousness of itself. But in what sense? It does not seem to me that any clear answer is forthcoming. And the reason is that Fichte's later philosophy of being could not be simply superimposed on the Wissenschaftslehre. A much greater measure of revision was required. It may be objected that to interpret Fichte's philosophy as demanding revision either in the direction of Hegel's absolute idealism or in that of the ism is to fail to do justice to its intrinsic character. And this is true in a sense. For Fichte has his own ethical vision of reality, to which attention has been drawn in these chapters. We have seen the infinite will expressing itself in finite selves for which nature forms the scene and material for the fulfillment of their several moral vocations. And we have seen these vocations converging towards the realization of a universal moral order, the goal, as it were, of the infinite will itself. And the grandeur of this vision of reality, of Fichte's dynamic ethical idealism in its main lines, is not in question. But Fichte did not offer his philosophy simply as an impressionistic vision or as poetry, but as the truth about reality. Hence criticism of his theories is quite in place. After all, it is not the vision of the realization of a universal ideal, a moral world order, which has been subjected to adverse criticism. This vision may well possess an abiding value. And it can serve as a corrective to an interpretation of reality simply in terms of empirical science. One can certainly derive stimulus and inspiration from Fichte. But to draw profit from him one has to discard a good deal of the theoretical framework of the vision. It has been stated above that Fichte could hardly take the path of traditional theism. But some writers have maintained that his later philosophy is in fact a form of theism. And in support of this contention they can appeal to certain statements which represent the philosopher's firm convictions and are not simply obiter dicta or remarks calculated to reassure his more orthodox readers or hearers. For example, Fichte constantly maintains that absolute being is unchangeable and that it can suffer no self diremption It is the eternal immutable one, not a static lifeless one but the fullness of infinite life. True, creation is free only in the sense that it is spontaneous, but creation does not affect any change in God. To be sure, Fichte refuses to predicate personality of God, even if he frequently employs Christian language and speaks of God as he. 
but as he regards personality as necessarily finite, he obviously cannot attribute it to infinite being. But this does not mean that he looks on God as infrapersonal. God is suprapersonal, not less than personal. In scholastic language, Fichte has no analogical concept of personality, and this prevents him from using theistic terms. At the same time the concept of absolute being which transcends the sphere of the distinctions which necessarily exist between finite beings is clearly a move in the direction of the ism. The ego no longer occupies the central position in Fichte's picture of reality, its place is taken by infinite life which in itself suffers no change or self diremption This is all very well as far as it goes. And it is true that Fichte's refusal to predicate personality of God is due to the fact that personality for him involves finitude. God transcends the sphere of personality rather than falls short of it. But it is also the absence of any clear idea of analogy which involves Fichte's thought in a radical ambiguity. God is infinite being. Therefore there can arise no being apart from God. If there were such a being, God would not be infinite. The Absolute is the sole being. This line of thought clearly points in the direction of pantheism. At the same time Fichte is determined to maintain that the sphere of consciousness, with its distinction, between the finite ego and the world, is in some sense outside God. But in what sense? It is all very well for Fichte to say that the distinction between the divine being and the divine existence arises only for consciousness. The question inevitably suggests itself, are finite selves beings or are they not? If they are not, monism results. And it is then impossible to explain how consciousness, with the distinctions which it introduces, arises. If, however, finite selves are beings, how are we to reconcile this with the statement that God is the only being unless we have recourse to a theory of analogy? Fichte wishes to have things both ways. That is, he wishes to say at the same time that the sphere of consciousness, with its distinction between the finite self and its object, is external to God and that God is the only being. Hence his position in regard to the issue between the ism and pantheism inevitably remains ambiguous. This is not to deny, of course, that the development of Fichte's philosophy of being conferred on his thought a much greater resemblance to the ism than would be suggested by his earlier writings. But it seems to me that if a writer who admires Fichte for his use of the transcendental method of reflection or for his ethical idealism proceeds to interpret his later philosophy as a clear statement of the ism, he is going beyond the historical evidence. If, finally, it is asked whether in his philosophy of being Fichte abandons idealism, the answer should be clear from what has been already said. Fichte does not repudiate the Wissenschaftslehre, and in this sense he retains idealism. When he says that it is the one life, and not the individual subject, which intuits, and so produces, the material world, he is obviously accounting for the fact that the material world appears to the finite subject as something given, as an already constituted object. But he had proclaimed from the beginning that this is the crucial fact which idealism has to explain, and not to deny. At the same time the assertion of the primacy of being and of the derivative character of consciousness and knowledge is a move away from idealism. Hence we can say that in so far as this assertion proceeded from the exigencies of his own thought, idealism with Fitch tended to overcome itself. But this is not to say that the philosopher ever made a clear and explicit break with idealism. In any case we may well feel that though in recent times there has been a tendency to emphasize Fitch's later thought, his impressive vision of reality is his system of ethical idealism rather than his obscure utterances about absolute being and the divine dossian. I. Friedrich Wilhelm Joseph von Schelling, son of Alered Lutheran pastor, was born in 1775 at Leonberg in Weir Temerg. A precocious boy, he was admitted at the age of 15 to the Protestant Theological Foundation at the University of Tübingen where he became a friend of Hegel and Hold Erlen both of whom were five years older than himself. At the age of 17 he wrote a dissertation on the third chapter of Genesis, and in 1793 he published an essay on myths, Ubermythen. This was followed in 1794 by a paper on the possibility of a form of philosophy in general, 
Uber die Moglichkeit einer Form der Philosophie überhaupt. At this time Schelling was more or less a disciple of Fichte, a fact which is apparent in the title of a work published in 1795, on the ego as principle of philosophy, Vomich als Prinzip der Philosophie. In the same year there appeared his philosophical letters on dogmatism and criticism, Philosophisk brief über Dogmatismus und Kritismus, dogmatism being represented by Spinoza and criticism by Fichte. But though Fichte's dug height formed a point of departure for his reflections, Schelling very soon showed the independence of his mind. In particular, he was dissatisfied with Fichte's view of nature as being simply an instrument for moral action. And his own view of nature as an immediate manifestation of the absolute, as a self-organizing dynamic and teleological system which moves upwards, as it were, to the emergence of consciousness and to nature's knowledge of herself in and through man, found expression in a series of works on the philosophy of nature. Thus in 1797 he published Ideas Towards a Philosophy of Nature, Ideen zu einer Philosophie der Natur, in 1798 on the world soul, von der Welt Seele, and in 1799 a first sketch of a system of the philosophy of nature, Erste Erdwurf ein System der Natur Philosophie, and an introduction to the sketch of a system of the philosophy of nature, or on the concept of speculative physics, Einleitung zu dem Entwurf. Ein System der Nature Philosophie oder über den Begriff der Spekulativen Physik. It will be noted that the title of the last work refers to speculative physics. And a similar term occurs in the full title of the work on the world soul, the world soul being said to be an hypothesis of the higher physics. One can hardly imagine Fitch giving much attention to speculative physics. Yet the series of publications on the philosophy of nature does not indicate a complete break with Fitch's thought. For in 1800 Schelling published his System of Transcendental Idealism, System de Transcendentalen Idealismus, in which the influence of Fichte's Wissenschaftslehre is obvious. Whereas in his writings on the philosophy of nature Schelling moved from the objective to the subjective, from the lowest grades of nature up to the organic sphere as a preparation for consciousness, in the system of transcendental idealism he began with the ego and proceeded to trace the process of its self-objectification. He regarded the two points of view as complementary, as is shown by the fact that in 1800 he also published a general deduction of the dynamic process, Allgemeine Deduction de Dynamischen Processes, which was followed in 1801 by a short piece on the true concept of the philosophy of nature, Über den Waren Begriff der Nader Philosophy. In the same year he also published an exposition of my system of philosophy, Darstellian Means Systems der Philosophie. In 1798 Schelling was appointed to a chair in the University of Jena. He was only 23, but his writings had won him the commendation not only of Goethe but also of Fichte. From 1802 to 1803 he collaborated with Hegel in editing the Critical Journal of Philosophy. And during the period of his professorship at Jena he was in friendly relations with the circle of the Romantics, such as the two Schlegels and Novelis. In 1802 Schelling published, Bruno, or On the Divine and Natural Principle of Things, Bruno, Oder über das Gottlich like und die Naturlich Prinzip der Dinge, and also a series of lectures on the method of academic study, for Lessen gen über die Method de Akademischen Studiums, in which he discussed the unity of the sciences and the place of philosophy in academic life. It has been mentioned that in his system of transcendental idealism Schelling started with the ego and utilized ideas taken from Fichte's Wissenschaftslehre in his reconstruction of the ego's self-objectification, for example in morals. But this work culminated in a philosophy of art, to which Schelling attached great importance. And in the winter of 1802-3 he lectured at Jena on the philosophy of art. At this time he looked on art as the key to the nature of reality. And this fact alone is sufficient to show the marked difference between Schelling's outlook and that of Fichte. In 1803 Schelling married Caroline Schlegel after the legal dissolution of her marriage with A. W. Schlegel, and the pair went to Weirdburg, where Schelling lectured for a period in the university. About this time he began to devote his attention to problems of religion and to the theosophical utterances of the mystical shoemaker of Gorlitz, Jacob Boma. One and in 1804 he published Philosophy and Religion, 
Philosophy und Religion. Schelling left Wiertberg for Munich in 1806. His reflections on freedom and on the relation between human freedom and the absolute found expression in philosophical inquiries into the nature of human freedom, Philosophisch Untersuchung gen über das Wesen der Menschlichen Freiheit, a work which was published in 1809. But by this time his star had begun to grow dim. We have seen that he collaborated with Hegel for a short period in editing a philosophical journal. But in 1807 Hegel, who had previously been little known, published his first great work, The Phenomenology of Spirit. And this work not only formed the first stage in its author's rise to fame as Germany's leading philosopher but also represented his intellectual break with Schelling. In particular, Hegel gave a somewhat caustic expression to his opinion of Schelling's doctrine of the absolute. And Schelling, who was the very opposite of thick-skinned, took this betrayal, as he saw it, very much to heart. In the years that followed, as he witnessed the growing reputation of his rival, he became obsessed by the thought that his former friend had foisted on a gullible public an inferior system of philosophy. Indeed, his bitter disappointment at Hegel's rise to a preeminent position in the philosophical world of Germany probably helps to explain why, after a remarkable burst of literary activity, he published comparatively little. Schelling continued, however, to lecture. Thus a course of lectures which he gave at Stuttgart in 1810 is printed in his collected works. In 1811 he wrote The Ages of the World, Die Zeit Alter, but the work remained unfinished and was not published during his lifetime. During the period 1821-6 Schelling lectured at Erlangen. In 1827 he returned to Munich to occupy the chair of philosophy and zestfully set about the congenial task of undermining the influence of Hegel. He had become convinced that a distinction must be made between negative philosophy, which is a purely abstract conceptual construction, and positive philosophy, which treats of concrete existence. The Hegelian system, needless to say, was declared to be an example of the first type. The death of Schelling's great rival won in 1831 should have facilitated his task. And ten years later, in 1841, he was appointed professor of philosophy at Berlin with the mission of combating the influence of Hegelianism by expounding his own religious system. In the Prussian capital Schelling began lecturing as a prophet, as one announcing the advent of a new era. And he had among his audience professors, statesmen, and a number of hearers whose names were to become famous, such as Soren Kierkegaard, Jacob Burkhard, Friedrich Engels, and Bakunin. But the lectures were not as successful as Schelling hoped that they would be, and the audience started to diminish. In 1846 he abandoned lecturing, except for occasional discourses at the Berlin Academy. Later he retired to Munich and busied himself with preparing manuscripts for publication. He died in 1854 at Ragaz in Switzerland. His philosophy of revelation, Philosophie der Offenbarung, and philosophy of mythology, Philosophie der Mythologie, were published posthumously. 2. There is no one closely knit system which we can call Schelling's system of philosophy. For his thought passed through a succession of phases from the early period when he stood very much under the influence of Fichte up to the final period which is represented by the posthumously published lectures on the philosophy of revelation and mythology. There has been no general agreement among historians about the precise number of phases which should be distinguished. One or two have contented themselves with Schelling's own distinction between negative and positive philosophy, but this distinction fails to take account of the variety of phases in his thought before he set about expounding his final philosophy of religion. Hence it has been customary to make further divisions. But though there certainly are distinct phases in Schelling's thought, it would be a mistake to regard these phases as so many independent systems. For there is a visible continuity. That is to say, reflection on a position already adopted led Schelling to raise further problems, the solution of which required fresh moves on his part. True, in his later years he emphasized the distinction between negative and positive philosophy. But though he regarded a good deal of his own previous thought as negative philosophy, he stressed the distinction in the course of his polemic against Hegel, 
and what he desired was not so much a complete rejection of so-called negative philosophy as its incorporation into and subordination to positive philosophy. Further, he claimed that some inkling at least of positive philosophy could be found in his early philosophical letters on dogmatism and criticism, and that even in his first philosophical essays his inclination towards the concrete and historical had manifested itself. In 1796, when Schelling was 21, he drew up for himself a program for a system of philosophy. The projected system would proceed from the idea of the ego or self as an absolutely free being by way of the positing of the non-ego to the sphere of speculative physics. It would then proceed to the sphere of the human spirit. The principles of historical development would have to be laid down, and the ideas of a moral world, of God, and of the freedom of all spiritual beings would have to be developed. Further, the central importance of the idea of beauty would have to be shown, and the aesthetic character of the highest act of reason. Finally, there would have to be a new mythology, uniting philosophy and religion. This program is illuminating. On the one hand it illustrates the element of discontinuity in Schelling's thought. For the fact that he proposes to start from the ego reveals the influence of Fichte, an influence which grew progressively less as time went on. On the other hand the program illustrates the element of continuity in Schelling's philosophizing. For it envisages the development of a philosophy of nature, a philosophy of history, a philosophy of art, a philosophy of freedom and a philosophy of religion and mythology, themes which were to occupy his attention in turn. In other words, though Schelling at first gave the impression of being a disciple of Fichte, his interests and bent of mind were already apparent at the beginning of his career. The upshot of Silvis is that time spent on discussing exactly how many phases or systems there are in Schelling's philosophizing is time wasted. There certainly are distinct phases, but a genetic account of his thought can do justice to these distinctions. Without its being implied that Schelling jumped from one self-enclosed system to another. In fine, the philosophy of Schelling is a philosophizing rather than a finished system or succession of finished systems. In a sense the beginning and the end of his pilgrimage coincide. We have seen that in 1793 he published an essay on myths. In his old age he returned to this subject and lectured on it at length. But in between we find a restless process of reflection moving from the ego philosophy of Fichte through the philosophy of nature and of art to the philosophy of the religious consciousness and a form of speculative theism, the whole being linked together by the theme of the relation between the finite and the infinite. 3. In his essay on the possibility of a form of philosophy in general, 1794, Schelling follows Fichte in asserting that philosophy, being a science, must be a logically unified system of propositions, developed from one fundamental proposition which gives expression to the unconditioned. This unconditioned is the self-positing ego. Hence the fundamental proposition can only be this, I is I. One in the work on the ego as principle of philosophy, 1795, this proposition is formulated in the less peculiar form, I ami or I am. 8 And from this proposition Schelling proceeds to the positing of the non-ego and argues that ego and non-ego mutually condition one another. There is no subject without an object and no object without a subject. Hence there must be a mediating factor, a common product which links them together, and this is representation, Vorstellian. We thus have the form of the fundamental triad of all science or knowledge, namely subject, object and representation. The influence of Fichte is obvious enough. But it is worth noting that from the very start Schelling emphasizes the difference between the absolute and the empirical ego. The completed system of science starts with the absolute ego 3 this is not a thing but infinite freedom. It is indeed one, but the unity which is predicated of it transcends the unity which is predicated of the individual member of a class. The absolute ego is not and cannot be a member of any class, it transcends the concept of class. Further, it transcends the grasp of conceptual thought and can be apprehended only in intellectual intuition. None of this contradicts Fichte, but the point is that Schelling's metaphysical interests are revealed from the beginning of his career. Whereas Fichte, starting from the philosophy of Kant, 
gave so little prominence at first to the metaphysical implications of his idealism that he was widely thought to be taking the individual ego as his point of departure, Schelling emphasizes at once the idea of the absolute, even if, under Fichte's influence, he describes it as the absolute ego. It will be noted that in the essay on the possibility of a form of philosophy in general Schelling follows Fichte in deducing the presentation or representation. But his real interest is ontological. In the early Wissenschaftslehre Fichte declared that the task of philosophy is to explain experience in the sense of the system of presentations which are accompanied by a feeling of necessity. And he did so by showing how the ego gives rise to these presentations through the activity of the productive imagination which works unconsciously, so that for empirical consciousness the world inevitably possesses an appearance of independence. But in his philosophical letters on dogmatism and criticism, 1795, Schelling roundly declares that the chief business of all philosophy consists in solving the problem of the existence of the world. One in one sense, of course, the two statements come to the same thing. But there is a considerable difference in emphasis between saying that the business of philosophy is to explain the system of presentations which are accompanied by a feeling of necessity and saying that the business of philosophy is to explain the existence of the world. And with the help of a little hindsight at any rate we can discern beneath all the Fichtean trappings of Schelling's early thought the same metaphysical bent of mind which led him to say at a later stage that the task of philosophy is to answer the question, why there is something rather than nothing. True, Fichte himself came to develop the metaphysical implications of his philosophy. But when he did so, Schelling accused him of plagiarism. Schelling's Philosophical Letters is an illuminating work. It is in a sense a defense of Fichte. For Schelling contrasts criticism, represented by Fichte, with dogmatism, represented chiefly by Spinoza. And he comes down on the side of Fichte. At the same time the work reveals the author's profound sympathy with Spinoza and an at any rate latent dissatisfaction with Fichte. Dogmatism, says Schelling, involves in the long run the absolutization of the non-ego. Man is reduced to a mere modification of the infinite object, Spinoza's substance, and freedom is excluded. It is true that Spinozism, which aims at the attainment of peace and tranquility of soul through quiet self-surrender to the absolute object, one possesses an aesthetic appeal and can exercise a powerful attraction on some minds. But ultimately it means the annihilation of the human being as a free moral agent. Dogmatism has no room for freedom but it does not follow that dogmatism can be theoretically refuted. The philosophy of Kant has only weak weapons against dogmatism, too and can achieve nothing more than a negative refutation. For example, Kant shows that it is impossible to disprove freedom in the noumenal sphere, but he admits himself that he can give no positive theoretical proof of freedom. Yet even the completed system of criticism cannot refute dogmatism theoretically, Three, even if it can deliver some shrewd blows. And this is not at all surprising. For as long as we remain on the theoretical plane dogmatism and criticism lead, Schelling maintains, to much the same conclusion. In the first place both systems try to make the transition from the infinite to the finite. But philosophy cannot proceed from the infinite to the finite. For we can, of course, invent reasons why the infinite must manifest itself in the finite, but they are simply ways of covering up an inability to bridge the gulf. It appears, therefore, that we must proceed the other way round. But how is this to be done when the traditional a posteriori demonstrations have been discredited? Obviously what is required is the suppression of the problem. That is to say, if the finite can be seen in the infinite and the infinite in the finite, the problem of bridging the gulf between them by means of a theoretical argument or demonstration no longer arises. This need is fulfilled by intellectual intuition, which is an intuition of the identity of the intuiting with the intuited self. But it is interpreted in different ways by dogmatism and criticism. Dogmatism interprets it as an intuition of the self as identical with the absolute conceived as absolute object. Criticism interprets it as revealing the identity of the self with the absolute as absolute subject, conceived as pure free activity. Though, however, 
dogmatism and criticism interpret intellectual intuition in different ways, the two interpretations lead to much the same theoretical conclusion. In dogmatism the subject is ultimately reduced to the object, and with this reduction one of the necessary conditions of consciousness is cancelled out. In criticism the object is ultimately reduced to the subject, and with this reduction the other necessary condition of consciousness is cancelled out. In other words, both dogmatism and criticism point to the theoretical annihilation of the finite self or subject. Spinoza reduces the finite self to the absolute object, Fichte reduces it to the absolute subject or, more precisely, since the absolute ego is not properly a subject, to infinite activity or striving. In both cases the self is swamped, so to speak, in the absolute. But though from the purely theoretical point of view the two systems lead by different routes to much the same conclusion, their practiced or moral demands are different. They express different ideas of man's moral vocation. Dogmatism demands of the finite self that it should surrender itself to the absolute causality of the divine substance and renounce its own freedom that the divine may be all in all. Thus in the philosophy of Spinoza the self is called on to recognize an already existing ontological situation, namely its position as a modification of infinite substance, and to surrender itself. Criticism, however, demands that man shall realize the absolute in himself through constant free activity. For Fichte, that is to say, the identity of the finite self with the absolute is not simply an existing ontological situation which has only to be recognized. It is a goal to be achieved through moral effort. Moreover, it is an always receding goal. Hence even if the philosophy of Fichte points to the identification of the self with the absolute as a theoretical ideal, on the practical plane it demands unceasing free moral activity, unceasing fidelity to one's personal moral vocation. In a sense, therefore, the choice between dogmatism and criticism is for the finite self a choice between non-being and being. That is to say, it is a choice between the ideal of self-surrender, of absorption in the impersonal absolute, of renunciation of personal freedom as illusion, and the ideal of constant free activity in accordance with one's vocation, of becoming more and more the moral agent who rises free and triumphant over the mere object. b. Is the highest demand of criticism one with Spinoza the absolute object carries all before it, with which nature is reduced to a mere instrument for the free moral agent. Obviously, if a man accepts the demand of criticism, he is thereby committed to rejecting dogmatism. But it is also true that dogmatism cannot be refuted, even on the moral or practical plane, in the eyes of the man who can tolerate the idea of working at his own annihilation, of annulling in himself all free causality, and of being the modification of an object in the infinity of which he sooner or later finds his moral destruction. One this account of the issue between dogmatism and criticism obviously echoes Fichte's view that the sort of philosophy which a man chooses depends on the sort of man that one is. Further, we can, if we wish, link up Schelling's contention that neither dogmatism nor criticism is theoretically refutable and that the choice between them must be made on the practical plane with the view which has sometimes been advanced in much more recent times that we cannot decide between metaphysical systems on the purely theoretical plane but that moral criteria can be used to judge between them when they serve as backgrounds for and tend to promote different patterns of conduct. But for our present purpose it is more relevant to note that though the Philosophical Letters was written in support of Fichte and though Schelling comes down ostensibly on his side, the work implies the unspoken, but nonetheless clear, criticism that both the philosophy of Spinoza and the transcendental idealism of Fichte are one-sided exaggerations. For Spinoza is depicted as absolutizing the object and Fichte as absolutizing the subject. And the implication is that the absolute must transcend the distinction between subjectivity and objectivity and be subject and object in identity. 8. In other words, the implication is that some sort of synthesis must be effected which will reconcile the conflicting attitudes of Spinoza and Fichte. Indeed, we can see in the philosophical letters evidence of a degree of sympathy with Spinoza which was alien to Fichte's mind. And it is in no way surprising if we find Schelling very soon devoting himself to the publication of works on the philosophy of nature. 
for the spinozistic element in the foreshadowed synthesis will be the attribution to nature as an organic totality of an ontological status which was denied it by Fichte. Nature will be shown as the immediate objective manifestation of the absolute. At the same time the synthesis, if it is to be a synthesis at all, must depict nature as the expression and manifestation of spirit. A synthesis must be idealism, if it is not to represent a return to pre-Kentian thought. But it must not be a subjective idealism in which nature is depicted as no more than an obstacle posited by the ego in order that it may have something to overcome. These remarks may perhaps seem to go beyond what the early writings of Schelling in Title I to say. But we have already seen that in the program which Schelling drew up for himself in 1796, very shortly after the writing of philosophical letters, he explicitly envisaged the development of a speculative physics or philosophy of nature. And it is quite evident that dissatisfaction with Fichte's one-sided attitude to nature was already felt by Schelling within the period of his so-called Fichtean phase. The possibility and metaphysical grounds of a philosophy of nature The general outlines of Schelling's philosophy of nature The system of transcendental idealism The philosophy of art The absolute as identity IIT is the growth of reflection, Schelling maintains, that has introduced a rift between the subjective and the objective, the ideal, and the real. If we think away the work of reflection, we must conceive man as one with nature. That is to say, we must conceive him as experiencing this unity with nature on the level of the immediacy of feeling. But through reflection he has distinguished between the external object and its subjective representation, and he has become an object for himself. In general, reflection has grounded and perpetuated the distinction between the objective external world of nature and the subjective inner life of representation and self-consciousness, the distinction between nature and spirit. Nature thus becomes externality, the opposite of spirit, and man, as a self-conscious reflective being, is alienated from nature. If reflection is made an end in itself, it becomes a spiritual malady. One for man is born for action, and the more he is turned in on himself in self-reflection, the less active he is. At the same time it is the capacity for reflection which distinguishes man from the animal and the rift which has been introduced between the objective and the subjective, the real, and the ideal, nature and spirit, cannot be overcome by a return to the immediacy of feeling, to the childhood, as it were, of the human race. If the divided factors are to be reunited and the original unity restored, this must be achieved on a higher plane than feeling. That is to say, it must be achieved by reflection itself in the form of philosophy. After all, it is reflection which raises the problem. At the level of ordinary common sense there is no problem of the relation between the real and the ideal order, between the thing and its mental representation. It is reflection which raises the problem, and it is reflection which must solve it. One's first impulse is to solve the problem in terms of causal activity. Things exist independently of the mind and cause representations of themselves, the subjective is causally dependent on the objective. But by saying this one simply gives rise to a further problem. For if I assert that external things exist independently and cause representations of themselves in me, I necessarily set myself above thing and representation. And I thus implicitly affirm myself as spirit. And the question at once arises, how can external things exercise a determining causal activity on spirit? we can indeed attempt to tackle the problem from the other side. Instead of saying that things cause representations of themselves we can say with Kant that the subject imposes its cognitive forms on some given matter of experience and so creates phenomenal reality. But we are then left with the thing in itself. And this is inconceivable. For what can a thing possibly be apart from the forms which the subject is said to impose? There have been, however, two notable attempts to solve the problem of the correspondence between the subjective and the objective, the ideal, and the real, without having recourse to the idea of causal activity. Spinoza explained the correspondence by means of the theory of parallel modifications of different attributes of one infinite substance, while Leibniz had recourse to the theory of a pre-established harmony. But neither theory was a genuine explanation. 
For Spinoza left the modifications of substance unexplained, while Leibniz, in Schelling's opinion, simply postulated a pre-established harmony. At the same time both Spinoza and Leibniz had an inkling of the truth that the ideal and the real are ultimately one. And it is this truth which the philosopher is called upon to exhibit. He must show that nature is visible spirit and spirit invisible nature. One that is to say, the philosopher must show how objective nature is ideal through and through in the sense that it is a unified dynamic and teleological system which develops upwards, so to speak, to the point at which it returns upon itself in and through the human spirit. For, given this picture of nature, we can see that the life of representation is not something which is simply set over against and alien to the objective world, so that there arises the problem of correspondence between the subjective and the objective, the ideal, and the real. The life of representation is nature's knowledge of itself, it is the actualization of nature's potentiality, whereby slumbering spirit awakens to consciousness. But can we show that nature is in fact a teleological system, exhibiting finality? We cannot indeed accept as adequate the purely mechanistic interpretation of the world. For when we consider the organism, we are driven to introduce the idea of finality. Nor can the mind remain content with the dichotomy between two sharply divided spheres, namely those of mechanism and teleology. It is driven on to regard nature as a self-organizing totality in which we can distinguish various levels. But the question arises whether we are not then simply reading teleology into nature, first into the organism and then into nature as a whole. After all, Kant admitted that we cannot help thinking of nature as if it were a teleological system. For we have a regulative idea of purpose in nature, an idea which gives rise to certain heuristic maxims of judgment. But Kant would not allow that this subjective idea proves anything about nature in itself. Schelling is convinced that all scientific inquiry presupposes the intelligibility of nature. Every experiment, he insists, involves putting a question to nature which nature is forced to answer. And this procedure presupposes the belief that nature conforms to the demands of reason, that it is intelligible and in this sense ideal. This belief is justified if we once assume the general view of the world which has been outlined above. For the idea of nature as an intelligible teleological system then appears as nature's self-reflection, as nature knowing itself in and through man. But we can obviously ask for a justification of this general view of nature. And the ultimate justification is for shelling a metaphysical theory about the absolute. The first step towards philosophy and the indispensable condition for even arriving at it is to understand that the absolute in the ideal order is also the absolute in the real order 1. The absolute is the pure identity 2 of subjectivity and objectivity. And this identity is reflected in the mutual interpenetration of nature and nature's knowledge of itself in and through man. In itself the absolute is one eternal act of knowledge in which there is no temporal succession. At the same time we can distinguish three moments or phases in this one act, provided that we do not look on them as succeeding one another temporally. In the first moment the absolute objectifies itself in ideal nature, in the universal pattern, as it were, of nature, for which Schelling uses Spinoza's term natura naturans. In the second moment the absolute as objectivity is transformed into the absolute as subjectivity. And the third moment is the synthesis in which these two absolute nesses, absolute objectivity and absolute subjectivity, are again one absoluteness. One the absolute is thus an eternal act of self-knowledge. The first moment in the inner life of the absolute is expressed or manifested in natura naturata, nature as a system of particular things. This is the symbol or appearance of natura naturans, and as such it is said to be outside the absolute. To the second moment in the inner life of the Absolute, the transformation of objectivity into subjectivity, is expressed externally in the world of representation, the ideal world of human knowledge whereby natura naturata is represented in and through the human mind and the particular is taken up, as it were, into the universal, that is, on the conceptual level. We have, therefore, two unities, as Schelling calls them, objective nature and the ideal world of representation. The third unity, 
correlated with the third moment in the inner life of the Absolute, is the apprehended interpenetration of the real and the ideal. It can hardly be claimed, I think, that Schelling makes the relation between the infinite and the finite, between the Absolute in itself and its self-manifestation, crystal clear. We have seen indeed that Natura Naturata, considered as the symbol or appearance of Natura Naturans, is said to be outside the Absolute. But Schelling also speaks of the Absolute as expanding itself into the particular. Clearly, Schelling wishes to make a distinction between the unchanging Absolute in itself and the world of finite particular things. But at the same time he wishes to maintain that the Absolute is the all-comprehensive reality. But we shall have to return later to this topic. For the moment we can content ourselves with the general picture of the Absolute as eternal essence or idea objectifying itself in nature, returning to itself as subjectivity in the world of representation and then knowing itself, in and through philosophical reflection, as the identity of the real and the ideal, of nature and spirit. 3. Schelling's justification of the possibility of a philosophy of nature or of the so-called higher physics is thus admittedly metaphysical in character. Nature, that is, natura naturata, must be ideal through and through. For it is the symbol or appearance of natura naturans, ideal nature, it is the external objectification of the absolute. And as the absolute is always one, the identity of objectivity and subjectivity, natura naturata, must also be subjectivity. This truth is manifested in the process by which nature passes, as it were, into the world of representation. And the culmination of this process is the insight by which it is seen that human knowledge of nature is nature's knowledge of itself. There is really no rift between the objective and the subjective. From the transcendental point of view they are one. Slumbering spirit becomes awakened spirit. The distinguishable moments in the supertemporal life of the Absolute as pure essence are manifested in the temporal order, which stands to the Absolute in itself as consequent to antecedent. 2. To develop a philosophy of nature is to develop a systematic ideal construction of nature. In the Timaeus Plato sketched a theoretical construction of bodies out of fundamental qualities. And Schelling is concerned with the same sort of thing. A purely experimental physics would not deserve the name of science. It would be nothing but a collection of facts, of reports on what has been observed, of what has happened either under natural or under artificially produced conditions. One Schelling admits indeed that physics as we know it is not purely experimental or empirical in this sense. In what is now called physics empiricism empiry and science are mixed up too but there is room, in Schelling's opinion, for a purely theoretical construction or deduction of matter and of the fundamental types of bodies, the inorganic and the organic. Moreover, this speculative physics will not simply assume natural forces, such as gravitation, as something given. It will construct them from first principles. According to Schelling's intentions at least this construction does not involve producing a fanciful and arbitrary deduction of the fundamental levels of nature, rather does it mean letting nature construct itself before the watchful attention of the mind. Speculative or higher physics cannot indeed explain the basic productive activity which gives rise to nature. This is a matter for metaphysics rather than for the philosophy of nature proper. But, if the development of the natural system is the necessary progressive self-expression of ideal nature, natura naturans, it must be possible to retrace systematically the stages of the process by which ideal nature expresses itself in natura naturata. And to do this is the task of speculative physics. Schelling is obviously well aware that it is through experience that we become acquainted with the existence of natural forces and of inorganic and organic things. And it is not the philosopher's task to tell us the empirical facts for the first time, so to speak, or to work out a priori a natural history which can be developed only on the basis of empirical investigation. He is concerned with exhibiting the fundamental and necessary teleological pattern in nature, in nature, that is to say, as known in the first instance by experience and empirical inquiry. One might say that he is concerned with explaining to us the why and wherefore of the facts. To exhibit nature as a teleological system, as the necessary self-unfolding of the eternal idea, 
involves showing that the explanation of the lower is always to be found in the higher. For instance, even if from the temporal point of view the inorganic is prior to the organic, from the philosophical point of view the latter is logically prior to the former. That is to say, the lower level exists as a foundation for the higher level. And this is true throughout nature. The materialist tends to reduce the higher to the lower. For example, he tries to explain organic life in terms of mechanical causality, without introducing the concept of finality. But he has the wrong point of view. It is not, as he is inclined to imagine, a question of denying the laws of mechanics or of regarding them as suspended in the organic sphere, if one introduces the concept of finality. Rather is it a question of seeing the sphere of mechanics as the necessary setting for the realization of the ends of nature in the production of the organism. There is continuity. For the lower is the necessary foundation for the higher, and the latter subsumes the former in itself. But there is also the emergence of something new, and this new level explains the level which it presupposes. When we understand this, we see that the opposition between mechanism and the organic sphere disappears. One for we see the production of the organism as that at which nature unconsciously aims through the development of the inorganic sphere, with the laws of mechanics. And it is thus truer to say that the inorganic is the organic minus than that the organic is the inorganic plus. Yet, even this way of speaking can be misleading. For the opposition between mechanism and the organic sphere is overcome not so much by the theory that the former exists for the latter as by the theory that nature as a whole is an organic unity. Now, the activity which lies at the basis of nature and which expands itself in the phenomenal world is infinite or unlimited. For nature is, as we have seen, the self-objectification of the infinite absolute which, as an eternal act, is activity or willing. But if there is to be any objective system of nature at all, this unlimited activity must be checked. That is to say, there must be a checking or limiting force. And it is the interaction between the unlimited activity and the checking force which gives rise to the lowest level of nature, the general structure of the world and the series of bodies, one which Schelling calls the first potency, potence, of nature. Thus if we think of the force of attraction as corresponding to the checking force and the force of repulsion as corresponding to the unlimited activity, the synthesis of the two is matter in so far as this is simply mass. But the drive of the unlimited activity reasserts itself, only to be checked at another point. And the second unity or potency in the construction of nature is universal mechanism, under which heading Schelling deduces light and the dynamic process or the dynamic laws of bodies. The dynamic process is nothing else but the second construction of matter too that is to say, the original construction of matter is repeated, as it were, at a higher level. On the lower level we have the elementary operation of the forces of attraction and repulsion and their synthesis in matter as mass. At the higher level we find the same forces showing themselves in the phenomena of magnetism, electricity and chemical process or the chemical properties of bodies. The third unity or potency of nature is the organism. And on this level we find the same forces further actualizing their potentialities in the phenomena of sensibility, irritability, and reproduction. This unity or level of nature is represented as the synthesis of the two others. Hence it cannot be said that at any level nature is simply lifeless. It is a living organic unity which actualizes its potentialities at ascending levels until it expresses itself in the organism. We must add, however, that there are obviously distinguishable levels within the organic sphere itself. On the lower levels, reproductivity is particularly conspicuous whereas sensibility is comparatively undeveloped. The individual organisms are lost, as it were, in the species. On the higher levels the life of the senses is more developed, and the individual organism is, so to speak, more of an individual and less a mere particular member of an indefinite class. The culminating point is reached in the human organism, which most clearly manifests the ideality of nature and forms the point of transition to the world of representation or subjectivity, nature's reflection on itself. Throughout his construction of nature Schelling employs the idea of the polarity of forces. 
but these two conflicting forces lead to the idea of an organizing principle which makes the world a system. One and to this principle we can conveniently give the time-hallowed name of world soul. It cannot indeed be discovered by empirical investigation. Nor can it be described in terms of the qualities of phenomena. It is a postulate, an hypothesis of the higher physics for explaining the universal organism. To this so-called world soul is not in itself a conscious intelligence. It is the organizing principle which manifests itself in nature and which attains consciousness in and through the human ego. And unless we postulated it, we could not look on nature as a unified, self-developing superorganism. It may have occurred to the reader to wonder how Schelling's theory of nature stands to the theory of evolution in the sense of the transformation of forms or the emergence of higher from lower forms. And it is clearly arguable not only that a theory of emergent evolution would fit in very well with Schelling's interpretation but that it is demanded by his view of the world as a self-developing organic unity. Indeed, he explicitly refers to the possibility of evolution. He observes, for instance, that even if man's experience does not reveal any case of the transformation of one species into another, lack of empirical evidence does not prove that such a transformation is impossible. For it may well be that such changes can take place only in a much longer period of time than that covered by man's experience. At the same time Schelling goes on to remark, however, let us pass over these possibilities. 3. In other words, while he allows for the possibility of emergent evolution, he is primarily concerned not with a genetic history of nature but with an ideal or theoretical construction. This construction is indeed rich in ideas. It echoes much past speculation about the world. For instance, the pervasive idea of the polarity of forces recalls Greek speculation about nature, while the theory of nature as slumbering spirit recalls certain aspects of Leibniz's philosophy. Schelling's interpretation of nature also looks forward to later speculation. For example, there is some family resemblance between Schelling's philosophy of nature and Bergson's picture of inorganic things as representing, as it were, the extinguished sparks thrown off by the Allah vital in its upward flight. At the same time Schelling's construction of nature inevitably appears so fanciful and arbitrary to the scientific mentality that there does not seem to be any justification for devoting space here to further detailed treatment of it. 1. It is not that the philosopher fails to incorporate into his philosophy of nature theories and hypotheses taken from science as he knows it. On the contrary, he borrows and utilizes ideas taken from contemporary physics, electrodynamics, chemistry, and biology. But these ideas are fitted into a dialectical scheme, and they are often held together by the application of analogies which, however ingenious and perhaps sometimes suggestive, tend to appear fanciful and far-fetched. Hence discussion of the details is more a matter for a specialized treatment of Schelling and of his relations to scientists such as Newton and to contemporary writers such as Goethe than for a general history of philosophy. To say this is not, however, to deny the importance of Schelling's philosophy of nature in its general outlines. For it shows clearly that German idealism does not involve subjectivism in the ordinary sense. Nature is the immediate and objective manifestation of the absolute. It is indeed ideal through and through. But this does not mean that nature is in any sense the creation of the human ego. It is ideal because it expresses the eternal idea and because it is orientated towards self-reflection in and through the human mind. Schelling's view of the absolute as the identity of objectivity and subjectivity demands, of course, that the absolute self-objectification, namely nature, should reveal this identity. But the identity is revealed through the teleological pattern of nature, not through its reduction to human ideas. Nature's representation in and through the human mind presupposes the objectivity of the world, though at the same time it presupposes the intelligibility of the world and its intrinsic orientation to self-reflection. Further, if we prescind from Schelling's rather fanciful speculations about magnetism, electricity, and so on, that is, from the details of his theoretical construction of nature, the general view of nature as an objective manifestation of the absolute and as a teleological system possesses an abiding value. 
it is obviously a metaphysical interpretation, and as such it can hardly commend itself to those who reject all metaphysics. But the general picture of nature is not unreasonable. And if we once accept with Schelling, and afterwards with Hegel, the idea of a spiritual absolute, we should expect to find in nature a teleological pattern, though it does not necessarily follow that we can deduce the forces and phenomena of nature in the way that Schelling thought that speculative physics is capable of doing. 3. In view of the fact that Schelling's philosophy of nature represents his divergence from Fichte and his own original contribution to the development of German idealism it is at first sight surprising to find him publishing in 1800 a system of transcendental idealism in which he starts from the ego and proceeds to elaborate the continuous history of self-consciousness. One for it looks as though he is adding to the philosophy of nature an incompatible system inspired by the influence of Fichte. In Schelling's opinion, However, transcendental idealism forms a necessary complement to the philosophy of nature. In knowledge itself subject and object are united, they are one. But if we wish to explain this identity, we have first to think it away. And then we are faced with two possibilities. Either we can start with the objective and proceed towards the subjective, asking how unconscious nature comes to be represented. Or we can start with the subjective and proceed towards the objective, asking how an object comes to exist for the subject. In the first case we develop the philosophy of nature, showing how nature develops the conditions for its own self-reflection on the subjective level. In the second case we develop the system of transcendental idealism, showing how the ultimate immanent principle of consciousness produces the objective world as the condition of its attainment of self-consciousness and the two lines of reflection are and must be complementary. For if the absolute is the identity of subjectivity and objectivity, it must be possible to start from either pole and to develop a philosophy in harmony with the philosophy developed by starting from the other pole. In other words, it is Schelling's conviction that the mutually complementary characters of the philosophy of nature and the system of transcendental idealism manifest the nature of the absolute as identity of subject and object, of the ideal and the real. As transcendental idealism is described as the science of knowledge, it prescinds from the question whether there is an ontological reality behind the whole sphere of knowledge. Hence its first principle must be imminent within this sphere. And if we are to proceed from the subjective to the objective by transcendental deduction, we must start with the original identity of subject and object. This identity within the sphere of knowledge is self-consciousness, wherein subject and object are the same. And self-consciousness is described by Schelling as the ego. But the term ego does not signify the individual self. It signifies the act of self-consciousness in general. 1. The self-consciousness which is our point of departure is one absolute act 2. And this absolute act is a production of itself as object. The ego is nothing else but a producing which becomes its own object 3. It is in fact an intellectual intuition. 4. For the ego exists through knowing itself, and this self-knowledge is the act of intellectual intuition, which is the organ of all transcendental thought 5. And freely produces as its object what is otherwise no object. Intellectual intuition and the production of the object of transcendental thought are one and the same. Hence a system of transcendental idealism must take the form of a production or construction of self-consciousness. Schelling makes a wider use than Fichte had made of the idea of intellectual intuition. But the general pattern of his transcendental idealism is obviously based on Fichte's thought. The ego is in itself an unlimited act or activity but to become its own object it must limit this activity by setting something over against itself, namely the non-ego. And it must do so unconsciously. For it is impossible to explain the givenness of the non-ego within the framework of idealism unless we assume that the production of the non-ego is an unconscious and necessary production. The non-ego is a necessary condition of self-consciousness. And in this sense the limitation of the infinite or unlimited activity which constitutes the ego must always remain. But in another sense the limitation must be transcended. That is to say, the ego must be able to abstract from the non-ego and recoil, as it were, onto itself. Self-consciousness, in other words, 
will take the form of human self-consciousness which presupposes nature, the non-ego. In the first part of the system of transcendental idealism, which corresponds to Fichte's theoretical deduction of consciousness in the Wissenschaftslehre, Schelling traces the history of consciousness in three main epochs or stages. Many of Fichte's themes reappear, but Schelling is naturally at pains to correlate his history of consciousness with the philosophy of nature. The first epoch ranges from primitive sensation up to productive intuition. And it is correlated with the construction of matter in the philosophy of nature. In other words, we see the production of the material world as the unconscious activity of spirit. The second epoch ranges from productive intuition up to reflection. The ego is here conscious on the level of sense. That is to say, the sensible object appears as distinct from the act of productive intuition. And Schelling deduces the categories of space, time, and causality. A universe begins to exist for the ego. Schelling also occupies himself with the deduction of the organism as a necessary condition for the ego's return on itself. This takes place in the third epoch which culminates in the act of absolute abstraction by which the ego reflectively differentiates itself from the object or non-ego as such and recognizes itself as intelligence. It has become object to itself. The act of absolute abstraction is explicable only as an act of the self-determining will. And we thus pass to the idea of the ego or intelligence as an active and free power, and so to the second or practical part of the system of transcendental idealism. After treating of the part played by the consciousness of other selves, other free wills, in the development of self-consciousness Schelling goes on to discuss the distinction between natural impulse and the will considered as an idealizing activity, in idealisierin tetikite, that is, as seeking to modify or change the objective in accordance with an ideal. The ideal belongs to the side of the subjective, it is in fact the ego itself. Hence in seeking to actualize the ideal in the objective world the ego also realizes itself. This idea sets the stage for a discussion of morality. How, asks Schelling, can the will, namely the ego as self-determining or self-realizing activity, become objectified for the ego as intelligence? That is to say, how can the ego become conscious of itself as will? Schelling, too. 117. The answer is, through a demand, the demand that the ego should will nothing else but self-determination. This demand is nothing else but the categorical imperative or the moral law which Kant expresses in this way, you ought to will only that which other intelligences can will. But that which all intelligences can will is only pure self-determination, pure conformity to law. Through the law of morality, therefore, pure self-determination becomes an object for the ego one but self-determination or self-realization can be achieved only through concrete action in the world and Schelling proceeds to deduce the system of rights and the state as conditions for moral action the state is of course an edifice built by human hands by the activity of the spirit but it is a necessary condition for the harmonious realization of freedom by a plurality of individuals and though it is an edifice built by human hands, it should become a second nature. In all our actions we count on the uniformity of nature, on the reign of natural laws. And in our moral activity we ought to be able to count on the rule of rational law in society. That is to say, we ought to be able to count on the rational state, the characteristic of which is the rule of law. Yet even the best ordered state is exposed to the capricious and egoistic wills of other states. And the question arises, how can political society be rescued, as far as this is possible, from this condition of instability and insecurity? The answer can be found only in an organization which transcends the individual state, namely a federation of all states, to which will do away with conflicts between nations. Only in this way can political society become a second nature, something on which we can count. For this end to be attained, However, two conditions are required. First, the fundamental principles of a truly rational constitution must be generally acknowledged, so that all individual states will have a common interest in guaranteeing and protecting one another's law and rights. Secondly, 
individual states must submit themselves to a common fundamental law in the same way that individual citizens submit themselves to the law of their own state. And this means in effect that the federation will have to be a state of states, eight in ideal at least a world organization with sovereign power. If this ideal could be realized, political society would become a secure setting for the full actualization of a universal moral order. Now, if this ideal is to be realized at all, it must obviously be realized within history. And the question arises whether we can discern in human history any necessary tendency towards the attainment of this goal. In Schelling's opinion there lies in the concept of history the concept of endless progress. One obviously, if this statement meant that the word history, as ordinarily used, necessarily includes as part of its meaning the concept of endless progress towards a predetermined goal, its truth would be open to question. But Schelling is looking on history in the light of his theory of the absolute. History as a whole is a continual revelation of the absolute, a revelation which gradually discloses itself too as the absolute is the pure identity of the ideal and the real, history must be a movement towards the creation of a second nature, a perfect moral world order in the framework of a rationally organized political society. And as the absolute is infinite, this movement of progress must be endless. If the absolute were perfectly revealed in its true nature, the point of view of human consciousness, which presupposes a distinction between subject and object, would no longer exist. Hence the revelation of the absolute in human history must be in principle endless. But are we not then faced with a dilemma? If on the one hand we assert that the human will is free, must we not admit that man can thwart the ends of history and that there is no necessary progress towards an ideal goal? If on the other hand we assert that history necessarily moves in a certain direction, must we not deny human freedom and explain away the psychological feeling of freedom? In dealing with this problem Schelling has recourse to the idea of an absolute synthesis, as he puts it, of free actions. Individuals act freely. And any given individual may act for some purely private and selfish end. But there is at the same time a hidden necessity which achieves a synthesis of the apparently unconnected and often conflicting actions of human beings. Even if a man acts from purely selfish motives, he will nonetheless unconsciously contribute, even though against his will, to the fulfillment of the common end of human history. 3. Up to this point we have been considering briefly the parts of the system of transcendental idealism which cover more or less the ground covered by Fichte in his theoretical and practical deductions of consciousness and in his works on the theory of rights and on ethics, though Schelling makes, of course, some changes and introduces and develops ideas of his own. But Schelling adds a third part which is his own peculiar contribution to transcendental idealism and which serves to underline the difference between his general outlook and that of Fichte. The philosophy of nature deals with slumbering or unconscious spirit. In the system of transcendental idealism as hitherto outlined we see conscious spirit objectifying itself in moral action and in the creation of a moral world order, a second nature. But we have yet to find an intuition in which the identity of the unconscious and of the conscious, of the real and of the ideal, is presented in a concrete manner to the ego itself. And in the third part of the system of transcendental idealism Schelling locates what he is seeking in aesthetic intuition. Thus transcendental idealism culminates in a philosophy of art, to which Schelling attaches great importance. And provided that the statement is not taken as implying that the philosopher sets out to minimize the significance of moral activity, we can say that with Schelling, as contrasted with Fichte, the emphasis shifts from ethics to aesthetics, from the moral life to artistic creation, from action for the sake of action to aesthetic contemplation. From one point of view it would be desirable to treat first of Schelling's philosophy of art as given in the third part of the system of transcendental idealism and later of his aesthetic ideas as expressed in his lectures on the philosophy of art. For in the meantime he had developed his theory of the absolute, and this fact is reflected in the lectures but it is more convenient to outline his ideas on art in one section, though I shall draw attention to their historical development. 4. In the system of transcendental idealism we read that the objective world is only the original, still unconscious poetry of the spirit, 
the universal organon of philosophy and the keystone of the whole arch is the philosophy of art. 1. But the view that the philosophy of art is the true organon of philosophy 8 stands in need of some explanation. In the first place art is grounded on the power of productive intuition which is the indispensable organ or instrument of transcendental idealism. As we have seen, transcendental idealism comprises a history of consciousness. But the stages of this history are not present from the start to the ego's vision as so many already constituted objects at which it only needs to look. The ego or intelligence has to produce them, in the sense that it has to recreate or, to use a platonic term, recollect them in a systematic manner. And this task of recreation or recollection is performed by the power of productive intuition. Aesthetic intuition is an activity of the same power, though there it is directed outwards, as it were, rather than inwards. In the second place aesthetic intuition manifests the basic truth of the unity of the unconscious and the conscious, of the real and the ideal. If we consider aesthetic intuition from the side of the creative artist, the genius, we can see that in a real sense he knows what he is doing, he acts consciously and deliberately. When Michelangelo made the statue of Moses, he knew what he was about. At the same time, however, we can equally well say that the genius acts unconsciously. Genius is not reducible to a technical proficiency which can be imparted by instruction, the creative artist is, as it were, the vehicle of a power which acts through him. And for Schelling this is the same power which operates in nature. In other words, the same power which acts without consciousness in producing nature, the unconscious poetry of the spirit, acts with consciousness in producing the work of art. That is to say, it acts through the consciousness of the artist. And this illustrates the ultimate unity of the unconscious and the conscious, of the real and the ideal. The matter can be considered from another point of view. We can ask why it is that contemplation of a work of art is accompanied by the feeling of infinite satisfaction, one why it is that every impulse to produce is stilled with the completion of the product, that all contradictions are reconciled and all riddles solved. Two in other words, why is it that in contemplating a work of art the mind, whether of the artist himself or of someone else, enjoys a feeling of finality, the feeling that nothing should be added or subtracted, the feeling that a problem is solved, even if the problem cannot be stated? In Schelling's opinion the answer is that the completed work of art is the intelligence's supreme objectification of itself to itself, that is, as the identity of the unconscious and the conscious, the real and the ideal, the objective and the subjective. But as the intelligence or ego does not know this reflectively, it simply feels a boundless satisfaction, as though some unstated mystery had been revealed, and ascribes the production of the work of art to some power which acts through it. The philosophy of art is thus the culmination of the system of transcendental idealism. It will be remembered that transcendental idealism starts with the idea of the so-called ego or intelligence considered as an absolute act of self-consciousness in which subject and object are one. But this absolute act is a producing, it has to produce its object. And the supreme objectification is the work of art. True, the organism, as considered in the philosophy of nature, is a partial manifestation of the identity of the real and the ideal but it is ascribed to an unconscious productive power which does not work with freedom, whereas the work of art is the expression of freedom, it is the free ego's manifestation of itself to itself. Transcendental idealism, as was remarked in the last section, starts with the first immanent principle within the sphere of knowledge, namely with the absolute act which becomes an object for itself, and prescinds from the question whether there is a reality behind, as it were, this absolute act or ego. 1. But be why the time, 1802-3, that Schelling came to deliver the lectures which were eventually published as the philosophy of art he had developed his theory of the absolute, and we find him emphasizing the metaphysical significance of the work of art as the finite manifestation of the infinite absolute. The absolute is the indifference, that is to say, the ultimate identity, of the ideal and the real, and the indifference of the ideal and the real, as indifference, is depressed in the ideal world through art. 
Two Schelling is not contradicting what he has previously said about art. But in the lectures he transcends the self-imposed Fichtean limitations of the system of transcendental idealism and adopts the frankly metaphysical point of view which is really characteristic of his thought. In Bruno, 1802, Schelling introduced the notion of divine ideas and asserted that things are beautiful in virtue of their participation in these ideas. And this theory reappears in the lectures on art. Thus we are told that beauty exists where the particular, the real, is so in accord with its idea that this idea itself, as infinite, enters into the finite and is intuited in CO and Siri too. 3. Aesthetic intuition is thus the intuition of the infinite in a finite product of intelligence. Further, the conformity of a thing with its eternal idea is its truth. Hence beauty and truth one are ultimately one. Now, if the creative genius exhibits in the work of art an eternal idea, he must be akin to the philosopher. But it does not follow that he is a philosopher. For he does not apprehend the eternal ideas in an abstract form but only through a symbolic medium. Artistic creation requires the presence of a symbolic world, a world of poetic existence to which mediates between the universal and the particular. The symbol represents neither the universal as such nor the particular as such, but both in unity. We must distinguish, therefore, between the symbol and the image. For the image is always concrete and particular. This symbolic world of poetic existence is provided by mythology which is the necessary condition and primary matter stuff of all art. A. Schelling dwells at length on Greek mythology, but he does not confine the symbolic world which in his view forms the material for artistic creation to the mythology of the Greeks. He includes, for instance, what he calls Jewish and Christian mythology. The Christian mind has constructed its own symbolic world which has proved a fruitful source of material for the artist. This emphasis on mythology in Schelling's account of the symbolic world of poetic existence may well appear too narrow. But it illustrates Schelling's constant interest in myths as being at the same time imaginative constructions and intimations or expressions of the divine. In his later years he makes a distinction between myth and revelation. But his interest in the significance of mythology is a lasting element in his thought. And we shall have to return to the subject in connection with his later philosophy of religion. In this outline of Schelling's aesthetic philosophy the terms art and artist have been used in a wider sense than is customary in ordinary English. But it would not, I think, be very profitable to devote space here to Schelling's discussion of the particular fine arts which he divides into those belonging to the Reed series, such as painting and sculpture, and those belonging to the ideal series, such as poetry. For for general purposes it is sufficient to understand how Schelling makes aesthetic theory an integral part of his philosophy. In the third critique Kant had indeed discussed the aesthetic judgment, and he can be said to have made aesthetics an integral part of the critical philosophy. But the nature of Kant's system made it impossible for him to develop a metaphysics of art in the way that Schelling does. Kant allowed, it is true, that from the subjective point of view we can see a hint of noumenal reality, of the so-called supersensible substrate. But with Schelling the product of artistic genius becomes a clear revelation of the nature of the absolute. And in his exaltation of the genius, in his partial assimilation of the artistic genius to the philosopher and his insistence on the metaphysical significance of aesthetic intuition we can see clear evidence of his romantic affiliations. 5. In the foregoing sections reference has frequently been made to Schelling's theory of the absolute as the pure identity of subjectivity and objectivity, of the ideal and the read. In a sense these references were premature. For in the preface to his exposition of my system of philosophy, 1801, Schelling speaks of expounding the system of absolute identity. 1. And this way of speaking shows that he does not regard himself as simply repeating what he has already said. At the same time the so-called system of identity can be looked on as an inquiry into an exposition of the metaphysical implications of the conviction that the philosophy of nature and the system of transcendental idealism are mutually complementary. The standpoint of philosophy, says Schelling, is the standpoint of reason 8 that is to say, philosophical knowledge of things is knowledge of them as they are in reason. 
I give the name of reason Vernon feet to the absolute reason or to reason in so far as it is conceived as the toted indifference of the subjective and objective three in other words, philosophy is knowledge of the relation between things and the absolute or, as the absolute is infinite, between the finite and the infinite. And the absolute is to be conceived as the pure identity or indifference, lack of all difference, of subjectivity and objectivity. In attempting to describe the relation between the finite and the infinite Schelling is in a very difficult position. On the one hand there can be nothing outside the absolute. For IT is infinite reality and must contain all reality within itself. Hence it cannot be the external cause of the universe. The absolute identity is not the cause of the universe but the universe itself. For everything which exists is the absolute identity itself. And the universe is everything which is one on the other hand, if the absolute is pure identity, all distinctions must be outside it. Quantitative difference is possible only outside the absolute totality too hence finite things must be external to the absolute. Schelling cannot say that the absolute somehow proceeds outside itself. For he maintains that the fundamental error of all philosophy is the proposition that the absolute identity has really gone out of itself. Uh, hence he is forced to say that it is only from the point of view of empirical consciousness that there is a distinction between subject and object and that there are subsistent finite things. But this really will not do. For the emergence of the point of view of empirical consciousness and its ontological status remain unexplained. It is all very well for Schelling to say that quantitative difference is posited only in appearance for and that the absolute is in no way affected by the opposition between subjectivity and objectivity. 5. If appearance is anything at all, it must, on Schelling's premises, be within the absolute. And if it is not within the absolute, the absolute must be transcendent and unidentifiable with the universe. In Bruno, 1802, Schelling makes play with the theory of divine ideas, taken over from the Platonic and Neoplatonic traditions. Considered from one point of view at least, the absolute is the idea of ideas, and finite things have eternal existence in the divine ideas. But even if we are prepared to admit that this theory of divine ideas is compatible with the view of the absolute as pure identity, a view which is reaffirmed in Bruno, there is still the temporal status of finite things and their quantitative differentiation to be explained. In the dialogue Bruno tells Lucian that individual finite things are separate only for you six and that for a stone nothing proceeds out of the darkness of absolute identity. But we can very well ask how empirical consciousness, with the distinctions which it involves, can arise either within the absolute, if it is pure identity, or outside it, if it is the totality. Schelling's general point of view is that absolute reason, as the identity of subjectivity and objectivity, is self-consciousness, the absolute act in which subject and object are one. But reason is not itself actually self-conscious, it is simply the indifference or lack of difference between subject and object, the ideal and the real. IT attains actual self-consciousness only in and through human consciousness, the immediate object of which is the world. In other words, the absolute manifests itself or appears in two series of potencies, the real series, which is considered in the philosophy of nature, and the ideal series, which is considered in transcendental idealism. And from the standpoint of empirical consciousness the two series are distinct. We have subjectivity on the one hand and objectivity on the other. And the two together constitute the universe, which, as everything that is, is the absolute. If, however, we try to transcend the standpoint of empirical consciousness, for which distinctions exist, and to grasp the absolute as it is in itself rather than in its appearance, we can conceive it only as the indifference or vanishing point of all difference and distinctions. True, the concept has then no positive content. But this simply shows that by conceptual thought we can apprehend only the appearance of the absolute, the absolute identity as it appears in its external being, and not as it is in itself. In Schelling's opinion the theory of identity enables him to transcend all disputes between realism and idealism. For such controversy assumes that, 
the distinction made by empirical consciousness between the real and the ideal can be overcome only by subordinating or even reducing the one to the other. But once we understand that the real and the ideal are one in the absolute, the controversy loses its point. And the system of identity can thus be called real idealism, real idealismus. But though Schelling himself was pleased with the system of identity, there were others who were not so appreciative. And the philosopher set himself to explain his position in such a way as to meet what he regarded as the misunderstandings of his critics. Further, his own reflections on his position drove him to develop fresh lines of thought. Maintaining, as he did, that the relation between the finite and the infinite or the problem of the existence of the world of things is the fundamental problem of metaphysics, he could hardly rest content with the system of identity. For it seemed to imply that the universe is the actualization of the absolute, while it also asserted that the distinction between potentiality and act falls outside the absolute in itself. Some more satisfactory account of the relation between the finite and the infinite was obviously required. But a sketch of Schelling's further philosophical journeying is best reserved for the next chapter. The idea of the cosmic fall personality and freedom in man and God, good and evil the distinction between negative and positive philosophy mythology and revelation general remarks on Schelling notes on Schelling's influence and on some kindred thinkers. One in his work on philosophy and religion, 1804, Schelling explains that the description of the absolute as pure identity does not mean either that it is a formless stuff, composed of all phenomena fused together, or that it is a vacuous non-entity. The absolute is pure identity in the sense that it is an absolutely simple infinity. We can approach it in conceptual thought only by thinking away and denying of it the attributes of finite things, but it does not follow that it is in itself empty of all reality. What follows is that it can be apprehended only by intuition. The nature of the absolute itself, which as ideal is also immediately real, cannot be known by explanations, but only through intuition for it is only the composite which can be known by description. The simple must be intuited when this intuition cannot be imparted by instruction. But the negative approach to the absolute facilitates the act of intuition of which the soul is capable through its fundamental unity with the divine reality. The absolute as ideal manifests or expresses itself immediately in the eternal ideas. Strictly speaking, indeed, there is only one idea, the immediate eternal reflection of the Absolute which proceeds from it as the light flows from the sun. All ideas are one idea eight but we can speak of a plurality of ideas inasmuch as nature with all its grades is eternally present in the one idea. This eternal idea can be described as the divine self-knowledge. But this self-knowledge must not be conceived as a mere accident or attribute of the Absolute ideal but as itself a subsistent Absolute. For the absolute cannot be the ideal ground of anything which is not like itself, absolute aid in developing this theory of the divine idea, which, as we have seen, was first expounded in Bruno, Schelling draws attention to its origins in Greek philosophy. No doubt he has also at the back of his mind the Christian doctrine of the divine word, but the description of the eternal idea as a second absolute is more akin to the Plotinian theory of nous than to the Christian doctrine of the second person of the Trinity. Further, the ideas of the negative approach to the absolute and of intuitive apprehension of the Supreme Godhead also go back to Neopietonism, though the first idea at any rate reappears in scholasticism, as well, of course, as the theory of divine ideas. However, in spite of its venerable history Schelling's theory of the eternal idea cannot by itself explain the existence of finite things. For nature as present in the eternal idea is natura naturans rather than natura naturata. And from ideas, Schelling sensibly maintains, we can derive by deduction only other ideas. He therefore has recourse to the speculations of Jacob Boma and introduces the notion of a cosmic fall. The origin of the world is to be found in a falling away or breaking away, abrasion, from God, which can also be described as a leap, sprung. From the absolute to the real there is no continuous transition, the origin of the sensible world is thinkable only as a complete breaking away from absoluteness by means of a leap. One shelling does not mean that a part of the absolute breaks away or splits off. 
the fall consists in the emergence of a dim image of an image, resembling the shadow which accompanies the body. All things have their eternal ideal existence in the idea or divine ideas. Hence the center and true reality of any finite thing is in the divine idea, and the essence of the finite thing may thus be said to be infinite rather than finite. Considered, however, precisely as a finite thing, it is the image of an image, that is, an image of the ideal essence which is itself a reflection of the absolute. And its existence as a distinct finite thing is an alienation from its true center, a negation of infinity. True, finite things are not simply nothing. They are, as Plato said, a mixture of being and not being. But particularity and finitude represent the negative element. Hence the emergence of natura naturata, the system of particular finite things, is a fall from the absolute. It must not be thought, however, that the cosmic fall, the emergence of an image of an image, is an event in time. It is as eternal, outside all time, as the absolute itself and the world of ideas. 1. The idea is an eternal image of God. And the sensible world is an indefinite succession of shadows, images of images, without any assignable beginning. This means that no finite thing can be referred to God as its immediate cause. The origin of any given finite thing, a man for instance, is explicable in terms of finite causes. The thing, in other words, is a member in the endless chain of causes and effects which constitutes the sensible world. And this is why it is psychologically possible for a human being to look upon the world as the one reality. For it possesses a relative independence and self-subsistence. But this point of view is precisely the point of view of a fallen creature. From the metaphysical and religious standpoints we must see in the world's relative independence a clear sign of its fallen nature, of its alienation from the absolute. Now, if creation is not an event in time, the natural conclusion is that it is a necessary external self-expression of the eternal idea. And in this case it should be in principle deducible, even if the finite mind is unable actually to perform the deduction. But we have seen that Schelling refuses to allow that the world is deducible even in principle from the absolute. The fall cannot be, as they say, explained aid hence the origin of the world must be ascribed to freedom. The ground of the possibility of the fall lies in freedom aid but in what sense? On the one hand this freedom cannot be exercised by the world itself. Schelling may sometimes speak as though the world broke away from the absolute. But as it is the very existence and origin of the world which are in question, we can hardly conceive it as freely leaping away, as it were, from the absolute. For ex hypo ihesi it does not yet exist. On the other hand, if we ascribe the timeless origination of the world to a free creative act of God, in a theistic sense, there is no very obvious reason for speaking about a cosmic fall. In treating of this problem Schelling appears to connect the fall with a kind of double life led by the eternal idea considered as another absolute. For regarded precisely as the eternal reflection of the absolute, as the eternal idea, its true life is in the absolute itself. But regarded as real, as a second absolute, as soul, it strives to produce, and it can produce only phenomena, images of images, the nothingness of sensible things. 5. It is, however, only the possibility of finite things which can be explained, that is, deduced from the second absolute. Their actual existence is due to freedom, to a spontaneous movement which is at the same time a lapse. Creation is thus a fall in the sense that it is a centrifugal movement. The absolute identity becomes differentiated or splintered on the phenomenal level, though not in itself. But there is also a centripetal movement. The return to God. This does not mean that particular finite material things as such return to the divine idea. We have seen that no particular sensible thing has God for its immediate cause. Similarly, no particular sensible thing, considered precisely as such, returns immediately to God. Its return is mediate, by means of the transformation of the real into the ideal, of objectivity into subjectivity, in and through the human ego or reason which is capable of seeing the infinite in the finite and referring all images to the divine exemplar. As for the finite ego itself, 
it represents from one point of view the point of furthest alienation from God. One for the apparent independence of the phenomenal image of the Absolute reaches its culminating point in the ego's conscious self-possession and self-assertion. At the same time the ego is one in essence with infinite reason, and it can rise above its egoistic point of view, returning to its true center from which it has been alienated. This point of view determines Schelling's general conception of history, which is well illustrated by the following oft-quoted passage. History is an epic composed in the mind of God. Its two main parts are, first, that which depicts the departure of humanity from its center up to its furthest point of alienation from this center, and, secondly, that which depicts the return. The first part is the Iliad, the second the Odyssey of history. In the first the movement was centrifugal, in the second it is centripetal eight in grappling with the problem of the one and the many or of the relation between the infinite and the finite shelling is obviously concerned with allowing for the possibility of evil. The idea of the fall and of alienation allows for this possibility. For the human self is a fallen self, entangled, as it were, in particularity, and this entanglement, this alienation from the self's true center, renders possible selfishness, sensuality, and so on. But how can man be really free if the absolute is the totality? And if there is a real possibility of evil, must it not have a ground in the absolute itself? If so, what conclusions must we draw about the nature of the absolute or God? In the next section we can consider Schelling's reflections on these problems. 2. In the preface to his Philosophical Inquiries into the Nature of Human Freedom, 1809, Schelling frankly admits that philosophy and religion was deficient in clarity. He intends, therefore, to give another exposition of his thought in the light of the idea of human freedom. One this is especially desirable, he says, in view of the accusation that his system is pantheistic and that there is accordingly no room in it for the concept of human freedom. As for the charge of pantheism, this is, Schelling remarks, an ambiguous term. On the one hand it might be used to describe the theory that the visible world, natura naturata, is identical with God. On the other hand it might be understood as referring to the theory that finite things do not exist at all but that there is only the simple indifferentiated unity of the Godhead. But in neither sense is Schelling's philosophy pantheistic. For he neither identifies the visible world with God nor teaches a cosmism, the theory of the non-existence of the world. Nature is a consequence of the first principle, not the first principle itself. But it is a real consequence. God is the God of the living, not of the dead, the divine being manifests itself and the manifestation is real. If, however, pantheism is interpreted as meaning that all things are immanent in God, Schelling is quite prepared to be called a pantheist. But he proceeds to point out that Saint Paul himself declared that in God we live and move and have our being. To clarify his position, Schelling reinterprets the principle of identity. The profound logic of the ancients distinguished subject and predicate as antecedent and consequent antecedents l consequent and thereby expressed the real meaning of the principle of identity 8 God and the world are identical, but to say this is to say that God is the ground or antecedent and the world the consequent. The unity which is asserted is a creative unity. God is self-revealing or self-manifesting life. And though the manifestation is immanent in God, it is yet distinguishable from Him. The consequent is dependent on the antecedent, but it is not identical with it in the sense that there is no distinction between them. This theory, Schelling insists, in no way involves the denial of human freedom. For by itself it says nothing about the nature of the consequent. If God is free, the human spirit, which is his image, is free. If God is not free, the human spirit is not free. Now, in Schelling's view the human spirit is certainly free. For the real and living concept of freedom is that it is a power of good and evil. One and it is evident that man possesses this power. But if this power is present in man, the consequent, must it not also be present in God, the antecedent? And the question then arises, whether we are forced to draw the conclusion that God can do evil. To answer this question, 
let us first look more closely at the human being. We talk about human beings as persons, but personality, Schelling maintains, is not something given from the start, it is something to be won. All birth is birth out of darkness into light, too and this general proposition is true of the birth of human personality. There is in man a dark foundation, as it were, the unconscious and the life or urge and natural impulse. And it is on this foundation that personality is built. Man is capable of following sensual desire and dark impulse rather than reason, he is able to affirm himself as a particular finite being to the exclusion of the moral law. But he also has the power of subordinating selfish desire and impulse to the rational will and of developing his true human personality. He can do this, however, only by strife, conflict, and sublimation. For the dark foundation of personality always remains, though it can be progressively sublimated and integrated in the movement from darkness to light. As far as man is concerned, what Schelling has to say on this subject obviously contains a great deal of truth. But stimulated by the writings of Boma and impelled by the exigencies of his theory of the relation between the human spirit and God, he applies this notion of personality to God himself. There is in God a ground of his personal existence, eight which is itself impersonal. It can be called will, but it is a will in which there is no understanding. For it can be conceived as an unconscious desire or yearning for personal existence. And the personal divine existence must be conceived as rational will. The irrational or unconscious will can be called the egoism in God. 8 And if there were only this will in God, there would be no creation. But the rational will is the will of love, and as such it is expansive, 9 Self-communicating. The inner life of God is thus conceived by Schelling as a dynamic process of self-creation. In the ultimate dark abyss of the divine being, the primal ground or urgrund, there is no differentiation but only pure identity. But this absolutely undifferentiated identity does not exist as such. A division, a difference must be posited, that is, if we wish to pass from essence to existence one God first posits himself as object, as the unconscious will. But he cannot do this without at the same time positing himself as subject, as the rational will of love. There is, therefore, a likeness between the divine and the human conquest of personality. And we can even say that God makes himself too but there is also a great difference. And an understanding of this difference shows that the answer to the question whether God can do evil is that he cannot. In God the conquest of personality is not a temporal process. We can distinguish different potencies in God, different moments in the divine life, but there is no temporal succession. Thus if we say that God first posits himself as unconscious will and then as rational will, there is no question of temporally successive acts. Both acts are one act, and both are absolutely simultaneous. 3 For shelling the unconscious will in God is no more temporally prior to the rational will than the Father is temporally prior to the Son in the Christian theology of the Trinity. Hence, though we can distinguish different moments in the becoming of the divine personality, one moment being logically prior to another, there is no becoming at all in the temporal sense. God is eternally love, and in love there can never be the will to evil. For hence it is metaphysically impossible for God to do evil. But in God's external manifestation the two principles, the lower and the higher wills, are and must be separable. If the identity of the two principles were as indissoluble in the human spirit as in God, there would be no distinction, that is, between God and the human spirit, that is to say, God would not manifest himself. Therefore the unity which is indissoluble in God must be dissoluble in man. And this is the possibility of good and evil 8 This possibility has its ground in God, but as a realized possibility it is present only in man. Perhaps one can express the matter by saying that whereas God is necessarily an integrated personality, man need not be. For the basic elements are separable in man. It would, however, be erroneous to conclude that Schelling attributes to man a complete liberty of indifference. 
he is too fond of the idea of antecedent and consequent to admit the concept of freedom as a completely indeterminate power of willing one or other of two contradictory things without determining grounds and simply because it is willed. One Schelling rejects this concept and finds the determining ground of a man's successive choices in his intelligible essence or character which stands to his particular acts as antecedent to consequent. At the same time he does not wish to say that it is God who predetermines a man's acts by conceiving him in the eternal idea. Hence he is forced to depict a man's intelligible character as due to an original self-positing of the ego, as the result of an original choice by the ego itself. He can thus say both that a man's actions are in principle predictable and that they are free. They are necessary, but this necessity is an inner necessity, imposed by the ego's original choice, not a necessity externally imposed by God. This inner necessity is itself freedom, the essence of man is essentially his own act, necessity and freedom are mutually immanent, as one reality which appears as one or the other only when looked at from different sides too thus Judas's betrayal of Christ was necessary and inevitable, given the historical circumstances, but at the same time he betrayed Christ willingly and with complete freedom. 3. Similarly it was inevitable both that Peter would deny Christ and that he would repent of this denial, yet both the denial and the repentance, being Peter's own acts, were free. If the theory of an intelligible character is given a purely psychological interpretation, it can be made at any rate very plausible. On the one hand we not infrequently say of a given man that he could not act in this or that manner, meaning that such a way of acting would be quite contrary to his character. And if after all he does act in this way, we are inclined to say that his character was not what we supposed. On the other hand we come to know not only other people's characters but also our own through their and our acts. And we might wish to draw the conclusion that in each man there is, as it were, a hidden character which manifests itself progressively in his acts, so that his acts stand to his character in a relation analogous to that between consequent and ground or antecedent. The objection can indeed be made that this presupposes that character is something fixed and settled from the start, by heredity, environment, very early experiences and so on, and that this presupposition is false. But as long as the theory is presented as a psychological theory, it is a matter for empirical investigation. And it is clear that some empirical data count in its favor, even if others tell against it. It is a question of weighing, interpreting, and coordinating the available evidence. But Schelling does not present his theory simply as an empirical hypothesis. It is a metaphysical theory. At least it depends in part on metaphysical theories. For example, the theory of identity is influential. The absolute is the identity of necessity and freedom, and this identity is reflected in man. His acts are both necessary and free. And Schelling draws the conclusion that a man's intelligible essence, which determines his particular acts, must itself have, as it were, an aspect of freedom, in that it is the result of the ego's self-positing. But this original choice of itself by the ego is neither a conscious act nor an act in time. According to Schelling, it is outside time and determines all consciousness, though a man's acts are free inasmuch as they issue from his own essence or self but it is extremely difficult to see what this primeval act of will can possibly be. Schelling's theory bears some resemblance to M. Sartre's interpretation of freedom in his existentialist philosophy, but the setting is much more metaphysical. Schelling develops Kant's distinction between the intelligible and phenomenal spheres in the light of his theory of identity and of his preoccupation with the idea of ground and consequent, and the resulting theory is extremely obscure. It is indeed clear that Schelling wishes to avoid the Calvinist doctrine of divine predestination on the one hand and the theory of liberty of indifference on the other, while at the same time he wishes to allow for the truths which find expression in these positions. But it can hardly be claimed that the conclusion of his reflections is crystal clear. True, Schelling did not claim that everything in philosophy could be made crystal clear. But the trouble is that it is difficult to assess the truth of what is said unless one understands what is being said. As for the nature of evil, Schelling experienced considerable difficulty in finding a satisfactory descriptive formula. 
as he did not look on himself as a pant heist in the sense of one who denies any distinction between the world and God, he felt that he could affirm the positive reality of evil without committing himself to the conclusion that there is evil in the divine being itself. At the same time his account of the relation between the world and God. As being that of consequent or ground to antecedent implies that if evil is a positive reality it must have its ground in God. And the conclusion might be thought to follow that in order that evil should not be, God would have not to be himself. One in the Stuttgart lectures Schelling attempts to steer a middle course between asserting and denying the positive reality of evil by saying that it is from one point of view nothing, from another point of view an extremely real being. 8. Perhaps we can say that he was feeling after the scholastic formula which describes evil as a privation, though a real privation. In any case evil is certainly present in the world, whatever its precise nature may be. Hence the return to God in human history must take the form of the progressive triumph of good over evil. The good must be brought out of darkness into actuality that it may live everlastingly with God, and evil must be separated from the good that it may be cast into not being. For this is the final rate of creation 8 in other words, the complete triumph of the rational will over the lower will or urge, which is eternally accomplished in God, is the ideal goal of human history in God the sublimation of the lower will is eternal and necessary. In man it is a temporal process. 3. We have already had occasion to note Schelling's insistence that from ideas we can deduce only ideas. It is not surprising, therefore, if in his later years we find him emphasizing the distinction, to which allusion was made in the section on his life and writings, between negative philosophy, which is confined to the world of concepts and essences, and positive philosophy, which stresses existence. All philosophy worthy of the name, Schelling maintains, is concerned with the first or ultimate principle of reality. Negative philosophy, however, discovers this principle only as a supreme essence, as the absolute idea. And from a supreme essence we can deduce only other essences, from the idea only other ideas. From a what we cannot deduce a that. In other words, negative philosophy is quite incapable of explaining the existent world. Its deduction of the world is not a deduction of existence but only of what things must be if they exist. Of being outside God the negative philosopher can only say that if it exists, it can exist only in this way and only as such and such. One his thought moves. Within the realm of the hypothetical. And this is especially clear in the case of the Hegelian system which, according to Schelling, bypasses the existential order. Positive philosophy, however, does not start simply with God as idea, as a what or essence, but rather with God as a pure that, one as pure act or being in an existential sense. And from this supreme existential act it passes to the concept or nature of God, showing that he is not an impersonal idea or essence but a creative personal being, the existing Lord of Being, 8 where being means the world. Schelling thus connects positive philosophy with the concept of God as a personal being. Schelling does not mean to imply that he is the first to discover positive philosophy. On the contrary, the whole history of philosophy manifests the combat between negative and positive philosophy. 8. But the use of the word combat must not be misunderstood. It is a question of emphasis and priority rather than of a fight to the death between two completely irreconcilable lines of thought. For negative philosophy cannot be simply rejected. No system can be constructed without concepts. And even if the positive philosopher places the emphasis on existence, he obviously does not and cannot disdain all consideration of what exists. Hence we have to assert the connection, yes the unity, between the two, for that is, between positive and negative philosophy. 6. But how, Schelling asks, are we to make the transition from negative to positive philosophy? It cannot be made merely by thinking. For conceptual thought is concerned with essences and logical deductions. Hence we must have recourse to the will, a will which demands with inner necessity that God should not be a mere idea. 6. In other words, the initial affirmation of the divine existence is based on an act of faith demanded by the will. The ego is conscious of its fallen condition, of its state of alienation, 
and it is aware that this alienation can be overcome only by God's activity. It demands, therefore, that God should be not simply a transmundane ideal but an actually existing personal God through whom man can be redeemed. Fichte's ideal moral order will not satisfy man's religious needs. The faith which lies at the basis of positive philosophy is faith in a personal creative and redeeming God, not in Fichte's ideal moral order, nor in Hegel's absolute idea. At first sight at least Schelling may appear to be repeating Kant's theory of practical or moral faith. But Schelling makes it clear that he regards the critical philosophy as an example of negative philosophizing. Kant does indeed affirm God on faith, but simply as a postulate, that is, as a possibility. Further, Kant affirms God as an instrument, as it were, for synthesizing virtue and happiness. In his religion within the limits of bare reason there is no room for genuine religion. The truly religious man is conscious of his profound need of God, and he is brought by this consciousness and by his longing for God to a personal deity. For the person seeks a person one the truly religious man does not affirm God simply as an instrument for apportioning happiness to virtue, he seeks God for himself. The ego demands God himself. Him, him, will it have, the God who acts, who exercises providence, who, as being himself real, can meet the reality of the FALL. In this God alone does the ego see the real supreme good of the distinction between positive and negative philosophy thus turns out to be a distinction between philosophy which is truly religious and philosophy which cannot assimilate the religious consciousness and its demands. Schelling says this quite explicitly with an evident reference to Kant. The longing for the real God and for redemption through him is, as you see, nothing else but the expression of the need of religion. Without an active God. There can be no religion, for religion presupposes an actual, real relationship of man to God. Nor can there be any history in which God is providence. At the end of negative philosophy I have only possible and not actual religion, religion only within the limits of bare reason. It is with the transition to positive philosophy that we first enter the sphere of religion 8 now, if positive philosophy affirms the existence of God as a first principle, and if the transition to positive philosophy cannot be made by thinking but only by an act of the will issuing in faith, Schelling obviously cannot turn negative into positive philosophy by supplementing the former by a natural theology in the traditional sense. At the same time there can be what we may call an empirical proof of the rationality of the will's act. For the demand of the religious man is for a God who reveals himself and accomplishes man's redemption. And the proof, if one may so put it, of God's existence will take the form of showing the historical development of the religious consciousness, the history of man's demand for God and of God's answer to this demand, positive philosophy is historical philosophy one and this is the reason why in his later writings Schelling devotes himself to the study of mythology and revelation. He is trying to exhibit God's progressive self-revelation to man and the progressive work of divine redemption. This is not to say that Schelling abandons all his earlier speculations in favor of an empirical study of the history of mythology and revelation. As we have seen, his thesis is that negative and positive philosophy must be combined. And his earlier religious speculations are not jettisoned. For example, in the essay entitled Another Deduction of the Principles of Positive Philosophy, 1841, he takes as his point of departure the unconditioned existent to and proceeds to deduce the moments or phases of God's inner life. He does indeed lay emphasis on the primacy of being in the sense of existence, but the general scheme of his earlier philosophy of religion, with the ideas of the moments in the divine life, of the cosmic fall and of the return to God, is retained. And though in his lectures on mythology and religion he concerns himself with the empirical confirmation, as it were, of his religious philosophy, he never really frees himself from the idealist tendency to interpret the relation between God and the world as a relation of ground or antecedent to consequent. The reader may be inclined to share Kierkegaard's disappointment that after making his distinction between negative and positive philosophy Schelling proceeds to concentrate on the study of mythology and revelation instead of radically rethinking his philosophy in the light of this distinction. 
at the same time we can understand the philosopher's point of view. The philosophy of religion has come to occupy the central position in his thought. And the self-manifesting impersonal absolute has become the self-revealing personal God. Schelling is anxious, therefore, to show that man's faith in God is historically justified and that the history of the religious consciousness is also the history of the divine self-revelation to man. 4. If, however, we speak of Schelling's philosophy of mythology and revelation as an empirical study, the word empirical must be understood in a relative sense. Schelling has not abandoned deductive metaphysics for pure empiricism. Far from it. 4. Example, the deduction of three potencies in the one God is presupposed. It is also presupposed that if there is a self-manifesting God, this necessary nature of an absolute being will be progressively revealed. Hence when Schelling turns to the study of mythology and revelation, he already possesses the scheme, as it were, of what he will find. The study is empirical in the sense that its matter is provided by the actual history of religion as known through empirical investigation. But the framework of interpretation is provided by the supposedly necessary deductions of metaphysics. In other words, Schelling sets out to find in the history of religion the self-revelation of one personal God, whose unity does not exclude three distinguishable potencies or moments. And he has, of course, no difficulty in discovering expressions of this conception of the deity in the development of religious beliefs from the ancient mythologies of East and West up to the Christian dogma of the Trinity. Similarly, he has no difficulty in finding expressions of the ideas of a fall and of a return to God. If Schelling's premises are once assumed, this procedure is, of course, justified. For, as we have seen, he never intended to jettison metaphysics, the abstract philosophy of reason, which, to use modern jargon, shows us what must be the case if anything is the case. Hence from Schelling's point of view metaphysical presuppositions are quite in order. For philosophy as a whole is a combination of negative and positive philosophy. At the same time Schelling's procedure is doubtless one reason why his philosophy of mythology and revelation exercised comparatively little influence on the development of the study of the history of religion. This is not to say that metaphysical presuppositions are illegitimate. Whether one thinks that they are legitimate or illegitimate obviously depends on one's view of the cognitive value of metaphysics. But it is easy to understand that Schelling's philosophy of mythology and revelation was looked at askance by those who wished to free the study of the history of religion from the presuppositions of idealist metaphysics. A distinction is drawn by Schelling between mythology on the one hand and revelation on the other. Everything has its time. Mythological religion had to come first. In mythological religion, we have blind, because produced by a necessary process, Unfree and unspiritual religion one myths are not simply arbitrary and capricious products of the imagination. But neither are they. Revelation, in the sense of a freely imparted knowledge of God. They can, of course, be consciously elaborated, but fundamentally they are the product of an unconscious and necessary process, successive forms in which an apprehension of the divine imposes itself on the religious consciousness. In other words, Mythology corresponds to the dark or lower principle in God, and it has its roots in the sphere of the unconscious. When, however, we pass from mythology to revelation, we pass into a completely different sphere. One in mythology the mind had to do with a necessary process, here with something which exists only as the result of an absolutely free will. Two for the concept of revelation presupposes an act whereby God freely gives or has given himself to mankind. 8. Inasmuch as mythological religion and revealed religion are both religion, it must be possible, Schelling insists, to subsume them under a common idea. And in fact the whole history of the religious consciousness is a second theogony or birth of God, in the sense that the eternal and timeless becoming or birth of God in himself for is represented in time in the history of religion. Mythology, as rooted in the unconscious, represents a moment in the divine life. IT logically precedes revelation and is a preparation for it. But it is not itself revelation. 
for revelation is essentially God's free manifestation of himself as infinite, personal, and free creator and lord of being. And, as a free act on God's part, it is not simply a logical consequence of mythology. At the same time revelation can be described as the truth of mythology. For mythology is, as it were, the exoteric element which veils the revealed truth. And in paganism the philosopher can find mythological representations or anticipations of the truth. In other words, Schelling wishes to represent the whole history of the religious consciousness as God's revelation of himself, while at the same time he wishes to leave room for a specifically Christian concept of revelation. On the one hand revelation, in what we might perhaps call a weak sense of the term, runs through the whole history of religion. For it is the inner truth of mythology. On the other hand revelation in a strong sense of the term is found in Christianity. For it is in the Christian religion that this inner truth first comes to the clear light of day. Christianity thus gives the truth of mythology, and it can be described as the culmination of historical religion. But it does not follow that Christianity is an automatic consequence of mythology. Mythology as such is, as we have seen, a necessary process. But in and through Christ the personal God freely reveals himself. Obviously, if Schelling wishes to represent the whole history of religion as the temporal representation of the divine life, it is very difficult for him to avoid asserting a necessary connection between pagan mythology and Christianity. The former would represent God as unconscious will, while the latter would represent God as free will, the will of love. At the same time Schelling tries to preserve an essential distinction between mythology and revelation by insisting that the concept of revelation is the concept of a free act on God's part. Revelation is the truth of mythology in the sense that it is that at which mythology aims and that which underlies the exoteric clothing of myth. But it is in and through Christ that the truth is clearly revealed, and it is revealed freely. Its truth could not be known simply by logical deduction from the pagan myths. But though Schelling certainly tries to allow for a distinction between mythology and revelation, there is a further important point to make. If we mean by revelation Christianity simply as a fact which stands over against the fact of paganism, there is room for a higher standpoint, namely that of reason understanding both mythology and revelation. And this higher standpoint is positive philosophy. But Schelling is careful to explain that he is not referring to a rationalistic interpretation of religion from outside. He is referring to the activity of the religious consciousness whereby it understands itself from within. The philosophy of religion is thus for Schelling not only philosophy but also religion. It presupposes Christianity and cannot exist without it. It arises within Christianity, not outside it. Philosophical religion is therefore historically mediated through revealed religion one but it cannot be simply identified with Christian belief and life as facts. For it takes these facts as subject matter for free reflective understanding. In contrast, therefore, with the simple acceptance of the original Christian revelation on authority philosophical religion can be called free religion. The free religion is only mediated through Christianity, it is not immediately posited by it too but this does not mean that philosophical religion rejects revelation. Faith seeks understanding, but understanding from within does not annul what is understood. This process of understanding, of free reflection, has its own history, ranging through scholastic theology and metaphysics, up to Schelling's own later religious philosophy. And in this philosophy we can discern Schelling's hankering after a higher wisdom. There was always something of the Gnostic in his mental makeup. Just as he was not content with ordinary physics but expounded a speculative or higher physics, so in later years he expounded an esoteric or higher knowledge of God's nature and of his self revelation. It is not surprising, therefore, to find Schelling giving an interpretation of the history of Christianity which in certain respects is reminiscent of the theories of the 12th century abbot Joachim of Flores. According to Schelling there are three main periods in the development of Christianity. The first is the Petrine, characterized by the dominating ideas of law and authority and correlated with the ultimate ground of being in God, which is itself identified with the father of Trinitarian theology. The second period, 
the Pauline, starts with the Protestant Reformation. It is characterized by the idea of freedom and correlated with the ideal principle in God, identified with the Son. And Schelling looks forward to a third period, the Yuan 9, which will be a higher synthesis of the first two periods and unite together law and freedom in the one Christian community. This third period is correlated with the Holy Spirit, the divine love, interpreted as a synthesis of the first two moments in God's inner life. 5. If we look at Schelling's philosophical pilgrimage as a whole, there is obviously a very great difference between its point of departure and its point of arrival. At the same time there is a certain continuity. For we can see how fresh problems arise for him out of positions already adopted, and how his solutions to these problems demand the adoption of new positions which involve modifications in the old or display them in a new light. Further, there are certain pervasive fundamental problems which serve to confer a certain unity on his philosophizing in spite of all changes. There can be no reasonable objection to this process of development as such, unless we are prepared to defend as reasonable the thesis that a philosopher should expound a rigid closed system and never change it. Indeed, it is arguable that Schelling did not make sufficient changes. For he showed a tendency to retain ideas already employed even when the adoption of a new idea or set of ideas might well have suggested the advisability of discarding them. This characteristic may not be peculiar to Schelling, it is likely to be found in any philosopher whose thought passed through a variety of distinct phases. But it leads to a certain difficulty in assessing Schelling's precise position at a given moment. For instance, in his later thought he emphasizes the personal nature of God and the freedom of God's creative act. And it is natural to describe the evolution of his thought in its theological aspects as being a movement from pantheism to speculative theism. At the same time his insistence on the divine freedom is accompanied by a retention of the idea of the cosmic fall and by a persistent inclination to look on the relation between the world and God as analogous to that between consequent and antecedent. Hence, though it seems to me more appropriate to describe his later thought in terms of the ideas which are new rather than in terms of those which are retained for the past, he provides material for those who maintain that even in the last phase of his philosophizing he was a dynamic pantheist rather than a theist. It is, of course, a question partly of emphasis and partly of terminology. But the point is that Schelling himself is largely responsible for the difficulty in finding the precise appropriate descriptive term. However, perhaps one ought not to expect anything else in the case of a philosopher who was so anxious to synthesize apparently conflicting points of view and to show that they were really complementary. It scarcely needs saying that Schelling was not a systematizer in the sense of one who leaves to posterity a closed and rigid system of the take it or leave it type. But it does not necessarily follow that he was not a systematic thinker. True, his mind was notably open to stimulus and inspiration from a variety of thinkers whom he found in some respects congenial. For example, Plato, the Neoplatonists, Giordano Bruno, one Jacob Boma, Spinoza, and Leibniz, not to speak of Kant and Fichte, were all used as sources of inspiration. But this openness to the reception of ideas from a variety of sources was not accompanied by any very pronounced ability to weld them all together into one consistent whole. Further, we have seen that in his later years he showed a strong inclination to take flight into the cloudy realm of theosophy and Gnosticism. And it is understandable that a man who diarrhea heavily on the speculations of Jacob Boma can exercise only a very limited appeal among philosophers. At the same time it is necessary, as Hegel remarks, to make a distinction between Schelling's philosophy and the imitations of it which consist in a farrago of words about the absolute or in the substitution for sustained thought of vague analogies based on alleged intuitive insights. For though Schelling was not a systematizer in the sense that Hegel was, he nonetheless thought systematically. That is to say, he made a read and sustained effort to understand his material and to think through the problems which he raised. It was always systematic understanding at which he aimed and which he tried to communicate. Whether he succeeded or not, is another question. Schelling's later thought has been comparatively neglected by historians. And this is understandable. For one thing, as was remarked in the introductory chapter, 
Schelling's philosophy of nature, system of transcendental idealism and theory of the absolute as pure identity are the important phases of his thought if we choose to regard him primarily as a link between Fichte and Hegel in the development of German idealism. For another thing, his philosophy of mythology and revelation, which in any case belonged to a period when the impetus of metaphysical idealism was already spent, has seemed to many not only to represent a flight beyond anything which can be regarded as rational philosophy but also to be hardly worth considering in view of the actual development of the history of religion in subsequent times. But though this neglect is understandable, it is also perhaps regrettable. At least it is regrettable if one thinks that there is room for a philosophy of religion as well as for a purely historical and sociological study of religions or a purely psychological study of the religious consciousness. It is not so much a question of looking to Schelling for solutions to problems as of finding stimulus and inspiration in his thought, points of departure for independent reflection. And possibly this is a characteristic of Schelling's philosophizing as a whole. Its value may be primarily suggestive and stimulative. But it can, of course, exercise this function only for those who have a certain initial sympathy with his mentality and an appreciation of the problems which he raised. In the absence of this sympathy and appreciation there is a natural tendency to write him off as a poet who chose the wrong medium for the expression of his visions of the world. 6. In the introductory chapter some mention was made of Schelling's relations with the Romantic movement as represented by F. Schlegel, Novalis, Hold Erlen, and so on. And I do not propose either to repeat or to develop what was then said. But some remarks may be appropriate in this last section of the present chapter on Schelling's influence on some other thinkers both inside and outside Germany. Schelling's philosophy of nature exercised some influence on Lorenz Oken, 1779-1851. Oken was a professor of medicine at Jena, Munich, and Zurich successively, but he was deeply interested in philosophy and published several philosophical works, such as On the Universe, Über das Universum, 1808. In his view the philosophy of nature is the doctrine of the eternal transformation of God into the world. God is the totality, and the world is the eternal appearance of God. That is to say, the world cannot have had a beginning because it is the expressed divine thought. And for the same reason it can have no end. But there can be and is evolution in the world. Schelling's judgment of Oken's philosophy was not particularly favorable, though he made use of some of Oken's ideas in his lectures. In his turn Oken refused to follow Schelling into the paths of his later religious philosophy. The influence of Schelling's philosophy of nature was also felt by Johann Joseph von Gors, 1776-1848, a leading Catholic philosopher of Munich. One but Gors is chiefly known as a religious thinker. At first somewhat inclined to the pantheism of Schelling's system of identity, he later expounded a theistic philosophy, as in the four volumes of his Christian mysticism, Christ-like mystic, 1836 to 42 though like Schelling himself he was strongly attracted to theosophical speculation Gors also wrote on art and on political questions indeed he took an active part in political life and interested himself in the problem of the relations between church and state Gors's abandonment of the standpoint represented by Schelling's system of identity was not shared by Carl Gustav Karras 1789 to 1860, a doctor and philosopher who defended pantheism throughout his career. He is of some importance for his work on the soul, Psyche, 1846, in which he maintains that the key to the conscious life of the soul is to be found in the sphere of the unconscious. Turning to Franz von Bader, 1765 to 1841, who, like Gors, was an important member of the circle of Catholic thinkers and writers at Munich, we find a clear case of reciprocal influence. That is to say, though Bader was influenced by Schelling, he in turn influenced the latter. For it was Bader who introduced Schelling to the writings of Boma and so helped to determine the direction taken by his thought. It was Bader's conviction that since the time of Francis Bacon and Descartes philosophy had tended to become more and more divorced from religion, whereas true philosophy should have its foundations in faith. 
and in working out his own philosophy Batter drew on the speculations of thinkers such as Eckhart and Boma. In God himself we can distinguish higher and lower principles, and though the sensible world is to be regarded as a divine self-manifestation it nonetheless represents a fall. Again, just as in God there is the eternal victory of the higher principle over the lower, of light over darkness, so in man there should be a process of spiritualization whereby the world would return to God. It is evident that Batter and Schelling were kindred souls who drank from the same spiritual fountain. Batter's social and political writings are of some interest. In them he expresses a resolute opposition to the theory of the state as a result of a social compact or contract between individuals. On the contrary, the state is a natural institution in the sense that it is grounded in and proceeds from the nature of man, it is not the product of a convention. At the same time Batter strongly attacks the notion that the state is the ultimate sovereign power. The ultimate sovereign is God alone, and reverence for God and the universal moral law, together with respect for the human person as the image of God, are the only real safeguards against tyranny. If these safeguards are neglected, tyranny and intolerance will result, no matter whether sovereignty is regarded as residing with the monarch or with the people. To the atheistic or secular power state batter opposes the ideal of the Christian state. The concentration of power which is characteristic of the secular or the atheistic national state and which leads to injustice at home and to war abroad can be overcome only if religion and morality penetrate the whole of human society. One can hardly call Karl Christian Friedrich Krauss, 1781-1832, a disciple of Schelling. For he professed to be the true spiritual successor of Kant, and his relations with Schelling, when at Munich, were far from friendly. However, he was wont to say that the approach to his own philosophy must be by way of Schelling, and some of his ideas were akin to those of Schelling. The body, he maintained, belongs to the realm of nature, while the spirit or ego belongs to the spiritual sphere, the realm of reason. This idea echoes indeed Kant's distinction between the phenomenal and noumenal spheres. But Krauss argued that as spirit and nature, though distinct and in one sense opposed, react on one another, we must look for the ground of both in a perfect essence, God, or the Absolute. Krauss also expounded a synthetic order, proceeding from God or the Absolute to the derived essences, spirit, and nature, and to finite things. He insisted on the unity of all humanity as the goal of history, and after abandoning his hope of this end being attained through Freemasonry, issued a manifesto proclaiming a League of Humanity, Menschheitsbund. In Germany his philosophy was overshadowed by the systems of the three great idealists, but it exercised, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, a wide influence in Spain where Krausism became a fashionable system of thought. In Russia Schelling appealed to the Panslavist group, whereas the westernizers were influenced more by Hegel. For instance, in the early part of the 19th century Schelling's philosophy of nature was expounded at Moscow by M. G. Pavlov, 1773-1840, while the later religious thought of Schelling exercised some influence on the famous Russian philosopher Vladimir Soloviev, 1853-1900. It would certainly not be accurate to call Soloviev a disciple of Schelling. Apart from the fact that he was influenced by other non-Russian thinkers, he was in any case an original philosopher and not the disciple of anyone. But in his tendency to theosophical speculation one he showed a marked affinity of spirit with Schelling, and certain aspects of his profoundly religious thought are very similar to positions adopted by the German philosopher. In Great Britain the influence of Schelling has been negligible. Coleridge, the poet, remarks in his biography Leader Aria that in Schelling's philosophy of nature and system of transcendental idealism he found a genial coincidence with much that he had worked out for himself, and he praises Schelling at the expense of Fichte, whom he caricatures. But it can hardly be said that professional philosophers in this country have shown any enthusiasm for Schelling. In recent times there has been a certain renewal of interest in Schelling's philosophy of religion. For instance, it acted as a stimulus in the development of the thought of the Protestant theologian Paul Tillich. And in spite of Kierkegaard's attitude there has been a tendency to see in Schelling's distinction between negative and positive philosophy, 
in his insistence on freedom and in his emphasis on existence, an anticipation of some themes of existentialism. But though this interpretation has some limited justification, the desire to find anticipations of later ideas in illustrious minds of the past should not blind us to the great differences in atmosphere between the idealist and existentialist movements. In any case Schelling is perhaps most notable for his transformation of the impersonal absolute of metaphysical idealism into the personal God who reveals himself to the religious consciousness. I concerned as they were with the absolute, with the relation between the infinite and the finite and with the life of the spirit, the three great German idealists naturally devoted attention to religion as an expression of the finite spirit's relation to the divine reality. And as all three were professors of philosophy and constructors of philosophical systems, it was also natural that they should interpret religion in the light of the fundamental principles of these systems. Thus in accordance with the spirit of his ethical idealism Fitch tended to reduce religion to ethics, one while Hegel tended to depict it as a form of knowledge. Even Schelling, whose thought, as we have seen, became more and more a philosophy of the religious consciousness and who laid emphasis on man's need of a personal God, tended to interpret the development of the religious consciousness as the development of a higher knowledge. With Schleiermacher, however, we find an approach to the philosophy of religion from the point of view of a theologian and preacher, a man who in spite of his strongly marked philosophical interests retained the imprint of his pietistic upbringing and who was concerned with making a sharp distinction between the religious consciousness on the one hand and metaphysics and ethics on the other. Friedrich Daniel Ernst Schleiermacher was born at Breslau on November 21, 1768. His school education was entrusted by his parents to the Moravian Brotherhood. In spite of a loss of faith in some fundamental Christian doctrines he then proceeded to Halle for the study of theology, though during his first two years at the university he interested himself in Spinoza and Kant more than in purely theological subjects. In 1790 he passed his examinations at Berlin and then took a post as tutor in a family. From 1794 until the end of 1795 he acted as pastor at Landsberg near Frankfurt on. The Oder, and from 1796 until 1802 he held an ecclesiastical position at Berlin. During this period at Berlin Schleiermacher was in relation with the circle of the Romantics, particularly with Friedrich Schlegel. He shared the general Romantic concern with the totality, and he had a profound sympathy with Spinoza. At the same time he had been attracted from an early age by Plato's view of the world as the visible image of the ideal realm of true being and Spinoza's nature was conceived by him as the reality which reveals itself in the phenomenal world. But as an admirer of Spinoza he was faced with the task of reconciling his philosophical outlook with the religion which he was commissioned to teach. Nor was this simply a matter of satisfying his professional conscience as a Protestant clergyman. For he was a sincerely religious man who, as already remarked, retained the lasting imprint of the piety of his family and of his early teachers. He had therefore to think out the intellectual framework for the religious consciousness as he conceived it. And in 1799 he published his Discourses on Religion, Reden über die Religion, of which there were several subsequent editions. This work was followed in 1800 by Monologues, Monologen, treating of problems connected with the relation between the individual and society, and in 1801 by Schleiermacher's first collection of sermons. Schleiermacher was not, however, what would generally be considered an orthodox Protestant theologian, and the years 1802-4 were passed in retirement. In 1803 he published outlines of a critique of the doctrine of morals up to present, Grundleien einer Kritik der Bischer Igen Sittenlehr. He also occupied himself with translating into German the dialogues of Plato, furnished with introductions and notes. The first part appeared in 1804, the second in 1809 and the third in 1828. In 1804 Schleiermacher accepted a chair at the University of Halle. And when Napoleon closed the university, he remained in the town as a preacher. In 1807, however, he returned to Berlin where he took part in political life and collaborated in the foundation of the new university. 
In 1810 he was appointed professor of theology in the university and he held this post until his death in 1834. In 1821 2 he published his Christian faith according to the principles of the Evangelical Church, Der Christ like Glaube nach den Grundzender Evangelischen Kirche, a second edition of which appeared in 1830 1. He also published further collections of sermons. His lecture courses at the university, which covered not only theological but also philosophical and educational themes, were published after his death. 2. Thought and being, Schleiermacher maintains, are correlative. But there are two ways in which thought can be related to being. In the first place thought can conform itself to being, as in scientific or theoretical knowledge. And the being which corresponds to the totality of our scientific concepts and judgments is called nature. In the second place thought can seek to conform being to itself. And this is verified in the thinking which lies at the basis of our moral activity. For through moral action we seek to realize our ethical ideals and purposes, endeavoring in this way to conform being to our ideas rather than the other way round. Thought which aims at knowledge relates itself to a being which it presupposes, the thought which lies at the root of our actions relates itself to a being which is to come about through us one and the totality of that which expresses itself in thought-directed action is called spirit. We are thus presented, at first sight at least, with a dualism. On the one hand we have nature, on the other spirit. But though spirit and nature, thought and being, subject and object, are distinct and different notions for conceptual thinking, which is unable to transcend all distinction and oppositions, the dualism is not absolute. The ultimate reality is the identity of spirit and nature in the universe or God. Conceptual thought cannot apprehend this identity. But the identity can be felt. And this feeling is linked by Schleiermacher with self-consciousness. It is not indeed reflective self-awareness, which apprehends the identity of the ego in the diversity of its moments or phases. But at the basis of reflective self-awareness there lies an immediate self-consciousness, which equals feeling. Eight in other words, there is a fundamental immediacy of feeling, at which level the distinctions and oppositions of conceptual thought have not yet emerged. We can speak of it as an intuition. But if we do, we must understand that it is never a clear intellectual intuition. Rather is it the feeling basis, so to speak, in self-consciousness, and it cannot be separated from consciousness of the self. That is to say, the self does not enjoy any intellectual intuition of the divine totality as direct and sole object, but it feels itself as dependent on the totality which transcends all oppositions. This feeling of dependence, a Bainjikaitsgefall, is the religious side one of self-consciousness, it is in fact the religious feeling. 8 For the essence of religion is neither thought nor action but intuition and feeling. It seeks to intuit the universe 3 and the universe, as Schleiermacher uses the term, is the infinite divine reality. Hence religion is for him essentially or fundamentally the feeling of dependence on the infinite. In this case it is obviously necessary to make a sharp distinction between religion on the one hand and metaphysics and ethics on the other. True, metaphysics and ethics have the same subject matter as religion, namely the universe and man's relation to it. For but their approaches are quite different. Metaphysics, says Schleiermacher with an obvious reference to Fichte's idealism, spins out of itself the reality of the world and its laws. Five ethics develops out of the nature of man and his relation to the universe's system of duties, it commands and prohibits actions. Six but religion is not concerned with metaphysical deduction, nor is it concerned with using the universe to derive a code of duties. It is neither knowledge nor morality, it is feeling. We can say, therefore, that Schleiermacher turns his back on the tendency shown by Kant and Fitch to reduce religion to morals, just as he rejects any attempt to exhibit the essence of religion as a form of theoretical knowledge, and that he follows Jacobi in finding the basis of faith in feeling. But there is an important difference between Schleiermacher and Jacobi. For while Jacobi grounded all knowledge on faith, Schleiermacher wishes to differentiate between theoretical knowledge and religious faith and finds in feeling the specific basis of the latter. 
We can add that though for Schleiermacher the religious consciousness stands closer to the aesthetic consciousness than to theoretical knowledge, the feeling on which the religious consciousness is based, namely the feeling of dependence on the infinite, is peculiar to it. Hence Schleiermacher avoids the romantic tendency to confuse the religious with the aesthetic consciousness. It must not be concluded from what has been said that in Schleiermacher's view there is no connection at all between religion on the one hand and metaphysics and ethics on the other. On the contrary, there is a sense in which both metaphysics and ethics stand in need of religion. Without the fundamental religious intuition of the infinite totality metaphysics would be left hanging in the air, as a purely conceptual construction. And ethics without religion would give us a very inadequate idea of man. For from the purely ethical point of view man appears as the free and autonomous master of his fate, whereas religious intuition reveals to him his dependence on the infinite totality, on God. Now, when Schleiermacher asserts that religious faith is grounded on the feeling of dependence on the infinite, the word feeling must obviously be understood as signifying the immediacy of this consciousness of dependence rather than as excluding any intellectual act. For, as we have seen, he also talks about intuition. But this intuition is not an apprehension of God as a clearly conceived object, it is a consciousness of self as essentially dependent on infinite being in an indeterminate and unconceptualized sense. Hence the feeling of dependence stands in need of interpretation on the conceptual level. And this is the task of philosophical theology. It is arguable, of course, that Schleiermacher's account of the basic religious experience already comprises a conspicuous element of interpretation. For turning away from the moralism of Kant and the metaphysical speculation of Fichte and inspired by the thought of the holy, rejected Spinoza one he identifies that on which the self is felt to depend with the infinite totality, the divine universe. Religion is feeling and taste for the infinite, to and of Spinoza we can say that the infinite was his beginning and end, the universe was his only and eternal love. 3. Thus the basic religious feeling of dependence is initially described in a manner inspired by a romanticized Spinoza. At the same time the influence of Spinoza should not be overestimated. For whereas Spinoza set the intellectual love of God at the summit of the mind's ascent, Schleiermacher finds the feeling of dependence on the infinite at the basis of the religious view of the world. And the question arises, how are we to think or conceive this immediate consciousness of dependence? A difficulty immediately arises. The basic religious feeling is one of dependence on an infinite in which there are no oppositions, the self-identical totality. But conceptual thought at once introduces distinctions and oppositions, the infinite unity falls apart into the ideas of God and the world. The world is thought of as the totality. Of all oppositions and differences, while God is conceived a simple unity, as the existing negation of all opposition and distinction. As conceptual thought cannot do away altogether with the distinction to which it necessarily gives rise, it must conceive God and the world as correlates. That is to say, it must conceive the relation between God and the world as one of mutual implication and not as one of mere compare sense, nor even as a one-way relation of dependence, that is, of the world's dependence on God. No God without the world, and no world without God one at the same time the two ideas, namely of God and the world, must not be identified, therefore neither complete identification nor complete separation of the two ideas. 8 In other words, as conceptual thought necessarily conceives the universe through two ideas, it should not confuse them. The unity of the universe of being must be conceived in terms of their correlation rather than of their identification. At first sight at least this suggests that for Schleiermacher the distinction between God and the world exists only for human reflection, and that in reality there is no distinction. In point of fact, however, Schleiermacher wishes to avoid both the reduction of the world to God and the reduction of God to the world. On the one hand in a cosmistic theory which simply denied any reality to the finite would be unfaithful to the basic religious consciousness. For this would inevitably be misinterpreted by a theory which left nothing at all of which it could be said that it was dependent. On the other hand a simple identification of God with the spatio-temporal system of finite things would leave no room for an underlying undifferentiated unity. 
hence the distinction between God and the world must be something more than the expression of a defect in conceptual thought. True, conceptual thought is quite unable to attain an adequate understanding of the totality, the divine universe. But it can and should correct its tendency to separate completely the ideas of God and the world by conceiving them as correlates and seeing the world as standing to God in the relation of consequent to antecedent, as the necessary self-manifestation of an undifferentiated unity, or, to use Spinoza's terms, as natura naturata in relation to natura naturans. This is, as it were, the best that conceptual thought can do, avoiding, that is to say, both complete separation and complete identification. The divine reality in itself transcends the reach of our concepts. The really interesting and significant feature in Schleiermacher's philosophy of religion is the fact that it is for him the explicitation of a fundamental religious experience. In interpreting this experience he is obviously influenced by y. Spinoza. And, like Spinoza, he insists that God transcends all human categories. As God is the unity without differentiation or opposition, none of the categories of human thought, such as personality, can really apply to him. For they are bound up with finitude. At the same time God is not to be conceived as static substance but as infinite life which reveals itself necessarily in the world. In this respect Schleiermacher stands closer to Fichte's later philosophy than to the system of Spinoza, while the theory of God or the Absolute as the undifferentiated self-identity to which the world stands as consequent to antecedent resembles the speculations of Schelling. But Schelling's later Gnosticism would hardly have met with Schleiermacher's full approval. Religion for Schleiermacher really consists in the appropriation of the basic feeling of dependence on the infinite. It is an affair of the heart rather than of the understanding, of faith rather than knowledge. 3. Though he refuses to ascribe personality to God, except in a symbolic sense, Schleiermacher lays great stress on the value of the individual personality when he is considering human beings as moral agents. The totality, the universal, is indeed imminent in all finite individuals. And for this reason sheer egoism, involving the deification of one finite self, cannot possibly be the moral ideal for man. At the same time every individual is a particular manifestation of God, and he has his own special gifts, his own particularity, eigentumlichkeit. It is thus his duty to develop his individual talents. And education should be directed to the formation of fully developed and harmoniously integrated individual personalities. Man combines in himself spirit and nature, and his moral development requires their harmonization. From the metaphysical point of view spirit and nature are ultimately one. Hence the human personality cannot be properly developed if we make so sharp a distinction between, say, reason and natural impulse as to imply that morality consists in disregarding or opposing all natural impulses. The moral ideal is not conflict but harmonization and integration. In other words, Schleiermacher has little sympathy with the rigoristic morality of Kant and with his tendency to assert an antithesis between reason and inclination or impulse. If God is the positive negation, so to speak, of all differences and oppositions, man's moral vocation involves expressing the divine nature in finite form through the harmonization in an integrated personality of reason, will and impulse. But though Schleiermacher stresses the development of the individual personality, he also insists that individual and society are not contradictory concepts. For particularity exists only in relation to others. One on the one hand a man's element of uniqueness, that which distinguishes him from other men, presupposes human society. On the other hand society, being a community of distinct individuals, presupposes individual differences. Hence individual and society imply one another. And self-expression or self-development demands not only the development of one's individual gifts but also respect for other personalities. In other words, Every human being has a unique moral vocation, but this vocation can be fulfilled only within society, that is, by man as member of a community. If we ask what is the relation between morality as depicted by the philosopher and specifically Christian morality, the answer is that they differ in form but not in content. 
The content of Christian morality cannot contradict the content of philosophical morality, but it has its own form, this form being furnished by the elements in the Christian consciousness which mark it off from the religious consciousness in general. And the specific note of the Christian consciousness is that all community with God is regarded as conditioned by Christ's redemptive act. 2. As regards historical religions, Schleiermacher's attitude is somewhat complex. On the one hand he rejects the idea of a universal natural religion which should be substituted for historical religions. For there are only the latter, the former is a fiction. On the other hand Schleiermacher sees in the series of historical religions the progressive revelation of an ideal which can never be grasped in its entirety. Dogmas are necessary in one sense, namely as concrete symbolic expressions of the religious consciousness. But they can at the same time become fetters preventing the free movement of the spirit. An historical religion such as Christianity owes its origin and impetus to a religious genius, analogous to an artistic genius, and its life is perpetuated by its adherents steeping themselves in the spirit of the genius and in the vital movement which stems from him rather than by subscription to a certain set of dogmas. It is true that as time went on Schleiermacher came to lay more stress on the idea of the church and on specifically Christian belief, but he was and remained what is sometimes called a liberal theologian. And as such he has exercised a very considerable influence in German Protestant circles, though this influence has been sharply challenged in recent times by the revival of Protestant orthodoxy. 4. In his attempt to interpret what he regarded as the basic religious consciousness Schleiermacher certainly attempted to develop a systematic philosophy, a coherent whole. But it can hardly be claimed that this philosophy is free from internal strains and stresses. The influence of a romanticized Spinoza, the man possessed by a passion for the infinite, impelled him in the direction of pantheism. At the same time the very nature of the fundamental feeling or intuition which he wished to interpret militate against sheer monism and demanded some distinction between God and the world. For unless we postulate some distinction, how can we sensibly speak of the finite self as conscious of its dependence on the infinite? Again, whereas the pantheistic aspects of Schleiermacher's thought were unfavorable to the admission of personal freedom, in his moral theory and in his account of the relations between human beings he needed and used the idea of freedom. In other words, the pantheistic elements in his metaphysics were offset by his emphasis on the individual in his theories of moral conduct and of society. There was no question of the theory of the divine universe being reflected in political totalitarianism. On the contrary, quite apart from his admission of the church as a society distinct from the state, he emphasized the concept of the free society, the social organization which gives free play to the expression of the unique character of each individual personality. The strains in Schleiermacher's philosophy were not, however, peculiar to it. For any philosophy which tried to combine the idea of the divine totality with personal freedom and the idea of an ultimate identity with a full recognition of the value of the distinct finite particular was bound to find itself involved in similar difficulties. But Schleiermacher could hardly evade the problem by saying that the universal exists only in and through the particulars. For he was determined to justify the feeling of dependence on a reality which was not identifiable with the spatio-temporal world. There had to be something behind the world. Yet the world could not be something outside God. Hence he was driven in the same direction taken by Schelling. Perhaps we can. 158 post-Kantian idealist systems say that Schleiermacher had a profound quasi-mystical consciousness of the one as underlying and expressing itself in the many, and that this was the foundation of his philosophy. The difficulties arose when he tried to give theoretical expression to this consciousness. But, to do him justice, he readily admitted that no adequate theoretical account was possible. God is the object of feeling and faith rather than of knowledge. Religion is neither metaphysics nor morals. And theology is symbolical. Schleiermacher had indeed obvious affinities with the great idealists, but he was certainly not a rationalist. Religion was for him the basic element in man's spiritual life, and religion, he insisted, is grounded on the immediate intuitive feeling of dependence. This feeling of absolute dependence was for him the food, as it were, 
of philosophical reflection. And this is not, of course, a view which can be summarily dismissed as the amiable prejudice of a man who attributed to the pious feelings of the heart a cosmic significance which the reflective reason denies them. For it is at any rate arguable that speculative metaphysics is, in part at least, a reflective explicitation of a preliminary apprehension of the dependence of the many on the one, an apprehension which for want of a better word can be described as intuitive. Life and Writings Early Theological Writings Hegel's Relations to Fichte and Schelling The Life of the Absolute and the Nature of Philosophy The Phenomenology of Consciousness I. George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, greatest of GERMA and idealists and one of the most outstanding of Western philosophers, was born at Stuttgart on August 27, 1770. One his father was a civil servant. In his school years at Stuttgart the future philosopher did not distinguish himself in any particular way, but it was at this period that he first felt the attraction of the Greek genius, being especially impressed by the plays of Sophocles, above all by the Antigone. In 1788 Hegel enrolled as a student in the Protestant Theological Foundation of the University of Tübingen where he formed relations of friendship with Schelling and Hblüderlin. The friends studied Rousseau together and shared a common enthusiasm for the ideals of the French Revolution. But, as at school, Hegel gave no impression of exceptional ability. And when he left the university in 1793, his certificate mentioned his good character, his fair knowledge of theology and philology and his inadequate grasp of philosophy. Hegel's mind was not precocious like Schelling's, it needed more time to mature. There is however, another side to the picture. He had already begun to turn his attention to the relation between philosophy and theology, but he did not show his jottings or notes to his professors, who do not appear to have been remarkable in any way and in whom he doubtless did not feel much confidence. After leaving the university Hegel gained his livelihood as a family tutor, first at Bern in Switzerland, 1793-6, and then at Frankfurt, 1797 to 1800. Though outwardly uneventful these years constituted an important period in his philosophical development. The essays which he wrote at the time were published for the first time in 1907 by Hermann Knoll under the title Hegel's Early Theological Writings, Hegel's Theologisch Jugend Schriften, and something will be said about their content in the next section. True. If we possessed only these essays we should not have any idea of the philosophical system which he subsequently developed, and there would be no good reason for devoting space to him in a history of philosophy. In this sense the essays are of minor importance. But when we look back on Hegel's early writings in the light of our knowledge of his developed system, we can discern a certain continuity in his problematics and understand better how he arrived at his system and what was his leading idea. As we have seen, the early writings have been described as theological. And though it is true that Hegel became a philosopher rather than a theologian, his philosophy was always theology in the sense that its subject matter was, as he himself insisted, the same as the subject matter of theology, namely the absolute or, in religious language, God and the relation of the finite to the infinite. In 1801 Hegel obtained a post in the University of Jena, and his first published work, on the difference between the philosophical systems of Fichte and Schelling, difference de fix genuendi Schelling's chance systems, appeared in the same year. This work gave the impression that he was to all intents and purposes a disciple of Schelling. And the impression was strengthened by his collaboration with Schelling in editing the Critical Journal of Philosophy, 1802-3. But Hegel's lectures at Jena, which were not published before the present century, show that he was already working out an independent position of his own. And his divergence from Schelling was made clear to the public in his first great work, The Phenomenology of Spirit, Die Phenomenology de Geists, which appeared in 1807. Further reference to this remarkable book will be made in the fifth section of this chapter. After the Battle of Jena, which brought the life of the university to a close, Hegel found himself practically destitute, and from 1807 to 1808 he edited a newspaper at Bamberg. He was appointed rector of the gymnasium at Nuremberg, a post which he held until 1816. In 1811 he married. 
as rector of the gymnasium Hegel promoted classical studies, though not, we are told, to the detriment of study of the student's mother tongue. He also gave instruction to his pupils in the rudiments of philosophy, though more, it appears, out of deference to the wish of his patron Needhammer than from any personal enthusiasm for the policy of introducing philosophy into the school curriculum. And one imagines that most of the pupils must have experienced great difficulty in under standing Hegel's meaning. At the same time the philosopher pursued his own studies and reflections, and it was during his sojourn at Nuremberg that he produced one of his main works, The Science of Logic, Wissenschafter Logic, 1812-16. In the year in which the second and final volume of this work appeared Hegel received three invitations to accept a chair of philosophy from Erlangen, Heidelberg, and Berlin. He accepted the one from Heidelberg. His influence on the general body of the students does a lot seem to have been very great, but his reputation as a philosopher was steadily rising. And it was enhanced by the publication in 1817 of the Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences in Outline, Encyclopädie der Philosophischen Wissenschaften im Grundriss, in which he gave a conspectus of his system according to its three main divisions, logic, philosophy of nature and philosophy of spirit. We may also note that it was at Heidelberg that Hegel first lectured on aesthetics. In 1818 Hegel accepted a renewed invitation to Berlin, and he occupied the chair of philosophy in the university until his death from cholera on November 14, 1831. During this period he attained an unrivaled position in the philosophical world not only of Berlin but also of Germany as a whole. To some extent he was looked on as a kind of official philosopher. But his influence as a teacher was certainly not due to his connections with the government nor was it due to any outstanding gift of eloquence. As an orator he was inferior to Schelling. His influence was due rather to his evident and uncompromising devotion to pure thought, coupled with his remarkable ability for comprising a vast field within the scope and sweep of his dialectic. And his disciples felt that under his tuition the inner nature and process of reality, including the history of man, his political life and spiritual achievements, were being revealed to their understanding. During his tenure of the Chair of Philosophy at Berlin Hegel published comparatively little. His outlines of the philosophy of right, Grundlinie und der Philosophie directs, appeared in 1821, and new editions of the Encyclopedia were published in 1827 and 1830. At the time of his death Hegel was revising the phenomenology of spirit. But he was, of course, lecturing during the whole of this period. And the texts of his courses, partly based on the collated notes of students, were published posthumously. In their English translations the lectures on the philosophy of art comprise four volumes, those on the philosophy of religion and on the history of philosophy three volumes each, and those on the philosophy of history one volume. In Holderlin's opinion Hegel was a man of calm prosaic understanding. In ordinary life at least he never gave the impression of exuberant genius. Painstaking, methodical, conscientious, sociable, he was from one point of view very much the honest bourgeois university professor, the worthy son of a good civil servant. At the same time he was inspired by a profound vision of the movement and significance of cosmic and human history, to the expression of which he gave his life. This is not to say that he was what is usually meant by a visionary. Appeals to mystical intuitions and to feelings were abhorrent to him, so far as philosophy at any rate was concerned. He was a firm believer in the unity of form and content. The content, truth, exists for philosophy, he was convinced, only in its systematic conceptual form. The real is the rational and the rational the real, and reality can be apprehended only in its rational reconstruction. But though Hegel had little use for philosophies which took shortcuts, as it were, by appealing to mystical insights or for philosophies which, in his opinion, aimed at edification rather than at systematic understanding, the fact remains that he presented mankind with one of the most grandiose and impressive pictures of the universe which are to be met with in the history of philosophy. And in this sense he was a great visionary. 2. 
we have seen that Hegel was attracted by the Greek genius while he was still at school. And at the university this attraction exercised a marked influence on his attitude towards the Christian religion. The theology which he heard from his professors at Tübingen was for the most part Christianity adapted to the ideas of the Enlightenment, that is to say, rationalistic theism with a certain infusion of or tincture of biblical supematuralism. But this religion of the understanding, as Hegel described it, seemed to him to be not only arid and barren but also divorced from the spirit and needs of his generation. And he contrasted it unfavorably with Greek religion which was rooted in the spirit of the Greek people and formed an integral part of their culture. Christianity is, he thought, a book religion, and the book in question, namely the Bible, is the product of an alien race and out of harmony with the Germanic soul. Hegel was not, of course, proposing a literal substitute of Greek religion for Christianity. His point was that Greek religion was a Volk's religion, a religion intimately related to the spirit and genius of the people and forming an element of this people's culture, whereas Christianity, at least as presented to him by his professors, was something imposed from without. Moreover, Christianity was, he thought, hostile to human happiness and liberty and indifferent to beauty. This expression of Hegel's early enthusiasm for the Greek genius and culture was soon modified by his study of Kant. While not abandoning his admiration for the Greek spirit, he came to regard it as lacking in moral profundity. In his opinion this element of moral profundity and earnestness had been supplied by Kant who had at the same time expounded an ethical religion which was free from the burdens of dogma and Bible worship. Obviously, Hegel did not mean to imply that mankind had to wait till the time of Kant for the appearance of moral profundity. On the contrary, he attributed a Kantian-like emphasis on morality to the founder of Christianity. And in his Life of Jesus, Das Leben Jesu, 1795, which was written while he was a family tutor at BIM, he depicted Christ as being exclusively a moral teacher and almost as an expounder of the Kantian ethics. True. Christ insisted on his personal mission, but according to Hegel he was forced to do so simply because the Jews were accustomed to think of all religions and moral insights as revealed, as coming from a divine source. Hence to persuade the Jews to listen to him at all Christ had to represent himself as the legate or messenger of God. But it was not really his intention either to make himself the unique mediator between God and man or to impose revealed dogmas. How, then, did Christianity become transformed into an authoritarian, ecclesiastical, and dogmatic system? Hegel considered this question in the positivity of the Christian religion, die Positivität der Christlichen Religion, the first two parts of which were composed in 1795-6 and the third somewhat later, in 1798-9. As one would expect, the transformation of Christianity is attributed in large part to the apostles and other disciples of Christ. And the result of the transformation is depicted as the alienation of man from his true self. Through the imposition of dogmas liberty of thought was lost, and through the idea of a moral law imposed from without moral liberty perished. Further, man was regarded as alienated from God. He could be reconciled only by faith and, in Catholicism at least, by the sacraments of the Church. During his Frankfurt period, however, Hegel's attitude towards Christianity underwent a certain change, which found expression in the spirit of Christianity and its fate, Der Geist de Christentums und die Senskixel, 1800. In this essay Judaism with its legalistic morality becomes the villain of the peace. For the Jew God was the master and man the slave who had to carry out his master's will. For Christ God is love, living in man, and the alienation of man from God, as of man from man, is overcome by the union and life of love. Kant's insistence on law and duty and the emphasis which he lays on the overcoming of passion and impulse seem now to Hegel to express an inadequate notion of morality and to smack in their own way of the master-slave relationship which was characteristic of the Jewish outlook. Christ, however, rises above both Jewish legalism and Kantian moralism. He recognizes, of course, the moral struggle, 
but his ideal is that morality should cease to be a matter of obedience to law and should become the spontaneous expression of a life which is itself a participation in the infinite divine life, Christ does not abrogate morality in regard to its content, but he strips it of its legal form, substituting the motive of love for that of obedience to law. It will be noted that Hegel's attention is already directed to the themes of alienation and to the recovery of a lost unity. At the time when he was contrasting Christianity with Greek religion to the detriment of the former he was already dissatisfied with any view of the divine reality as a remote and purely transcendent being. In the poem entitled Eleusis which he wrote at the end of his sojourn at Bern and which he dedicated to hold Erlen he expressed his feeling for the infinite totality. And at Frankfurt he represented Christ as preaching the overcoming of the gulf between man and God, the infinite and the finite, by the life of love. The absolute is infinite life, and love is the consciousness of the unity of this life, of unity with the infinite life itself and of unity with other men through this life. In 1800, while still at Frankfurt, Hegel wrote some notes to which Hermann Knoll gave the title Fragment of a System, System Fragment. For on the strength of an allusion in a letter from Hegel to Schelling, Knoll, and Dilthey thought that the extant notes represented the sketch of a completed system. This conclusion seems to be based on somewhat insufficient evidence, at least if the word system is understood in terms of Hegel's developed philosophy. At the same time the notes are of considerable interest, and deserve some mention. Hegel is grappling with the problem of overcoming oppositions or antitheses, above all the opposition between the finite and the infinite. If we put ourselves in the position of spectators, the movement of life appears to us an infinite organized multiplicity of finite individuals, that is, as nature. Indeed, nature can well be described as life posited for reflection or understanding. But the individual things, the organization of which is nature, are transitory and perishing. Thought, therefore, which is itself a form of life, thinks the unity between things as an infinite, creative life which is free from the mortality which affects finite individuals. And this creative life, which is conceived as bearing the manifold within itself and not as a mere conceptual abstraction, is called God. It must also be defined as spirit, geist. For it is neither an external link between finite things nor the purely abstract concept of life, an abstract universal. Infinite life unites all finite things from within, as it were, but without annihilating them. It is the living unity of the manifold. Hegel thus introduces a term, namely spirit, which is of great importance in his developed philosophy. But the question arises whether we are able by conceptual thought so to unify the infinite and the finite that neither term is dissolved in the other while at the same time they are truly united. And in the so-called fragment of a system Hegel maintains that it is not possible. That is to say, in denying the gulf between finite and infinite conceptual thought inevitably tends to merge them without distinction or to reduce the one to the other, while if it affirms their unity it inevitably tends to deny their distinction. We can see the necessity for a synthesis in which unity does not exclude distinction, but we cannot really think it. The unification of the many within the one without the former's dissolution can be achieved only by living it, that is, by man's self-elevation from finite to infinite life and this living process is religion. It follows from this that philosophy stops short of religion, and that in this sense it is subordinate to religion. Philosophy shows us what is demanded if the opposition between finite and infinite is to be overcome, but it cannot itself fulfill this demand. For its fulfillment we have to turn to religion, that is, to the Christian religion. The Jews objectified God as a being set over above and outside the finite. And this is the wrong idea of the infinite, a bad infinity. Christ, however, discovered the infinite life within himself as source of his thought and action. And this is the right idea of the infinite, namely as immanent in the finite and as comprising the finite within itself. But this synthesis can only be lived as Christ lived it, it is the life of love. The organ of mediation between finite and infinite is love, not reflection. True, there is a passage where Hegel foreshadows his later dialectical method, but he asserts at the same time that the complete synthesis transcends reflection. 
yet if it is presupposed that philosophy demands the overcoming of the oppositions which it posits, it is only to be expected that philosophy will itself try to fulfill this demand. And even if we say that the life of love, the religious life, fulfills the demand, philosophy will attempt to understand what religion does and how it does it. It is thus not surprising if Hegel soon tries to accomplish by reflection what he had previously declared to be impossible. And what he requires for the fulfillment of this task is a new form of logic, a logic which is able to follow the movement of life and does not leave opposed concepts in irremediable opposition. The adoption of this new logic signifies the transition from Hegel the theologian to Hegel the philosopher or, better, from the view that religion is supreme and that philosophy stops short of it to the view that speculative philosophy is the supreme truth. But the problem remains the same, namely the relation of the finite to the infinite. And so does the idea of the infinite as spirit. 3. Some six months after his arrival at Jena Hegel published his work on the difference between the philosophical systems of Fichte and Schelling, 1801. Its immediate aim was twofold, first to show that these systems really were different and not, as some people supposed, the same, and secondly to show that the system of Schelling represented an advance on that of Fichte. But Hegel's discussion of these topics naturally leads him into general reflections on the nature and purpose of philosophy. The fundamental purpose of philosophy, Hegel maintains, is that of overcoming oppositions and divisions. Division and seeing is the source of the need of philosophy one in the world of experience the mind finds differences, oppositions, apparent contradictions, and it seeks to construct a unified whole, to overcome the splintered harmony, as Hegel puts it. True, division and opposition present themselves to the mind in different forms in different cultural epochs. And this helps to explain the peculiar characteristics of different systems. At one time the mind is confronted, for instance, with the problem of the division and opposition between soul and body, while at another time the same sort of problem presents itself as that of the relation between subject and object, intelligence and nature. But in whatever particular way or ways the problem may present itself, the fundamental interest of reason, Vernunfeet, is the same, namely to attain a unified synthesis. This means in effect that the absolute is to be constructed for consciousness, such is the task of philosophy. One for the synthesis must in the long run involve reality as a whole. And it must overcome the basic opposition between the finite and the infinite, not by denying all reality to the finite, not by reducing the infinite to the multiplicity of finite particulars as such, but by integrating, as it were, the finite into the infinite. But a difficulty at once arises. If the life of the Absolute is to be constructed by philosophy, the instrument will be reflection. Left to itself, however, reflection tends to function as understanding, verstand, and thus to posit and perpetuate oppositions. It must therefore be united with transcendental intuition which discovers the interpenetration of the ideal and the real, idea and being, subject and object. Reflection is then raised to the level of reason, Vernunfeet, and we have a speculative knowledge which must be conceived as identity of reflection and intuition. 2. Hegel is evidently writing under the influence of Schelling's ideas. Now, in the Kantian system, as Hegel sees it, we are repeatedly confronted with unreconciled dualisms or oppositions between phenomena and noumena, sensibility and understanding, and so on. Hegel shows therefore a lively sympathy with Fichte's attempt to remedy the state of affairs. He entirely agrees, for instance, with Fichte's elimination of the unknowable thing in itself, and regards his system as an important essay in genuine philosophizing. The absolute principle, the one real foundation and firm standpoint of philosophy is, in the philosophy of Fichte as in that of Schelling, intellectual intuition or, in the language of reflection, the identity of subject and object. In science this intuition becomes the object of reflection, and philosophical reflection is thus itself transcendental intuition which makes itself its own object and is one with it. Hence it is speculation. Fichte's philosophy, therefore, is a genuine product of speculation 3. 
but though Fitch sees that the presupposition of speculative philosophy is an ultimate unity and starts with the principle of identity, the principle of identity is not the principle of the system, directly the construction of the system begins, identity disappears. 1. In the theoretical deduction of consciousness it is only the idea of the objective world which is deduced, not the world itself. We are left simply with subjectivity. In the practical deduction we are indeed presented with a real world, but nature is posited only as the opposite of the ego. In other words, we are left with an unresolved dualism. With Schelling, however, the situation is very different. For the principle of identity is the absolute principle of the whole system of Schelling. Philosophy and system coincide, identity is not lost in the parts, and much less in the result too that is to say, Schelling starts with the idea of the absolute as the identity of subjectivity and objectivity, and it persists as the guiding idea of the parts of the system. In the philosophy of nature Schelling shows that nature is not simply the opposite of the ideal but that, though real, it is also ideal through and through, it is visible spirit. In the system of transcendental idealism he shows how subjectivity objectifies itself, how the ideal is also the real. The principle of identity is thus maintained throughout the whole system. In his works on the systems of Fichte and Schelling there are indeed signs of Hegel's divergence from Schelling. For instance, it is clear that intellectual intuition does not mean for him a mysticat intuition of a dark and impenetrable abyss, the vanishing point of all differences, but rather reasons insight into antitheses as moments in the one all-comprehensive life of the Absolute. But as the work is designed to illustrate the superiority of Schelling's system to that of Fichte, Hegel naturally does not make explicit his points of divergence from the former's thought. The independence of his own standpoint is, however, clearly revealed in the lectures of his Jena period. In the Jena lectures Hegel argues, for example, that if finite and infinite are set over against one another as opposed concepts, there is no passage from one to the other. A synthesis is impossible. But in point of fact we cannot think the finite without thinking the infinite, the concept of the finite is not a self-contained and isolated concept. The finite is limited by what is other than itself. In Hegel's language, it is affected by negation. But the finite is not. Simply negation. Hence we must negate the negation. And in doing so we affirm that the finite is more than finite. That is to say, it is a moment in the life of the infinite. And from this it follows that to construct the life of the absolute, which is the task of philosophy, is to construct it in and through the finite, showing how the Absolute necessarily expresses itself as spirit, as self-consciousness, in and through the human mind. For the human mind, though finite, is at the same time more than finite and can attain the standpoint at which it is the vehicle, as it were, of the Absolute's knowledge of itself. To a certain extent, of course, this is in harmony with Schelling's philosophy. But there is also a major difference. For Schelling the Absolute in itself transcends conceptual thought, and we must approach the Absolute identity by the via negativa, thinking away the attributes and distinctions of the finite. 1. For Hegel the Absolute is not an identity about which nothing further can be said, it is the total process of its self-expression or self-manifestation in and through the finite. It is not surprising, therefore, to find in the preface to the Phenomenology of Spirit a sharp rejection of Schelling's view of the Absolute. True, Schelling is not mentioned by name, but the reference is clear enough. It was clear to Schelling himself, who felt deeply wounded. Hegel speaks of a monotonous formalism and abstract universality which are said to constitute the Absolute. All the emphasis is placed on the universal in the bare form of identity and we see speculative contemplation identified with the dissolution of the distinct and determinate, or rather with hurling it down, without more ado and without justification, into the abyss of vacuity too to consider a thing as in the absolute is taken to mean considering it as dissolved in an undifferentiated self-identical unity. But to pit this one piece of knowledge, namely that in the absolute all is one, against determinate and complete knowledge or knowledge which at least seeks and demands completion to proclaim the absolute as the night in which, as we say, 
all cows are black this is the naivete of empty knowledge. 3. It is not by plunging ourselves into a mystical night that we can come to know the absolute. We come to know it only by understanding a determinate content, the self-developing life of the absolute in nature and spirit. True, in his philosophy of nature and in his system of transcendental idealism Schelling considered determinate contents, and in regard to these contents he attempted a systematic demonstration of the identity of the ideal and the real. But he conceived the absolute in itself as being, for conceptual thought at least, a blank identity, a vanishing point of all differences, whereas for Hegel the absolute is not an impenetrable reality existing, as it were, above and behind its determinate manifestations, it is its self-manifestation. 4. This point is of great importance for understanding Hegel. The subject matter of philosophy is indeed the absolute. But the absolute is the totality, reality as a whole, the universe. Philosophy is concerned with the true and the true is the whole one further, this totality or whole is infinite life, a process of self-development. The absolute is the process of its own becoming, the circle which presupposes its end as its purpose and has its end as its beginning. It becomes concrete or actual only by its development and through its end date in other words, reality is a teleological process, and the ideal term presupposes the whole process and gives to it its significance. Indeed we can say that the absolute is essentially a result. 8 For if we look on the whole process as the self-unfolding of an essence, the actualization of an eternal idea, we can see that it is the term or end of the process which reveals what the absolute really is. True, the whole process is the absolute, but in a teleological process it is the telos or end which shows its nature, its meaning. And philosophy must take the form of a systematic understanding of this teleological process. The true form in which truth exists can only be the scientific system of the same for now, if we say that the absolute is the whole of reality, the universe, it may seem that we are committed to Spinozism, to the statement that the absolute is infinite substance. But this is for Hegel a very inadequate description of the absolute. In my view of you which can be justified only through the exposition of the system itself everything depends on grasping the true not merely as substance but as subject as well. 5. But if the absolute is subject, what is its object? The only possible answer is that its object is itself. In this case it is thought which thinks itself, self-thinking. Thought. And to say this is to say that the absolute is spirit, the infinite self-luminous or self-conscious subject. The statement that the absolute is spirit is for Hegel its supreme definition. In saying that the absolute is self-thinking thought Hegel is obviously repeating Aristotle's definition of God, a fact of which he is, of course, well aware. But it would be a great mistake to assume that Hegel is thinking of a transcendent deity. The absolute is, as we have seen, the totality, the whole of reality, and this totality is a process. In other words, the absolute is a process of self-reflection, reality comes to know itself. And it does so in and through the human spirit. Nature is a necessary precondition of human consciousness in general, it provides the sphere of the objective without which the sphere of the subjective cannot exist. But both are moments in the life of the absolute. In nature the absolute goes over into, as it were, or expresses itself in objectivity. There is no question with Hegel of nature being unreal or merely idea in a subjectivist sense. In the sphere of human consciousness the absolute returns to itself, that is, as spirit. And the philosophical reflection of humanity is the absolute self-knowledge. That is to say, the history of philosophy is the process by which the absolute, reality as a whole, comes to think itself. Philosophical reason comes to see the whole history of the cosmos and the whole history of man as the self-unfolding of the absolute. And this insight is the absolute's knowledge of itself. One can put the matter in this way. Hegel agrees with Aristotle that God is self-thinking thought, one and that this self-thinking thought is the telos or end which draws the world as its final cause. But whereas the self-thinking thought of Aristotle is, so to speak, an already constituted self-consciousness which does not depend on the world, 
the self-thinking thought of Hegel is not a transcendent reality but rather the universe's knowledge of itself. The whole process of reality is a teleological movement towards the actualization of self-thinking thought, and in this sense the thought which thinks itself is the telos or end of the universe. But it is an end which is imminent within the process. The absolute, the universe or totality, is indeed definable as self-thinking thought. But it is thought which comes to think itself. And in this sense we can say, as Hegel says, that the absolute is essentially a result. To say, therefore, that the absolute is self-thinking thought is to affirm the identity of the ideal and the real, of subjectivity and objectivity. But this is an identity indifference, not a blank undifferentiated identity. Spirit sees itself in nature, it sees nature as the objective manifestation of the absolute, a manifestation which is a necessary condition for its own existence. In other words, the absolute knows itself as the totality, as the whole process of its becoming, but at the same time it sees the distinctions between the phases of its own life. It knows itself as an identity indifference, as the unity which comprises distinguishable phases within itself. As we have seen, the task of philosophy is to construct the life of the absolute. That is to say, it must exhibit systematically the rational dynamic structure, the teleological process or movement of the cosmic reason in nature and the sphere of the human spirit, which culminates in the absolute's knowledge of itself. It is not, of course, a question of philosophy trying to do over again, or to do better, the work accomplished by empirical science or by history. Such knowledge is presupposed. Rather is it philosophy's task to make clear the basic teleological process which is imminent in the material known in other ways, the process which gives to this material its metaphysical significance. In other words, philosophy has to exhibit systematically the self-realization of infinite reason in and through the finite. Now if, as Hegel believes, the rational is the real and the real the rational, in the sense that reality is the necessary process by which infinite reason, the self-thinking thought, actualizes itself, we can say that nature and the sphere of the human spirit are the field in which an eternal idea or an eternal essence manifests itself. That is to say, we can make a distinction between the idea or essence which is actualized and the field of its actualization. We then have the picture of the eternal idea or logos manifesting itself in nature and in spirit. In nature the logos goes over, as it were, into objectivity, into the material world, which is its antithesis. In spirit, the sphere of the human spirit, the logos returns to itself, in the sense that it manifests itself as what it essentially is. The life of the absolute thus comprises three main phases, the logical idea or concept or notion, one nature, and spirit. And the system of philosophy will fall into three main parts, logic. Which for Hegel is metaphysics in the sense that it studies the nature of the absolute in itself, the philosophy of nature and the philosophy of spirit. These three parts together form the philosophical construction of the life of the absolute. Obviously, if we talk about the eternal idea manifesting itself in nature and spirit, we imply that the Logos possesses an ontological status of its own, independently of things. And when Hegel uses, as he so frequently does, the language of religion and speaks of the logical idea as God in himself, he inevitably tends to give the impression that the Logos is for him a transcendent reality which manifests itself externally in nature. But such use of religious language does not necessarily justify this conclusion about his meaning. However, I do not wish to discuss this disputed problem here. For the moment we can leave undecided the question whether or not the self-thinking thought which forms the culminating category of Hegel's logic can properly be said to exist, that is, independently of the finite. It is sufficient to have noticed the three main parts of philosophy, each of which is concerned with the absolute. Logic studies the absolute in itself, the philosophy of nature studies the absolute for itself, and the philosophy of spirit studies the absolute in and for itself. Together they constitute the complete construction of the life of the absolute. Philosophy must, of course, exhibit this life in conceptual form. There is no other form in which it can present it. 
and if the life of the Absolute is a necessary process of self-actualization, this necessity must be reflected in the philosophical system. That is to say, it must be shown that concept A gives rise to concept B. And if the Absolute is the totality, philosophy must be a self-contained system, exhibiting the fact that the Absolute is both Alpha and Omega. A truly adequate philosophy would be the total system of truth, the whole truth, the perfect conceptual reflection of the life of the Absolute. It would in fact be the Absolute's knowledge of itself in and through the human mind, it would be the self-mediation of the totality. Hence, on Hegelian principles, there would be no question of comparing the Absolute philosophy with the Absolute, as though the former were a purely external account of the latter, so that we had to compare them to see whether the philosophy fitted the reality which it described. For the Absolute philosophy would be the Absolute's knowledge of itself. But if we say that philosophy must exhibit the life of the Absolute, in conceptual form, a difficulty at once arises. The Absolute is, as we have seen, identity indifference. For instance, it is the identity indifference of the infinite and the finite, of the one and the many. But the concepts of infinite and finite, as of the one and the many, seem to be mutually exclusive. If, therefore, philosophy operates with clearly defined concepts, how can it possibly construct the life of the Absolute? And if it operates with vague, ill-defined concepts, how can it be an apt instrument for understanding anything? Would it not be better to say with Schelling that the Absolute transcends conceptual thought? In Hegel's view this difficulty does indeed arise on the level of understanding, verse and. For understanding posits and perpetuates fixed static concepts of such a kind that it cannot itself overcome the oppositions which it posits. To take the same example which has already been given, for understanding the concepts of the finite and the infinite are irrevocably opposed. If finite, then not infinite, if infinite, then not finite. But the conclusion to be drawn is that understanding is an inadequate instrument for the development of speculative philosophy, not that philosophy is impossible. Obviously, if the term understanding is taken in a wide sense, philosophy is understanding. But if the term is taken in the narrow sense of verse and, the mind, functioning in this way, is unable to produce the understanding, in the wide sense, which is, or ought to be, characteristic of philosophy. Hegel has, of course, no intention of denying that understanding, in the sense of the mind operating as verse and, has its uses in human life. For practical purposes it is often important to maintain clear-cut concepts and oppositions. The opposition between the real and the apparent might be a case in point. Moreover, a great deal of scientific work, such as mathematics, is based on verse and. But it is a different matter when the mind is trying to grasp the life of the absolute, the identity indifference. It cannot then remain content with the level of understanding, which for Hegel is a superficial level. It must penetrate deeper into the concepts which are categories of reality, and it will then see how a given concept tends to pass over into or to call forth its opposite. For example, if the mind really thinks through, so to speak, the concept of the infinite, it sees it losing its rigid self-containedness and the concept of the infinite emerging. Similarly, if the mind really thinks through the concept of reality as opposed to appearance, it will see the absurd or contradictory character of a reality which in no way at all appears or manifests itself. Again, for common sense and practical life one thing is distinct from all other things, it is self-identical and negates all other things. And so long as we are not concerned with thinking what this really means, the idea has its practical uses. But once we really try to think it, we see the absurdity of the notion of a completely isolated thing, and we are forced to negate the original negation. Thus in speculative philosophy the mind must elevate itself from the level of understanding in the narrow sense to the level of dialectical thinking which overcomes the rigidity of the concepts of the understanding and sees one concept as generating or passing into its opposite. Only so can it hope to grasp the life of the absolute in which one moment or phase passes necessarily into another. But this is obviously not enough. 
if for the understanding concepts A and B are irrevocably opposed whereas for the deeper penetration of dialectical thought A passes into B and B into A, there must be a higher unity or synthesis which unites them without annulling their difference. And it is the function of reason, Vernonfeet, to grasp this moment of identity indifference. Hence philosophy demands the elevation of understanding through dialectical thinking to the level of reason or speculative thought which is capable of apprehending identity indifference. One it is perhaps unnecessary to add that from Hegel's point of view it is not a question of producing a new species of logic out of the hat to enable him to establish an arbitrarily preconceived view of reality. For he sincerely believes that dialectical thought gives a deeper penetration of the nature of reality than understanding in the narrow sense can possibly do. For example, it is not for Hegel a question of insisting that the concept of the finite must pass over into or call forth the concept of the infinite simply because of a preconceived belief that the infinite exists in and through the finite. For it is his conviction that we cannot really think the finite without relating it to the infinite. It is not we who do something to the concept, juggling about with it, as it were, it is the concept itself which loses its rigidity and breaks up before the mind's attentive gaze. And this fact reveals to us the nature of the finite, it has a metaphysical significance. In his account of dialectical thinking Hegel makes a rather disconcerting use of the word contradiction. Through what he calls the power of the negative a concept of the understanding is said to give rise to a contradiction. That is to say, the contradiction implicit in the concept becomes explicit when the concept loses its rigidity and self-containedness and passes into its opposite. Further, Hegel does not hesitate to speak as though contradictions are present not only in conceptual thought or discourse about the world but in things themselves. And indeed this must be so in some sense if the dialectic mirrors the life of the absolute. Moreover, this insistence on the role of contradiction is not simply incidental to Hegel's thought. For the emergence of contradiction is the motive force, as it were, of the dialectical movement. The conflict of opposed concepts and the resolution of the conflict in a synthesis which itself gives rise to another contradiction is the feature which drives the mind restlessly onwards towards an ideal term, an all-embracing synthesis, the complete system of truth. And, as we have noted, this does not mean that contradiction and conflict are confined to discourse about reality. When philosophy considers, for example, the history of man, it discovers a dialectical movement at work. This use of the word contradiction has led some critics of Hegel to accuse him of denying the logical principle of non-contradiction by saying that contradictory notions or propositions can stand together. And in refutation of this charge it has often been pointed out that for Hegel it is precisely the impossibility of being satisfied with a sheer contradiction which forces the mind onwards to a synthesis in which the contradiction is overcome. This answer, however, lays itself open to the retort that Hegel does not share Fichte's tendency to argue that the contradictions or antinomies which arise in the course of dialectical thinking are merely apparent. On the contrary, he insists on their reality and in the synth essays the so-called contradictory concepts are preserved. In turn, however, it can be replied that though the concepts are preserved, they are not preserved in a relation of mutual exclusiveness. For they are shown to be essential and complementary moments in a higher unity. And in this sense the contradiction is resolved. Hence the simple assertion that Hegel denies the principle of non-contradiction gives a quite inaccurate view of the situation. What Hegel does is to give a dynamic interpretation of the principle in place of the static interpretation which is characteristic of the level of understanding. The principle operates in dialectical thinking, but it operates as a principle of movement. This discussion might be prolonged, but it would be pointless to do so without first inquiring in what sense Hegel actually understands the term contradiction when he is engaged in working out his dialectical philosophy rather than in talking abstractly about dialectical thought. And it is a notorious fact that the result of such an inquiry is to show that there is no single precise and invariable sense in which Hegel uses the term. Occasionally indeed we find a verbal contradiction. Thus the concept of being is said to give rise to and pass into the concept of not being, while the concept of not being passes into the concept of being. 
and this dialectical oscillation gives rise to the concept of becoming which synthesizes being and not being. But, as will be seen in the section on Hegel's logic in the next chapter, the meaning of this dialectical performance is easily intelligible, whether we agree or not with what Hegel has to say. In any case Hegel's so-called contradictions are much more often contraries than contradictions. And the idea is that one contrary demands the other, an idea which, whether true or false, does not amount to a denial of the principle of non-contradiction. Again, the so-called contradictory or opposed concepts may be simply complementary concepts. A one-sided abstraction evokes another one-sided abstraction. And the one-sidedness of each is overcome in the synthesis. Further, the statement that everything is contradictory sometimes bears the meaning that a thing in a state of complete isolation, apart from its essential relations, would be impossible and contradictory. Reason cannot remain in the idea of a completely isolated finite thing. Here again there is no question of denying the principle of non-contradiction. We have used the word synthesis for the moment of identity indifference in the dialectical advance. But in point of fact the terms thesis, antithesis, and synthesis are more characteristic of Fitch than of Hegel, who seldom uses them. At the same time the most cursory inspection of the Hegelian system reveals his preoccupation with triads. Thus there are three main phases in the construction of the life of the absolute, the logical idea, nature, and spirit. And each phase is divided and subdivided into triads. Moreover, the whole system is, or aims at, a necessary development. That is to say, for philosophical reflection one stage reveals itself as demanding the next by an inner necessity. Thus, in theory. At least, if we start with the first category of the logic, the inner necessity of dialectical development forces the mind to proceed not simply to the final category of the logic but also to the ultimate phase of the philosophy of spirit. As for Hegel's preoccupation with triadic development, we may think that it is unnecessary and that it sometimes produces highly artificial results, but we obviously have to accept it as a fact. But though it is a fact that he develops his system according to this pattern, it obviously does not follow that the development always possesses the character of necessity which Hegel implies that it ought to have. And if it does not, this is easily understandable. For when Hegel is concerned, for example, with the life of the spirit in art or in religion, he is faced with a multitude of historical data which he takes over, as it were, from the relevant sources and which he then interprets according to a dialectical pattern. And it is clear that there might be various possible ways of grouping and interpreting the data, no one of which was strictly necessary. The discovery of the best way will be a matter of reflection and insight rather than of strict deduction. To say this is not necessarily to condemn Hegel's practice. For in point of fact his interpretations of vast masses of data can sometimes be illuminating and are often stimulating even when we do not agree with them. At the same time the transitions between the stages of his dialectic are by no means always of the logical type suggested by his claim that philosophy is a necessary deductive system, even if the persistent observance of the same external pattern, namely the triadic arrangement, tends to obscure the underlying complexity. Of course, when Hegel claims that philosophy is or ought to be a necessary deductive system, he does not really mean that it is the sort of deductive system which could be worked out by a machine. If it were, then it would belong to the sphere of understanding rather than to that of reason. Philosophy is concerned with the life of absolute spirit, and to discern the unfolding of this life in, say, human history, a priori deduction is obviously not enough. The empirical material cannot be supplied by philosophy, though philosophy discerns the teleological pattern which works itself out in this material. At the same time the whole dialectical movement of the Hegelian system should, in theory at least, impose itself on the mind by its own inner necessity. Otherwise the system could hardly be, as Hegel claims that it is, its own justification. Yet it is clear that Hegel comes to philosophy with certain basic convictions, that the rational is the real and the real the rational, that reality is the self-manifestation of infinite reason, and that infinite reason is self-thinking thought which actualizes itself in the historical process. 
True, it is Hegel's contention that the truth of these convictions is demonstrated in the system. But it is arguable that the system really depends upon them, and that this is one of the main reasons why those who do not share, or at least are not sympathetically disposed towards, Hegel's initial convictions are not much impressed by what we may call his empirical confirmation of his general metaphysical scheme. For it seems to them that his interpretations of the material are governed by a preconceived scheme, and that even if the system is a remarkable intellectual tour de force, it demonstrates at best only on what lines we must interpret the various aspects of reality if we have already made up our minds that reality as a whole is of a certain nature. This criticism would indeed be invalidated if the system really showed that Hegel's interpretation of the process of reality was the only interpretation which satisfied the demands of reason. But it may well be doubted whether this can be shown without giving to the word reason a meaning which would beg the whole question. One might perhaps neglect or pass over Hegel's theory of the necessity inherent in the dialectical development of the system and view his philosophy simply as one of the possible ways of satisfying the mind's impulse to obtain conceptual master over the whole wealth of empirical data or to interpret the world as a whole and man's relation to it. And we could then compare it with other large-scale interpretations or visions of the universe and try to find criteria for judging between them. But though this procedure may seem eminently reasonable to many people, it does not square with Hegel's own estimation of his own philosophy. For even if he did not think that his presentation of the system of philosophy was the whole truth in its final form, he certainly thought that it represented the highest stage which the Absolute's developing knowledge of itself had reached up to date. This may seem to be an extremely bizarre notion. But we have to bear in mind Hegel's view of the Absolute as identity indifference. The infinite exists in and through the finite, and infinite reason or spirit knows itself in and through the finite spirit or mind. But it is not every sort of thinking by the finite mind which can be said to form a moment in the developing self-knowledge of the infinite Absolute. It is man's knowledge of the Absolute which is the Absolute's knowledge of itself. Yet we cannot say of any finite mind's knowledge of the Absolute that it is identical with the Absolute's knowledge of itself. For the latter transcends any given finite mind or set of finite minds. Plato and Aristotle, for example, are dead. But according to Hegel's interpretation of the history of philosophy the essential elements in their respective apprehensions of reality were taken up into and persist in the total dialectical movement of philosophy through the centuries. And it is this developing movement which is the Absolute's developing knowledge of itself. It does not exist apart from all finite minds, but it is obviously not confined to any given mind or set of minds. 1.5. We can speak, therefore, of the human mind rising to a participation in the self-knowledge of the Absolute. Some writers have interpreted Hegel on more or less theistic lines. That is to say, they have understood him to mean that God is perfectly luminous to himself quite independently of man, though man is capable of participating in the self-knowledge. But I have interpreted him here as meaning that man's knowledge of the Absolute and the Absolute's knowledge of itself are two aspects of the same reality. Even, however, on this interpretation we can still speak of the finite mind rising to a participation in the divine self-knowledge. For, as we have seen, it is not every sort of idea and thought in man's mind which can be regarded as a moment in the absolute self-knowledge. It is not every level of consciousness which is a participation in the divine self-consciousness. To achieve this participation the finite mind has to rise to the level of what Hegel calls absolute knowledge. In this case it is possible to trace the successive stages of consciousness from the lowest to the highest levels. And this is what Hegel does in the Phenomenology of Spirit, which can be described as a history of consciousness. If we consider the mind and its activity in themselves, without relation to an object, we are concerned with psychology. If, however, we consider mind as essentially related to an object, external or internal, we are concerned with consciousness. And phenomenology is the science of consciousness in this sense. Hegel begins with the natural unscientific consciousness and proceeds to trace the dialectical development of this consciousness, showing how the lower levels are subsumed in the higher according to a more adequate point of view, until we reach the level of absolute knowledge. 
in a certain sense the phenomenology can be regarded as an introduction to philosophy. That is to say, it systematically traces the development of consciousness up to the level of what we might call the properly philosophical consciousness. But it is certainly not an introduction to philosophy in the sense of being an external preparation for philosophizing. Hegel did not believe that an introduction in this sense was possible. And in any case the work is itself an outstanding example of sustained philosophical reflection. It is, we may say, the philosophical consciousness reflecting on the phenomenology of its own genesis. Moreover, even if the work is in some sense an introduction to the point of view required by the Hegelian system, there is an overlapping. The system itself finds a place for the phenomenology of consciousness, and the phenomenology contains an outline of a certain amount of material which is later treated by Hegel at greater length. The religious consciousness is a case in point. Lastly, by no stretch of the imagination can the phenomenology be described as an introduction to philosophy in the sense of a work of philosophy without tears. On the contrary, it is a profound work and often extremely difficult to understand. The phenomenology falls into three main parts, corresponding with the three main phases of consciousness. The first of these phases is consciousness of the object as a sensible thing standing over against the subject. And it is to this phase that Hegel appropriates the name consciousness, Bewusstsein. The second phase is that of self-consciousness, Selbstbewusstsein. And here Hegel has a lot to say about social consciousness. The third phase is that of reason, Vernunfeit, which is represented as the synthesis or unity of the preceding phases on a higher level. In other words, reason is the synthesis of objectivity and subjectivity. Needless to say, each of these main divisions of the work has its subdivisions. And Hegel's general procedure is first to describe the spontaneous attitude of consciousness at a given level and then to institute an analysis of it. The result of the analysis is that the mind is compelled to proceed to the next level, considered as a more adequate attitude or point of view. Hegel begins with what he calls sense certainty, the uncritical apprehension by the senses of particular objects, which to the naive consciousness appears to be not only the most certain and basic form of knowledge but also the richest. Analysis, he argues, shows that it is in fact a peculiarly empty and abstract form of knowledge. The naive consciousness feels certain that it is directly acquainted through sense apprehension with a particular thing. But when we try to say what it is that we know, that is, to describe the particular object with which we claim to be immediately acquainted, we find that we can describe it only in universal terms which are applicable to other things as well. We can, of course, attempt to pin the object down, as it were, by using words such as this, here, and now, accompanying them perhaps with an ostensive gesture. But a moment later the same words apply to another object. Indeed, it is impossible, Hegel argues, to give even to words like this a genuinely particular significance, however much we may wish and try to do so. We might wish to say that Hegel is simply calling attention to a feature of language. And he is, of course, perfectly well aware that he is saying something about language. But his main concern is epistemological. He wishes to show that the claim of sense certainty to be knowledge par excellence is a bogus claim. And he draws the conclusion that this level of consciousness, on the path towards becoming genuine knowledge, must pass into the level of perception for Ulyich the object is a thing conceived as the center of distinct properties and qualities. But analysis of this level of consciousness shows that it is not possible, as long as we remain simply on the level of sense, to reconcile in any satisfactory manner the elements of unity and multiplicity which are postulated by this view of the object. And the mind passes, therefore, by various stages to the level of scientific understanding which invokes metaphenomenal or unobservable entities to explain sense phenomena. For instance, the mind sees sense phenomena as the manifestations of hidden forces. But, Hegel maintains, the mind cannot rest here and proceeds instead to the idea of laws. Yet natural laws are ways of ordering and describing phenomena, they are not explicative. Hence they cannot perform the function for which they have been invoked, namely to explain sense phenomena. 
Hegel obviously does not mean to deny that the concept of natural laws has a useful function to perform at the appropriate level. But it does not give the sort of knowledge which, in his opinion, the mind is seeking. In the end the mind sees that the whole realm of the meta phenomenal which has been invoked to explain sense phenomena is the product of the understanding itself. Consciousness is thus turned back on itself as the reality behind the veil of phenomena and becomes self-consciousness. Hegel begins with self-consciousness in the form of desire, begeared. The self is still concerned with the external object, but it is characteristic of the attitude of desire that the self subordinates the object to itself, seeking to make it minister to its satisfaction, to appropriate it, even to consume it. And this attitude can be shown, of course, in regard to living and non-living things. But when the self is confronted with another self, this attitude breaks down. For the presence of the other is for Hegel essential to self-consciousness. Developed self-consciousness can arise only when the self recognizes selfhood in itself and others. It must take the form, therefore, of a truly social or we consciousness, the recognition at the level of self-consciousness of identity and difference. But in the dialectical evolution of this phase of consciousness developed self-consciousness is not attained immediately. And Hegel's study of the successive stages forms one of the most interesting and influential parts of the phenomenology. The existence of another self is, we have mentioned, a condition of self-consciousness. But the first spontaneous reaction of a self confronted with another self is to assert its own existence as a self in face of the other. The one self desires to cancel out or annihilate the other self as a means to the triumphant assertion of its own selfhood. But a literal destruction would defeat its own purpose. For consciousness of one's own selfhood demands as a condition the recognition of the selfhood by another self. There thus arises the master-slave relationship. The master is the one who succeeds in obtaining recognition from the other, in the sense that he imposes himself as the other's value. The slave is the one who sees his own true self in the other. Paradoxically, however, the original situation changes. And it must do so because of the contradictions concealed in it. On the one hand, by not recognizing the slave as a real person the master deprives himself of that recognition of his own freedom which he originally demanded and which is required for the development of self-consciousness. He thus debases himself to an infrahuman condition. On the other hand, by carrying out his master's will the slave objectifies himself through labor which transforms material things. He thus forms himself and rises to the level of true existence. 1. It is obvious that the concept of the master-slave relationship has two aspects. It can be considered as a stage in the abstract dialectical development of consciousness. And it can also be considered in relation to history. But the two aspects are by no means incompatible. For human history itself reveals the development of spirit, the travail of the spirit on the way to its goal. Hence we need not be surprised if from the master-slave relationship in its primary form Hegel passes to an attitude or state of consciousness to which he gives a name with explicit historical associations, namely the Stoic consciousness. In the Stoic consciousness the contradictions inherent in the slave relationship are not really overcome, they acts overcome only to the extent that both master, typified by Marcus Aurelius, and slave, typified by Epictetus, take flight into inferiority and exalt the idea of true interior freedom, internal self-sufficiency, leaving concrete relationships unchanged. Hence, according to Hegel, this negative attitude towards the concrete and external passes easily into the sceptical consciousness for which the self alone abides while all else is subjected to doubt and negation. But the sceptical consciousness contains an implicit contradiction. For it is impossible for the sceptic to eliminate the natural consciousness, and affirmation and negation coexist in the same attitude. And when this contradiction becomes explicit, as it must do, we pass to what Hegel calls the unhappy consciousness, das ungleichlich bewusstsein, which is a divided consciousness. At this level the master-slave relationship, which has not been successfully overcome by either the stoic or the sceptical consciousness, returns in another form. 
In the master-slave relationship proper the elements of true self-consciousness, recognition of selfhood and freedom both in oneself and in the other, were divided between two individual consciousnesses. The master recognized selfhood and freedom only in himself, not in the slave, while the slave recognized them only in the master, not in himself. In the so-called unhappy consciousness, however, the division occurs in the same self. For example, the self is conscious of a gulf between a changing, inconsistent, fickle self and a changeless, ideal self. The first appears as in some sense a false self, something to be denied, while the second appears as the true self which is not yet attained. And this ideal self can be projected into an otherworldly sphere and identified with absolute perfection, God considered as existing apart from the world and the finite self. One the human consciousness is then divided, self-alienated, unhappy. The contradictions or divisions implicit in self-consciousness are overcome in the third phase of the phenomenology when the finite subject rises to universal self-consciousness. At this level self-consciousness no longer takes the form of the one-sided awareness of oneself as an individual subject threatened by and in conflict with other self-conscious beings. Rather is there a full recognition of selfhood in oneself and in others, and this recognition is at least an implicit awareness of the life of the universal, the infinite spirit, in and through finite selves, binding them together yet not annulling them. Present implicitly and imperfectly in the developed moral consciousness, for which the one rational will expresses itself in a multiplicity of concrete moral vocations in the social order, this awareness of the identity indifference which is characteristic of the life of the spirit attains a higher and more explicit expression in the developed religious consciousness, for which the one divine life is imminent in all selves, bearing them in itself while yet maintaining their distinctness. In the idea of a living union with God the division within the unhappy or divided consciousness is overcome. The true self is no longer conceived as an ideal from which the actual self is hopelessly alienated, but rather as the living core, so to speak, of the actual self, which expresses itself in and through its finite manifestations. This third phase of the phenomenological history of consciousness, to which, as we have seen, Hegel gives the general name of reason, is represented as the synthesis of consciousness and self-consciousness, that is, of the first two phases. In consciousness in the narrow sense, Bios sane, the subject is aware of the sensible object as something external and heterogeneous to itself. In self-consciousness, selbst bewusst sein, the subject's attention is turned back on itself as a finite self. At the level of reason it sees nature as the objective expression of infinite spirit with which it is itself united. But this awareness can take different forms. In the developed religious consciousness the subject sees nature as the creation and self-manifestation of God, with whom it is united in the depth of its being and through whom it is united with other selves. And this religious vision of reality is true. But at the level of the religious consciousness truth finds expression in the form of figurative or pictorial thought, Vorstellian, whereas at the supreme level of absolute knowledge, Das Absolute Wissen, the same truth is reflectively apprehended in philosophical form. The finite subject is explicitly aware of its inmost self as a moment in the life of the infinite and universal spirit, as a moment in absolute thought. And, as such, it sees nature as its own objectification and as the precondition of its own life as actually existing spirit. This does not mean, of course, that the finite subject considered precisely as such sees nature as its own product. Rather does it mean that the finite subject, aware of itself as more than finite, as a moment in the innermost life of absolute spirit, sees nature as a necessary stage in the onward march of spirit in its process of self-actualization. In other words, absolute knowledge is the level at which the finite subject participates in the life of self-thinking thought, the absolute. Or, to put the matter in another way, it is the level at which the absolute, the totality, thinks itself as identity indifference in and through the finite mind of the philosopher. As in the previous main phases of the phenomenology of consciousness Hegel develops the third phase, that of reason, through a series of dialectical stages. 
he treats first of observing reason which is seen as obtaining some glimpse at any rate of its own reflection in nature, through the idea of finality, for example, then as turning inwards in the study of formal logic and of empirical psychology, and finally as manifesting itself in a series of practical ethical attitudes, ranging from the pursuit of happiness up to that criticism of the universal moral laws dictated by the practical reason which follows from recognition of the fact that a universal law stands in need of so many qualifications that it tends to lose all definite meaning. This sets the stage for the transition to concrete moral life in society. Here Hegel moves from the unreflective ethical life in which human beings simply follow the customs and traditions of their community to the form of culture in which individuals are estranged from this unreflective background and pass judgments about it. The two moments are synthesized in the developed moral consciousness for which the rational general will is not something over and above individuals in society but a common life binding them together as free persons. In the first moment, we can say, spirit is unreflective, as in the ancient Greek morality before the time of the so-called sophists. In the second moment spirit is reflective but at the same time estranged from actual society and its traditions, on which it passes judgment. In the extreme case, as in the Jacobin terror, it annihilates actual persons in the name of abstract freedom. In the third moment, however, spirit is said to be ethically sure of itself. It takes the form of a community of free persons embodying the general will as a living unity. This living unity, however, in which each member of the community is for the others a free self demands an explicit recognition of the idea of identity indifference, of a life which is present in all as their inner bond of unity though it does not annihilate them as individuals. It demands, that is to say, an explicit recognition of the idea of the concrete universal which differentiates itself into or manifests itself in its particulars while uniting them within itself. In other words, morality passes dialectically into religion, the moral into the religious consciousness, for which this living unity is explicitly recognized in the form of God. In religion, therefore, we see absolute spirit becoming explicitly conscious of itself. But religion, of course, has its history, and in this history we see earlier phases of the dialectic being repeated. Thus Hegel moves from what he calls natural religion, in which the divine is seen under the form of perceptual objects or of nature, to the religion of art or of beauty, in which, as in Greek religion, the divine is seen as the self-conscious associated with the physical. The statue, for example, represents the anthropomorphic deity. Finally, in the absolute religion, Christianity, absolute spirit is recognized for what it is, namely spirit, nature is seen as a divine creation, the expression of the word, and the Holy Spirit is seen as imminent in and uniting together finite selves. But the religious consciousness expresses itself, as we have seen, in pictorial forms. And it demands to be transmuted into the pure conceptual form of philosophy which at the same time expresses the transition from faith to knowledge or science. That is to say, the pictorial idea of the transcendent personal deity who saves man by a unique incarnation and the power of grace passes into the concept of absolute spirit, the infinite self-thinking thought which knows itself in nature, as its objectification and as the condition for its own actualization, and recognizes in the history of human culture, with its successive forms and levels, its own odyssey. Hegel is not saying that religion is untrue. On the contrary, the absolute religion, Christianity, is the absolute truth. But it is expressed in the imaginative or pictorial form which is correlative to the religious consciousness. In philosophy this truth becomes absolute knowledge which is spirit knowing itself in the form of spirit one the absolute, the totality, comes to know itself in and through the human spirit, in so far, that is to say, as the human spirit rises above its finitude and identifies itself with pure thought. God cannot be equated with man. For God is being, the totality, and man is not. But the totality comes actually to know itself in and through the spirit of man, on the level of pictorial thought in the evolution of the religious consciousness, 
on the level of science or pure conceptual knowledge in the history of philosophy which has as its ideal term the complete truth about reality in the form of the absolute's knowledge of itself. In the phenomenology, therefore, Hegel starts with the lowest levels of human consciousness and works dialectically upwards to the level at which the human mind attains the absolute point of view and becomes the vehicle, as it were, of infinite self-conscious spirit. The connections between one level and the next are often very loose, logically speaking. And some of the stages are obviously suggested not so much by the demands of a dialectical development as by Hegel's reflections on the spirits and attitudes of different cultural phases and epochs. Further, some of the topics of which Hegel treats strike the modem reader as somewhat odd. There is, for example, a critical treatment of phrenology. At the same time, as a study of the odyssey of the human spirit, of the movement from one attitude or outlook, which proves to be one-sided and inadequate, to another, the work is both impressive and fascinating. And the correlations between stages of the dialectic of consciousness and historically manifested attitudes, the spirit of the enlightenment, the romantic spirit, and so on, add to its interest. One may be suspicious of Hegel's summaries and interpretations of the spirits of epochs and cultures, and his exaltation of philosophical knowledge may strike one as having a comical aspect, but in spite of all reservations and disagreements the reader who really tries to penetrate into Hegel's thought can hardly come to any other conclusion than that the phenomenology is one of the great works of speculative philosophy. The logic of Hegel the ontological slice of the idea or absolute in itself and the transition to nature the philosophy of nature the absolute as spirit, subjective spirit the concept of right morality the family and civil society the state explanatory comments on Hegel's idea of political philosophy the function of war philosophy of history some comments on Hegel's philosophy of history. I. As we have seen, Hegel rejected the view, advanced by Schelling in his so-called system of identity, that the absolute in itself is for conceptual thought the vanishing point of all differences, an absolute self-identity which cannot properly be described except in negative terms and which can be positively apprehended only, if at all, in mystical intuition. Hegel was convinced that the speculative reason can penetrate the inner essence of the absolute, the essence which manifests itself in nature and in the history of the human spirit. The part of philosophy which is concerned with laying bare the inner essence of the absolute is for Hegel logic. To anyone who is accustomed to regard logic as a purely formal science, entirely dissociated from metaphysics, this must seem an extraordinary and even absurd point of view. But we have to bear in mind the fact that for Hegel the absolute is pure thought. This thought can be considered in itself, apart from its extimalization or self-manifestation and the science of pure thought in itself is logic. Further, inasmuch as pure thought is the substance, as it were, of reality, logic necessarily coincides with metaphysics, that is, with metaphysics as concerned with the absolute in itself. The matter can be made clearer by relating Hegel's conception of logic to Kant's view of transcendental logic. In the philosophy of Kant the categories which give shape and form to phenomena are a priori categories of human thought. The human mind does not create things in themselves, but it determines the basic character of the phenomenal world, the world of appearance. On Kant's premises, therefore, we have no warrant for assuming that the categories of the human mind apply to reality in itself, their cognitive function is limited to the phenomenal world. But, as was explained in the introductory chapter, with the elimination of the unknowable thing in itself and the transformation of the critical philosophy into pure idealism the categories become the categories of creative thought in the full sense. And if a subjectivist position, threatening to lead to solipsism, is to be avoided, creative thought must be interpreted as absolute thought. The categories, therefore, become the categories of absolute thought, the categories of reality and logic, which studies them, becomes metaphysics. It discloses the essence or nature of the absolute thought which manifests itself in nature and history. Now, Hegel speaks of the absolute in itself as God in himself. The subject matter of logic is the truth as it is without husk and for itself. 
one can therefore express the matter by saying that its content is the presentation of God as he is in his eternal essence before the creation of nature and of a finite spirit one and this manner of speaking tends to suggest the very odd picture of the logician penetrating the inner essence of a transcendent deity and describing it in terms of a system of categories. But Hegel's use of religious language can be misleading. We have to remember that though his absolute is certainly transcendent in the sense that it cannot be identified with any particular finite entity or set of entities, it is not transcendent in the sense in which the God of Christianity is said to transcend the created universe. Hegel's absolute is the totality, and this totality is depicted as coming to know itself in and through the finite spirit, in so far as the finite spirit attains the level of absolute knowledge. Logic, therefore, is the Absolute's knowledge of itself in itself, in abstraction from its concrete self-manifestation in nature and history. That is to say, logic is Absolute Thought's knowledge of its own essence, the essence which exists concretely in the process of reality. If we use the word category in a somewhat wider sense than that in which it is used by Hegel himself, we can say, therefore, that his logic is the system of categories. But if we say this, it is essential to understand that the whole system of categories is a progressive definition of the absolute in itself. Hegel starts with the concept of being because it is for him the most indeterminate and the logically prior concept. And he then proceeds to show how this concept passes necessarily into successive concepts until we reach the absolute idea, the concept or category of self-knowledge or self-consciousness, self-thinking thought. But the absolute is not, of course, a string or chain of categories or concepts. If we ask what the absolute is, we can answer that it is being. And if we ask what being is, we shall in the end be forced to answer that being is self-thinking thought or spirit. The process of showing that this is the case, as worked out by the logician, is obviously a temporal process. But the absolute in itself does not, to put the matter crudely, start as being at seven in the morning and end as self-thinking thought at seven in the evening. To say that the absolute is being is to say that it is self-thinking thought. But the logician's demonstration of the fact, his systematic dialectical elucidation of the meaning of being, is a temporal process. It is his business to show that the whole system of categories turns in on itself, so to speak. The beginning is the end, and the end is the beginning. That is to say, the first category or concept contains all the others implicitly, and the last is the final explicitation of the first, it gives its true meaning. The point is easily understood if we employ the religious or theological language which Hegel not infrequently uses. God is being, he is also self-thinking thought. But the word also is really inappropriate. For to say that God is being is to say that he is self-thinking thought. The systematic exhibition of this fact by the philosopher is a temporal process. But this temporality obviously does not affect the divine essence in itself. There is, of course, a great difference between Hegel's absolute and the God of Christian theology. But though Hegel's absolute is said to be the process of its own becoming, we are not concerned in logic with this actual process, the actualization of the logos, we are concerned with the absolute in itself, with the logical idea. And this is not a temporal process. The dialectical movement of Hegel's logic can be illustrated by means of the first three categories. The logically prior concept of the absolute is the concept of being. But the concept or category of pure being, reigns sen, is wholly indeterminate. And the concept of wholly indeterminate being passes into the concept of not being. That is to say, if we try to think being without any determination at all, we find that we are thinking nothing. The mind passes from being to not being and from not being back to being, it can rest in neither, and each disappears, as it were, in its opposite. Their truth is thus this movement of the immediate. Disappearing of the one into the other one and this movement from being to not being and from not being to being is becoming. Becoming is thus the synthesis of being and not being, it is their unity and truth. Being must therefore be conceived as becoming. In other words, the concept of the absolute as being is the concept of the absolute as becoming, as a process of self-development. 
2. According to our ordinary way of looking at things a contradiction brings us to a full stop. Being and not being are mutually exclusive. But we think in this way because we conceive being as determinate being and not being as the not being of this determination. Pure being, however, is for Hegel indeterminate, empty, or vacuous, and it is for this reason that it is said to pass into its opposite. But contradiction is for Hegel a positive force which reveals both thesis and antithesis as abstract moments in a higher unity or synthesis. And this unity of the concepts of being and not being is the concept of becoming. But the unity gives rise in turn to a contradiction, so that the mind is driven onwards in its search for the meaning of being, for the nature or essence of the absolute in itself. Being not being or nothing and becoming form the first triad of the first part of Hegel's logic, the so-called logic of being, die logic descends. This part is concerned with the categories of being in itself, as distinct from the categories of relation. And the three main classes of categories in this part of logic are those of quality, which include the above-mentioned triad, quantity, and measure. Measure is described as the synthesis of quality and quantity for it is the concept of a specific quantum determined by the nature of the object, that is, by its quality. In the second main part of the logic, the logic of essence, die logic de wessens, Hegel deduces pairs of related categories, such as essence and existence, force and expression, substance and accident, cause and effect, action and reaction. These categories are called categories of reflection because they correspond with the reflective consciousness which penetrates beneath the surface, as it were, of being in its immediacy. Essence, for example, is conceived as lying behind appearance, and force is conceived as the reality displayed in its expression. In other words, for the reflective consciousness being in itself undergoes self diremption breaking up into related categories. But the logic of essence does not leave us with the division of being into inner essence and outward phenomenal existence. For the last main subdivision is devoted to the category of actuality, die Werklichkeit, which is described as the unity of essence and existence. One that is to say, the actual is the inner essence which exists, the force which has found complete expression. If we identify being with appearance, with its external manifestation, this is a one-sided abstraction. But so is the identification of being with a hidden essence underlying appearance. Being as actuality is the unity of the inner and the outer, it is essence manifesting itself. And it must manifest itself. It is under the general heading of the category of actuality that Hegel deduces the categories of substance and accident, cause and effect, and action, and reaction or reciprocal action. And as we have said that his logic is a progressive definition or determination of the nature of the absolute in itself, the impression may be given that for him there is only one substance and one cause, namely the absolute. In other words the impression may be given that Hegel embraces Spinozism. But this would be an incorrect interpretation of his meaning. The deduction of the categories of substance and cause is not intended to imply, for example, that there can be no such thing as a finite cause. For the absolute as actuality is essence manifesting itself, and the manifestation is the universe as we know it. The absolute is not simply the one. It is the one, but it is also the many, it is identity in difference. From the logic of essence Hegel passes to the logic of the concept, die logic de begriffs, which is the third main part of his work. In the logic of being each category is at first sight independent, standing on its own feet, as it were, even if the dialectical movement of thought breaks down this apparent self-containedness. In the logic of essence we are concerned with obviously related categories, such as cause and effect or substance and accident. We are thus in the sphere of mediation. But each member of a pair of related categories is conceived as mediated by another, that is, by something different from itself. The cause, for example, is constituted as a cause by passing into its opposite, namely the effect, which is conceived as something different from the cause. Similarly, the effect is constituted as an effect by its relation to something different from itself, namely the cause. 
the synthesis of the spheres of immediacy and of mediation by another will be the sphere of self-mediation. A being is said to be self-mediating when it is conceived as passing into its opposite and yet as remaining identical with itself even in the self-opposition. And the self-mediating is what Hegel calls the concept or the notion. One needless to say, the logic of the notion has three main subdivisions. In the first Hegel considers the notion as subjectivity, as thought in its formal aspects. And this part corresponds more or less with logic in the ordinary sense. Hegel tries to show how the general idea of being going out from itself and then returning to itself at a higher level is verified in a formal manner in the movement of logical thought. Thus the unity of the universal concept is divided in the judgment and is re-established at a higher level in the syllogism. Having considered the notion as subjectivity, Hegel goes on to consider it as objectivity. And as in the first phase or part of the logic of the notion he finds three moments, the universal concept, the judgment, and syllogistic inference, so in this second phase or part he finds three moments, namely mechanism, chemism, and teleology. He thus anticipates the main ideas of the philosophy of nature. But he is concerned here with the thought or concept of the objective rather than with nature considered as an empirically given existing reality. The nature of the absolute is such that it comprises the concept of self-objectification. Given the character of the Hegelian dialectic, the third phase of the logic of the notion will obviously be the synthesis or unity on a higher plane of subjectivity and objectivity. As such the notion is called the idea. In the idea the one-sided factors of the formal and the material, the subjective and the objective, are brought together. But the idea too has its phases or moments. And in the final subdivision of the logic of the notion Hegel considers in turn life, knowledge, and their unity in the absolute idea which is, as it were, the union of subjectivity and objectivity enriched with rational life. In other words, the absolute idea is the concept or category of self-consciousness, personality, self-thinking thought which knows itself in its object and its object as itself. It is thus the category of spirit. In religious language, it is the concept of God in and for himself, knowing himself as the totality. After a long dialectical wandering, therefore, being has at length revealed itself as the absolute idea, as self-thinking thought. The absolute is being, and the meaning of this statement has now been made explicit. The absolute idea alone is being, eternal life, self-knowing truth, and it is all truth. It is the one subject matter and content of philosophy one Hegel does not mean, of course, that the logical idea, considered precisely as such, is the one subject matter of philosophy. But philosophy is concerned with reality as a whole, with the absolute. And reality, in the sense of nature and the sphere of the human spirit, is the process by which the logical idea or logos actualizes itself. Hence philosophy is always concerned with the idea. 2. Now, if we speak of the logical idea or logos as manifesting or expressing itself in nature and in the sphere of the human spirit, we are obviously faced with the question, what is the ontological status of the logical idea or the absolute in itself? Is it a reality which exists independently of the world and which manifests itself in the world, or is it not? If it is, how can there be a subsistent idea? If it is not, how can we speak of the idea as manifesting or actualizing itself? At the end of the logic in the Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences II Hegel asserts that the idea in its absolute freedom resolves to let its moment of particularity the immediate idea as its reflected image, go forth freely out of itself as nature. 3. In this passage therefore, Hegel seems to imply not only that nature is ontologically derived from the idea but also that the idea freely posits nature. And if this implication were taken literally, we should clearly have to interpret the idea as a name for the personal creative deity. For it would be preposterous to speak of an idea in any other sense as resolving to do something. But consideration of the Hegelian system as a whole suggests that this passage represents an intrusion, as it were, of the way of speaking which is characteristic of the Christian religious consciousness, and that its implications should not be pressed. 
it seems to be clear enough that according to Hegel the doctrine of free creation by God belongs to the figurative or pictorial language of the religious consciousness. It expresses indeed a truth, but it does not do so in the idiom of pure philosophy. From the strictly philosophical point of view the absolute in itself manifests itself necessarily in nature. Obviously, it is not constrained to do so by anything external to itself. The necessity is an inner necessity of nature. The only freedom in the logo self-manifestation is the freedom of spontaneity. And from this it follows that from the philosophical point of view there is no sense in speaking of the absolute in itself as existing before creation. If nature is derived ontologically from the idea, the latter is not temporally prior to the former. One further, though some writers have interpreted Hegel in a theistic sense, as holding, that is to say, that the absolute in itself is a personal being, existing independently of nature and of the sphere of the human spirit, it does not seem to me that this interpretation is correct. True, there are passages which can be cited in support of it. But these passages can equally well be interpreted as expressions of the religious consciousness, as pictorial or figurative statements of the truth. And the nature of the system as a whole clearly suggests that the Absolute attains actual self-consciousness only in and through the human spirit. As has already been explained, this does not mean that human consciousness can be identified without more ado with the divine self-consciousness. For the Absolute is said to know itself in and through the human mind in so far as this mind rises above mere finitude and particularity and reaches the level of Absolute knowledge. But the point is that if the Absolute becomes actually existent only in and through the human spirit, the Absolute in itself, the logical idea, cannot properly be said to resolve to posit nature, which is the objective precondition for the existence of the sphere of spirit. If such language is used, it is a concession, as it were, to the mode of thought which is characteristic of the religious consciousness. If, however, we exclude the theistic interpretation of the absolute in itself, to how are we to conceive the transition from the logical idea to nature? If we conceive it as a real ontological transition, that is to say, if we conceive a subsistent idea as manifesting itself necessarily in nature, we are obviously attributing to Hegel a thesis which, to put it mildly, is somewhat odd. We expose him at once to the criticism made by Schelling in his polemic against negative philosophy, that from ideas we can deduce only other ideas, and that it is quite impossible to deduce an existing world from an idea. It is understandable, therefore, that some writers have endeavored to exclude altogether the concept of an ontological derivation of nature from the idea. The absolute is the totality, the universe. And this totality is a teleological process, the actualization of self-thinking thought. The essential nature of this process can be considered in abstraction. It then takes the form of the logical idea. But it does not exist as a subsistent reality which is logically prior to nature and which is the efficient cause of nature. The idea reflects the goal or result of the process rather than a subsistent reality which stands at its beginning. Hence there is no question of an ontological derivation of nature from the logical idea as efficient cause. And the so-called deduction of nature from the idea is really an exhibition of the fact, or alleged fact, that nature is a necessary precondition for the realization of the goal of the total process of reality, the universe's knowledge of itself in and through the human spirit. It seems to the present writer that the foregoing line of interpretation must be accepted in so far as it denies the separate existence of the logical idea as a reality quite distinct from the world or as an external efficient cause of the world. For Hegel the infinite exists in and through the finite, the universal lives and has its being, as it were, in and through the particulars. Hence there is no room in his system for an efficient cause which transcends the world in the sense that it exists quite independently of it. At the same time, even though the infinite exists in and through the finite, it is obvious that finite things arise and perish. They are, so to speak, transitory manifestations of an infinite life. And Hegel certainly tends to speak of the logos as though it were pulsating life, dynamic reason, or thought. It exists, it is true, only in and through its manifestations. But inasmuch as it is a continuous life, 
being actualizing itself as what it potentially is, namely spirit, it is quite natural to look on the passing manifestations as ontologically dependent on the one immanent life, as an outside in relation to an inside. And Hegel can thus speak of the Logos spontaneously expressing itself in or going over into nature. For being, the absolute, the infinite totality, is not a mere collection of finite things, but one infinite life, self-actualizing spirit. It is the universal of universals, and even though it exists only in and through the particulars, it itself persists whereas the particulars do not. Hence it is perfectly reasonable to speak of the Logos as expressing or manifesting itself in finite things. And inasmuch as it is absolute spirit which comes to exist as such through the process of its own self-development, material nature is naturally conceived as its opposite, the opposite which is a precondition for the attainment of the end or telos of the process. This line of interpretation may seem to be an attempt to have things both ways. On the one hand it is admitted that the logical idea does not exist as a subsistent reality which creates nature from outside, as it were. On the other hand, it is claimed that the logical idea, in the sense of the essential structure or meaning of being as grasped by the metaphysician, represents a metaphysical reality which, though it exists only in and through its self-manifestation, is in a certain sense logically prior to its manifestation. But I do not think that we can exclude metaphysics from Hegelianism or eliminate altogether a certain element of transcendence. The attempt to do this seems to me to make nonsense of Hegel's doctrine of the infinite absolute. The absolute is indeed the totality, the universe, considered as the process of its own self-development, but in my opinion we cannot escape making a distinction between inner and outer, between, that is to say, the one infinite life, self-actualizing spirit, and the finite manifestations in and through which it lives and has its being. And in this case we can equally well say that the finite manifestations derive their reality from the one life which expresses itself in them. If there is a certain element of ambiguity in Hegel's position, this is scarcely surprising. For if there were no such element, his philosophy would hardly have given rise to divergent interpretations. 3. Nature, says Hegel, is in itself, in the idea, divine. But as it exists, its being does not correspond with its concept one in the language of religion, the idea of nature in the divine mind is divine, but the objectification of this idea in existing nature cannot be called divine. For the fact that the idea is expressed in the material world, in that which is most unlike God, means that it is only inadequately expressed. God cannot be adequately manifested in the material world. In the language of philosophy, the Absolute is defined as spirit. Hence it can manifest itself adequately. Only in the sphere of spirit. Nature is a precondition of the existence of this sphere, but it is not in itself spirit, though in its rational structure it bears the imprint of spirit. One might say with Schelling that it is slumbering spirit or visible spirit, but it is not spirit proper, spirit as awoken to consciousness of itself. Spirit is freedom, nature is the sphere of necessity rather than of freedom. It is also the sphere of contingency, zufalikite. For example, it does not exhibit in any uniformly clear-cut way the distinctions postulated by a purely rational pattern. There are, for instance, monsters in nature which do not conform clearly to any one specific type. And there are even natural species which seem to be due to a kind of bacchic dance or revel on nature's part, and not to any rational necessity. Nature appears to run riot as much in the wealth of forms which she produces as in the number of individual members of given species. They elude all logical deduction. Obviously, an empirical explanation of any natural object can be given in terms of physical causality. But to give an empirical explanation in terms of physical causality is not the same thing as to give a logical deduction. Obviously, nature cannot exist without particular things. Immanent teleology, for instance, cannot exist without particular organisms. The universal exists only in and through its particulars. But it does not follow that any given individual is logically deducible from the concept of its specific type or from any more general concept. 
it is not simply a question of its being very difficult or practically impossible for the finite mind to deduce particulars which could in principle be deduced by an infinite mind. For Hegel seems to say that particular objects in nature are not deducible even in principle, even though they are physically explicable. To put the matter somewhat paradoxically, contingency in nature is necessary. For without it there could be no nature. But contingency is nonetheless real, in the sense that it is a factor in nature which the philosopher is unable to eliminate. And Hegel ascribes it to the impotence of nature one to remain faithful to the determination of the notion. He is speaking here about the way in which nature mixes specific types, producing intermediate forms. But the main point is that contingency is ascribed to the impotence of nature itself and not to the finite mind's incapability of giving a purely rational account of nature. Whether on his principles Hegel ought to have admitted contingency in nature is disputable, but the fact that he did so is not open to doubt. And this is why he sometimes speaks of nature as a fall, abfall, from the idea. In other words, contingency represents the externality of nature in relation to the idea. And it follows that nature is not to be deified. One indeed, it is a mistake, Hegel says, to regard natural phenomena such as the heavenly bodies as works of God in a higher sense than the creations of the human spirit, such as works of art or the state. Hegel certainly followed Schelling in attributing to nature a status which it did not enjoy in the philosophy of Fichte. At the same time he shows no inclination to share the romantic divinization of nature. But though Hegel rejects any deification of existing nature, the fact remains that if nature is real it must be a moment in the life of the Absolute. For the Absolute is the totality. Hegel is thus placed in a difficult position. On the one hand he has no wish to deny that there is an objective nature. Indeed, it is essential to his system to maintain that there is. For the Absolute is the identity and difference of subjectivity and objectivity. And if there is real subjectivity, there must be real objectivity. On the other hand it is not easy for him to explain how contingency can have any place in a system of absolute idealism. And it is understandable if we can discern a marked tendency to adopt a platonic position by distinguishing between the inside, as it were, of nature, its rational structure or reflection of the idea, and its outside, its contingent aspect, and by relegating the latter to the sphere of the irrational and unreal. There must indeed be an objective nature. For the idea must take the form of objectivity. And there cannot be an objective nature without contingency. But the philosopher cannot cope with this element, beyond registering the fact that it is there and must be there. And what Professor Hegel cannot cope with he tends to dismiss as irrational and so as unreal. For the rational is the real and the real the rational. Obviously, once contingency has been admitted Hegel is driven either to admit some kind of dualism or to slide over the contingent element in nature as though it were not really real. However this may be, nature, in so far as it can be treated by the philosopher, is to be considered as a system of stages, of which one proceeds necessarily from the other. 8 But it must be clearly understood that the system of stages or levels in nature is a dialectical development of concepts and not an empirical history of nature. It is indeed somewhat amusing to find Hegel dismissing the evolutionary hypothesis in a cavalier manner. One but a physical hypothesis of this kind is in any case irrelevant to the philosophy of nature as expounded by Hegel. For it introduces the idea of temporal succession which has no place in the dialectical deduction of the levels of nature. And if Hegel had lived to a time when the evolutionary hypothesis had one wide acceptance, it would have been open to him to say, well, I dare say that I was wrong about evolution. But in any case it is an empirical hypothesis, and its acceptance or rejection does not affect the validity of my dialectic. As one would expect, the main divisions of Hegel's philosophy of nature are three in number. In the encyclopedia they are given as mathematics, physics, and organic physics, while in the lectures on the philosophy of nature they are given as mechanics, physics, and organics. In both cases, however, Hegel starts with space, with what is most removed from mind or spirit, 
and works dialectically up to the animal organism which of all levels of nature is the closest to spirit. Space is sheer externality, in the organism we find internality. Subjectivity can be said to make its appearance in the animal organism, though not in the form of self-consciousness. Nature brings us to the threshold of spirit, but only to the threshold. It is hardly worthwhile following Hegel into the details of his philosophy of nature. But attention should be drawn to the fact that he is not trying to do the work of the scientist all over again by some peculiar philosophical method of his own. He is concerned rather with finding in nature as known through observation and science the exemplification of a dynamic rational pattern. This may sometimes lead to bizarre attempts to show that natural phenomena are what they are, or what Hegel believes that they are, because it is rational and, so to speak, for the best that they should be what they are. And we may well feel somewhat sceptical about the value of this kind of speculative or higher physics, as well as amused at the philosopher's tendency to look down on empirical science from a superior position. But it is as well to understand that Hegel takes empirical science for granted, even if he sometimes takes sides, and not always to the advantage of his reputation, in controversial issues. It is more a question of fitting the facts into a conceptual scheme than of pretending to deduce the facts in a purely a priori manner. 4. The absolute is spirit, this is the highest definition of the absolute. To find this definition and to understand its content was, one may say, the final motive of all culture and philosophy. All religion and science have striven to reach this point one the absolute in itself is spirit, but it is potential rather than actual spirit. The absolute for itself, nature, is spirit, but it is self-alienated spirit, eight in religious language it is, as Hegel puts it, God in his otherness. Spirit begins to exist as such only when we come to the human spirit, which is studied by Hegel in the third main part of his system, the philosophy of spirit. The philosophy of spirit, needless to say, has three main parts or subdivisions. The two first parts of the doctrine of spirit treat of the finite spirit, for while the third part deals with absolute spirit, the logos in its concrete existence as self-thinking thought. In this section we shall be concerned only with the first part, to which Hegel gives the title Subjective Spirit. This first part of the philosophy of spirit is subdivided, according to Hegel's pervasive dialectical scheme, into three subordinate parts. Under the heading of anthropology he treats of the soul, seal, as sensing and feeling subject. The soul is, as it were, a point of transition from nature to spirit. On the one hand it reveals the ideality of nature, while on the other hand it is only the sleep of the spirit. 5. That is to say, it enjoys self-feeling, self-skifal, but not reflective self-consciousness. It is sunk in the particularity of its feelings. And it is actual precisely as embodied, the body being the externality of the soul. In the human organism soul and body are its inner and outer aspects. From the concept of the soul in this restricted sense Hegel passes to the phenomenology of consciousness, resuming some of the themes already treated in the phenomenology of spirit. The soul of the section on anthropology was subjective spirit considered on its lowest level, as a yet undifferentiated unity. On the level of consciousness, however, subj active spirit is confronted by why an object, first by an object regarded as external to and independent of the subject then, in self-consciousness, by itself. Finally, the subject is depicted as rising to universal self-consciousness in which it recognizes other selves as both distinct from and one with itself. Here, therefore, consciousness, consciousness, that is, of something external to the subject, and self-consciousness are unified on a higher level. The third section of the philosophy of subjective spirit is entitled Mind or Spirit, Geist, and it considers the powers or general modes of activity of the finite spirit as such. We are no longer concerned simply with slumbering spirit, the soul of the section on anthropology, nor, as in phenomenology, with the ego or subject in relation to an object. We have returned from the finite spirit as term of a relation to spirit in itself but at a higher level than that of soul. 
in a sense we are concerned with psychology rather than with the phenomenology of consciousness. But the psychology in question is not empirical psychology but a dialectical deduction of the concepts of the logically successive stages in the activity of the finite spirit in itself. Hegel studies the activity of the finite spirit or mind in both its theoretical and its practical aspects. Under the theoretical aspect he treats, for instance, of intuition, memory, imagination and thought, while under the practical aspect he considers feeling, impulse, and will. And his conclusion is that the actual free will is the unity of the theoretical and practical spirit, free will which exists for itself as free will. One he is speaking, of course, of the will as conscious of its freedom. And this is will as free intelligence we can say, therefore, that the concept of spirit in itself is the concept of the rational will, der Vernienftige wiue. But whole regions of the world, Africa and the East, have never had this idea and do not yet have it. The Greeks and the Romans, Plato and Aristotle, also the Stoics, did not have it. On the contrary, they knew only that man is actually free by birth, as a citizen of Athens or Sparta and so on, or through strength of character, education, or philosophy, the wise man is free even when he is a slave and in chains. This idea entered the world through Christianity, according to which the individual as such possesses an infinite value. That is, that man in himself is destined to the highest freedom eight this idea of the realization of freedom is a kaidea in Hegel's philosophy of history. 5. We have seen that the absolute in itself objectifies or expresses itself in nature. So also does spirit in itself objectify or express itself, issuing, as it were, out of its state of immediacy. Thus we come to the sphere of objective spirit, the second main part of the philosophy of spirit as a whole. The first phase of objective spirit is the sphere of right, das Recht. The person, the individual subject conscious of his freedom, must give external expression to his nature as free spirit, he must give himself an external sphere of freedom. One and he does this by expressing his will in the realm of material things. That is to say, he expresses his free will by effectively appropriating and using material things. Personality confers the capacity for having and exercising rights such as that of property. A material thing, precisely because it is material and not spiritual, can have no rights, it is an instrument for the expression of rational will. By its being taken possession of and used to things non-personal nature is actually revealed and its destiny fulfilled. Indeed, it is in a sense elevated by being thus set in relation to a rational will. A person becomes the owner of a thing not by a merely internal act of will but by effective appropriation, by embodying his will in it, as it were. Two but he can also withdraw his will from the thing, thereby alienating it. And this is possible because the thing is external to him. A man can relinquish his right, for example, to a house. He can also relinquish his right to his labor for a limited time and for a specified purpose. For his labor can then be looked upon as something external. But he cannot alienate his total freedom by handing himself over as a slave. For his total freedom is not and cannot properly be regarded as something external to himself. Nor can his moral conscience or his religion be regarded as an external thing. 3. In Hegel's somewhat odd dialectical progression the concept of alienation of property leads us to the concept of contract, vertrag. True, alienation of property might take the form of withdrawing one's will, as it were, from a thing and leaving it ownerless. I might alienate an umbrella in this way. But we then remain within the sphere of the abstract concept of property. We advance beyond. This sphere by introducing the concept of the unity of two or more individual wills in respect of property, that is, by developing the concept of contract. When a man gives, sells, or exchanges by agreement, two wills come together. But he can also agree with one or more persons to possess and use certain property in common for a common end. And here the union of wills, mediated by an external thing, is more evident. But though contract rests on a union of wills, there is obviously no guarantee that the particular wills of the contracting parties will remain in union. 
In this sense the union of wills into a common will is contingent. And it comprises within itself the possibility of its own negation. This negation is actualized in wrong. The concept of wrong, however, passes through several phases, and Hegel considers in turn civil wrong, which is the result of incorrect interpretation rather than of evil intent or disrespect of other person's rights, fraud, and crime and violence. The notion of crime brings him to the subject of punishment, which he interprets as a cancellation of wrong, a cancellation which is said to be demanded even by the implicit will of the criminal himself. A criminal, according to Hegel, is not to be treated like an animal which has to be deterred or reformed. As a rational free being, he implicitly consents to and even demands the annulment of his crime through punishment. Now, it is easy to see how Hegel is led from the concept of contract to that of wrong. For contract, as a free act, involves the possibility of its violation. But it is not so easy to see how the concept of wrong can reasonably be regarded as the unity on a higher plane of the concepts of property and contract. However, it is obvious that Hegel's dialectic is often a process of rational reflection in which one idea leads more or less naturally to another than a process of strictly necessary deduction. And even though he persists in observing his uniform triadic scheme, there is not much point in pressing it. 6. In wrong there is an opposition between the particular will and the universal will, the principle of rightness, which is implicit in the common will expressed in contract. This is true at least of wrong in the form of crime. The particular will negates right, and in doing so it negates the conception or notion of the will, which is universal, the rational free will as such. As we have seen, punishment is the negation of this negation. But punishment is external, in the sense that it is inflicted by an external authority. The Opposition or negation can be adequately overcome only when the particular will is in harmony with the universal will, that is, when it becomes what it ought to be, namely in accord with the concept of the will as raised above mere particularity and selfishness. Such a will is the moral will. We are thus led to make the transition from the concept of right to that of morality, moralitat. It is important to note that the term morality is used by Hegel in a much more restricted sense than it bears in ordinary usage. True, the term can be used in a variety of ways in ordinary language. But when we think of morality, we generally think of the fulfillment of positive duties, especially in a social setting, whereas Hegel abstracts from particular duties, towards the family, for example, or the state, and uses the term for what he calls a determination of the will willens bestimthied, so far as it is in the interior of the will in general. One the moral will is free will which has returned on itself, that is, which is conscious of itself as free and which recognizes only itself, and no external authority, as the principle of its actions. As such the will is said to be infinite or universal not only in itself but also for itself. The moral standpoint is the standpoint of the will in so far as it is infinite not simply in itself but for itself too it is the will as conscious of itself as the source of its own principle of action in an unrestricted way Hegel does indeed introduce in passing the topic of obligation or ought, so yin. For the will considered as a particular finite will may not be in accordance with the will considered as universal, and what is willed by the latter thus appears to the former as a demand or obligation. And, as will be seen presently, he discusses action from the point of view of the responsibility of the subject for its action. But in his treatment of morality he is concerned with the autonomous free will in its subjective aspect, that is, with the purely formal aspect of morality, in the wider sense of the term. This purely formal treatment of morality is, of course, an unfortunate legacy from the Kantian philosophy. It is all the more important, therefore, to understand that morality, as Hegel uses the term, is a one-sided concept in which the mind cannot rest. It is certainly not his intention to imply that morality consists simply of inferiority. On the contrary, it is his intention to show that the purely formal concept of morality is inadequate. And we can say, therefore, that he treats the Kantian ethic as a one-sided moment in the dialectical development of the full moral consciousness. If, then, 
we use the term morality to mean the whole ethical life of man, it would be quite incorrect to say that Hegel makes it entirely formal and interior or subjective. For he does nothing of the kind. At the same time it is arguable that in the transition from morality in the restricted sense, moralitat, to the concrete ethical life, sitlichkeit, some important elements in the moral consciousness are omitted or at least slurred over. The subjective will externalizes itself in action. But the free will, as self-determined, has the right to regard as its own action, for which it can be held accountable, only those acts which stand in certain relations to it. We can say, therefore, that Hegel raises the question, for what actions can a person rightly be held accountable? Or, what are, properly speaking, the actions of a person? But it must be remembered that Hegel is thinking of the general formal characteristics of actions, and that he is not concerned at this stage with indicating where a person's concrete moral duties lie. For the matter of that, a person can be accountable for bad as well as for good actions. Hegel is, as it were, going behind the moral distinction between good and bad to the characteristics of action which make it possible for us to say that a person has acted morally or immorally. In the first place any change or alteration in the world which the subject brings about can be called his deed, hand lung. But he has the right to recognize as his action, that, only that deed which was the purpose, vorsatz, of his will. The external world is the sphere of contingency, and I cannot hold myself responsible for the unforeseeable consequences of my action. It does not follow, of course, that I can disavow all its consequences. For some consequences are simply the outward shape which my acting necessarily assumes, and they must be counted as comprised within my purpose. But it would be contrary to the idea of the self-determining free will to hold myself responsible for the unforeseeable consequences or alterations in the world which are in some sense my deed but which were certainly not comprised within my purpose. Purpose is thus the first phase of morality. The second is intention, absict, or, more accurately, intention and welfare or well-being, das wall. It seems true to say that we generally use the words purpose and intention synonymously. But Hegel distinguishes between them. If I apply a lighted match to inf flammable material in the grate, the natural and foreseen consequence of my action is the ensuing fire. My purpose was to light the fire. But I should not perform this action except in view of an intended end, such as warming myself or drying the room and my intention is relevant to the moral character of the action. It is not, of course, the only relevant factor. Hegel is far from saying that any sort of action is justified by a good intention. But intention is nonetheless a moment or relevant factor in morality. Hegel assumes that intentions are directed to welfare or well-being. And he insists that the moral agent has a right to seek his own welfare, the satisfaction of his needs as a human being. He is not suggesting, of course, that egoism is the norm or morality. But at present we are considering morality apart from its social framework and expression. And when Hegel insists that a man has a right to seek his own welfare, he is saying that the satisfaction of one's needs as a human being belongs to morality and is not opposed to it. In other words, he is defending a point of view comprised in Greek ethics as represented by Aristotle and rejecting the Kantian notion that an act loses its moral value if performed from inclination. In his opinion it is quite wrong to suppose that morality consists in a constant warfare against inclinations and natural impulses. But though the individual is entitled to seek his own welfare, morality certainly does not consist in the particular will seeking its particular good. At the same time this idea has to be preserved and not simply negated. Hence we must proceed to the idea of the particular will identifying itself with the rational and so universal will and aiming at universal welfare. And the unity of the particular will with the concept of the will in itself, that is, with the rational will as such, is the good, das gut, which can be described as the realization of freedom, the absolute final purpose of the world. 1. The rational will as such is a man's true will, his will as a rational, free being. And the need for conforming his particular will, 
his will as this or that particular individual, to the rational will, to his true self, one might say, presents itself as duty or obligation. Inasmuch, therefore, as morality abstracts from all concrete positive duties, we can say that duty should be done for duty's sake. A man ought to conform his particular will to the universal will, which is his true or real will, and he ought to do so. Simply because it is his duty. But this, of course, tells us nothing about what a man ought to will in particular. We can only say that the good will is determined by the subject's inward certainty, which is conscience, jwissen. Conscience expresses the absolute right of subjective self-consciousness to know in itself and through itself what is right and duty, and to recognize nothing as good other than what it knows to be good, at the same time asserting that what it knows and wills as good is in truth right and duty. One Hegel thus incorporates into his account of morality what we may perhaps call the Protestant insistence on inwardness and on the absolute authority of conscience. But pure subjectivism and inwardness are really abhorrent to him. And he proceeds immediately to argue that to rely on a purely subjective conscience is to be potentially evil. If he had contented himself with saying that a person's conscience can err and that some objective norm or standard is required, he would have been expounding a familiar and easily intelligible position. But he gives the impression of trying to establish a connection between undiluted moral inwardness and wickedness, at least as a possible conjunction. Exaggeration apart, however, his main point is that we cannot give a definite content to morality on the level of pure moral inwardness. To do so, we have to turn to the idea of organized society. The concepts of abstract right and of morality are thus for Hegel one-sided notions which have to be unified on a higher level in the concept of ethical life, Sittlichkeit. That is to say, in the dialectical development of the sphere of objective spirit they reveal themselves as moments or phases in the development of the concept of concrete ethics, phases which have at the same time to be negated, preserved, and elevated. Concrete ethics is for Hegel social ethics. It is one's position in society which specifies one's duties. Hence social ethics is the synthesis or unity at a higher level of the one-sided concepts of right and morality. 7. Hegel's way of dealing with the concrete life is to deduce the three moments of what he calls the ethical substance, dicit like substance. These are the family, civil society, and the state. One might perhaps expect him to consider man's concrete duties in this social setting. But what he actually does is to study the essential natures of the family, civil society, and the state and to show how one concept leads to another. It is not necessary, he remarks, to add that a man has these or those duties towards his family or towards the state. For this will be sufficiently evident from a study of the natures or essences of these societies. In any case it cannot properly be expected of the philosopher that he should draw up a code of particular duties. He is concerned with the universal, with the dialectical development of concepts, rather than with moralizing. The family, the first moment in the ethical substance or union of moral subjectivity and objectivity, is said to be the immediate or natural ethical spirit. One in the social sphere the human spirit, issuing, as it were, out of its inwardness, objectifies itself first of all in the family. This is not to say that in Hegel's opinion the family is a transitory institution which passes away when other types of society have reached their full development. It is to say that the family is the logically prior society inasmuch as it represents the universal in its logically first moment of immediacy. The members of the family are considered as one, united primarily by the bond of feeling, that is, by love. To the family is what one might call a feeling totality. It is, as it were, one person whose will is expressed in property, the common property of the family. But if we consider the family in this way, we must add that it contains within itself the seeds of its own dissolution. Within the family, considered as a feeling totality and as representing the moment of universality, the children exist simply as members. They are, of course, individual persons, but they are such in themselves rather than for themselves. In the course of time, however, they pass out of the unity of family life into the condition of individual persons, 
each of whom possesses his own plans in life and so on. It is as though the particulars emerge out of the universality of family life and assert themselves as particulars. The notion of the comparatively undifferentiated unity of the family breaking up through the emergence of particularity is not in itself, of course, the notion of a society. Rather is it the notion of the dissolution or negation of a society. But this negation is itself negated or overcome in what Hegel calls civil society, die Beierger like a set shaft, which represents the second moment in the development of social ethics. To understand what Hegel means by civil society we can first picture a plurality of individuals, each of whom seeks his own ends and endeavors to satisfy his own needs. We must then conceive them as united in a form of economic organization for the better furtherance of their ends. This will involve specialization of labor and the development of economic classes and corporations. Further, an economic organization of this kind requires for its stability the institution of law and the machinery of law enforcement, namely law courts, a judiciary, and police. Inasmuch as Hegel considers the political constitution and government under the heading of the state and not under that of civil society, we may be inclined to comment that the latter could never exist. For how can there be laws and the administration of justice except in a state? The answer is, of course, that there cannot. But Hegel is not concerned with maintaining that civil society ever existed in the precise form in which he describes it. For the concept of civil society is for him a one-sided and inadequate concept of the state itself. It is the state as external state. One that is to say, it is the state with the latter's essential nature omitted. In other words, Hegel is concerned with the dialectical development of the concept of the state. And he does so by taking two one-sided concepts of society and showing that both represent ideas which are united on a higher plane in the concept of the state. The family, of course, persists in the state. So does civil society. For it represents an aspect of the state, even though it is only a partial aspect. But it does not follow that this aspect, taken in isolation and called civil society, ever actually existed precisely as such. The dialectical development of the concept of the state is a conceptual development. It is not equivalent to the statement that, historically speaking, the family existed first, then civil society, then the state, as though these concepts were all mutually exclusive. If we interpret Hegel in this way, we shall probably be inclined to think that he is concerned with expounding a thoroughly totalitarian theory of the state as against, for example, the sort of theory advanced by Herbert Spencer which more or less corresponds, though with certain important qualifications, to the concept of civil society. But though Hegel would doubtless have regarded Spencer's theory of society as very inadequate, he thought of the moment of particularity, represented by the concept of civil. 8. The family represents the moment of universality in the sense of undifferentiated unity. Civil society represents the moment of particularity. The state represents the unity of the universal and the particular. Instead of undifferentiated unity we find in the state differentiated universality, that is, unity in difference. And instead of sheer particularity one we find the identification of the particular with the universal will. To put the matter in another way, in the state self-consciousness has risen to the level of universal self-consciousness. The individual is conscious of himself as being a member of the totality in such a way that his selfhood is not annulled but fulfilled. The state is not an abstract universal standing over against its members, it exists in and through them. At the same time by participation in the life of the state the members are elevated above their sheer particularity. In other words, the state is an organic unity. It is a concrete universal, existing in and through particulars which are distinct and one at the same time. The state is said to be the self-conscious ethical substance. To it is ethical mind as substantial will manifest and clear to itself, which thinks and knows itself and accomplishes what it knows in so far as it knows it. 3. The state is the actuality of the rational will when this has been raised to the plane of universal self-consciousness. It is thus the highest expression of objective spirit and the preceding moments of the sphere are resumed and synthesized in it. For instance, 
rights are established and maintained as the expression of the universal rational will. And morality obtains its content. That is to say, a man's duties are determined by his position in the social organism. This does not mean, of course, that a man has duties only to the state and none to his family. For the family is not annulled in the state, it is an essential, if subordinate, moment in the state's life. Nor does Hegel mean to imply that a man's duties are determined once and for all by an unchangeable social position. For though he insists that the welfare of the whole social organism is paramount, he also insists that the principle of individual freedom and personal decision is not annihilated in the state but preserved. The theory of my station and its duties, to use Bradley's famous phrase, does not imply acceptance of some sort of caste system. It is indeed undeniable that Hegel speaks of the state in the most exalted terms. He even describes it, for instance, as this actual God. One but there are several points to be borne in mind. In the first place the state, as objective spirit, is necessarily divine in some sense. And just as the absolute itself is identity indifference, so is the state, though on a more restricted scale. In the second place it is essential to remember that Hegel is speaking throughout of the concept of the state, its ideal essence. He has no intention of suggesting that historical states are immune from criticism. Indeed, he makes this point quite clear. The state is no work of art, it stands in the world, and so in the sphere of caprice, contingency, and error, it can be disfigured by evil conduct in many respects. But the ugliest human being, the criminal, the diseased and the cripple, each is still a living man. The positive element, life, remains in spite of the privation, and it is with this positive element that we have to do here too in the third place we must bear in mind Hegel's insistence on the fact that the mature or well-developed state preserves the principle of private liberty in the ordinary sense. He maintains indeed that the will of the state must prevail over the particular will when there is a clash between them. And inasmuch as the will of the state, the universal or general will, is for him in some sense the real will of the individual, it follows that the individual's identification of his interests with those of the state is the actualization of freedom. For the free will is potentially universal, and, as universal, it wills the general good. There is a strong dose of Rousseau's doctrines in Hegel's political theory. At the same time it is unjust to Hegel to draw from the highfalutin way in which he speaks of the majesty and divinity of the state the conclusion that his ideal is a totalitarian state in which private freedom and initiative are reduced to a minimum. On the contrary, a mature state is for Hegel one which ensures the maximum development of personal liberty which is compatible with the sovereign rights of the universal will. Thus he insists that while the stability of the state requires that its members should make the universal end their end one according to their several positions and capacities, it also requires that the state should be in a real sense the means to the satisfaction of their subjective aims registered as already remarked, the concept of civil society is not simply cancelled out in the concept of the state. In his treatment of the state Hegel discusses first the political constitution and he represents constitutional monarchy as being the most rational form. But he regards a corporative state as more rational than democracy after the English model. That is to say, he maintains that the citizens should participate in the affairs of the state as members of subordinate wholes, corporations, or estates, rather than as individuals. Or, more accurately, representatives should represent corporations or estates rather than the individual citizens precisely as such. And this view seems to be required by Hegel's dialectical scheme. For the concept of civil society, which is preserved in that of the state, culminates in the idea of the corporation. It has frequently been said that by deducing constitutional monarchy as the most rational form of political organization Hegel canonized the Prussian state of his time. But though he may, like Fichte, have come to regard Prussia as the most promising instrument for educating the Germans to political self-consciousness, his historical sense was far too strong to allow him to suppose that one particular type of constitution could be profitably adopted by any given nation without regard to its history, traditions, and spirit. He may have talked a good deal about the rational state, 
but he was far too reasonable himself to think that a constitution could be imposed on all nations simply because it corresponded best with the demands of abstract reason. A constitution develops out of the spirit of a nation only in identity with this spirit's own development, and it runs through, together with this spirit, the grades of formation and the alterations required by its spirit. It is the indwelling spirit and the history of the nation, and, indeed, the history is simply the history of this spirit, by which constitutions have been and are made three again, Napoleon wished to give the Spaniards, for example, a constitution a priori, but the attempt fared badly enough. For a constitution is no mere artificial product, it is the work of centuries, the idea and the consciousness of the rational in so far as it has been developed in a P.E.O.P.L.E. What Napoleon gave the Spaniards was more rational than what they had before, and yet they rejected it as something alien to them. One Hegel further observes that from one point of view it is idle to ask whether monarchy or democracy is the best form of government. The fact of the matter is that any constitution is one-sided and inadequate unless it embodies the principle of subjectivity, that is, the principle of personal freedom, and answers to the demands of mature reason. 8. In other words, a more rational constitution means a more liberal constitution, at least in the sense that it must explicitly allow for the free development of individual personality and respect the rights of individuals. Hegel was by no means so reactionary as has sometimes been supposed. He did not hanker after the ancien régime. 9. It is worth drawing attention to Hegel's general idea of political theory. His insistence that the philosopher is concerned with the concept or ideal essence of the state may suggest that in his opinion it is the philosopher's business to show politicians and statesmen what they should aim at, by portraying more or less in detail a supposedly ideal state, subsisting in some platonic world of essences. But if we look at the preface to the philosophy of right we find Hegel denying in explicit terms that it is the philosopher's business to do anything of the kind. The philosopher is concerned with understanding the actual rather than with offering political schemes and panaceas. And in a sense the actual is the past. For political philosophy appears in the period of a culture's maturity, and when the philosopher attempts to understand the actual, it is already passing into the past and giving place to new forms. In Hegel's famous words, when philosophy paints its grey on grey, then has a shape of life grown old. And by this grey on grey it can only be understood, not rejuvenated. The owl of Minerva spreads its wings only with the falling of the dusk eight some thinkers, of course, have supposed that they were delineating an eternal pattern, a changeless ideal essence but in Hegel's opinion they were mistaken. Even the Platonic Republic, which passes proverbially as an empty ideal, was in essence nothing but an interpretation of Greek ethical life for after all, every individual is a son of his time and it is just as foolish to suppose that a philosophy can transcend its contemporary world as it is to suppose that an individual can overleap his own time. Z1 The clear expression of this view obviously constitutes an answer to those who take too seriously Hegel's apparent canonization of the Prussian state. For it is difficult to suppose that a man who understood very well that Aristotle, for example, canonized the Greek polis or city-state at a time when its vigorous life was already on the decline really supposed that the contemporary state of his own period represented the final and culminating form of political development. And even if Hegel did think this, there is nothing in his philosophy as such to warrant his prejudice. On the contrary, one would expect the sphere of objective spirit to undergo further developments as long as history lasts. Given this interpretation of political philosophy, the natural conclusion to draw is that the philosopher is concerned with making explicit what we may call the operative ideal of the culture or nation to which he belongs. He is an interpreter of the spirit of his time, Die Zeitgeist. In and through him the political ideals of a society are raised to the level of reflective consciousness. And a society becomes self-conscious in this way only when it has reached maturity and looks back, as it were, on itself, at a time, that is to say, when a form of life has already actualized itself and is ready to pass into or give way to another. No doubt, this is partly what Hegel means. His remarks about Plato's Republic show that it is. But in this case, it may be asked, 
how can he at the same time speak of the political philosopher as being concerned with the concept or essence of the state? The answer to this question must be given, I think, in terms of Hegel's metaphysics. The historical process is the self-actualization of spirit or reason. What is rational is real and what is real is rational too and the concept of spirit is the concept of identity indifference at the level of rational life. Objective spirit, therefore, which culminates in the state tends towards the manifestation of identity indifference in political life. And this means that a mature or rational state will unite in itself the moments of universality and difference. It will embody universal self-consciousness or the self-conscious general will. But this is embodied only in and through distinct finite spirits, each of which, as spirit, possesses infinite value. Hence no state can be fully mature or rational, it cannot accord with the concept of the state, unless it reconciles the conception of the state as an organic totality with the principle of individual freedom. And the philosopher, reflecting on the past and present political organizations, can discern how far they approximate to the requirements of the state as such. But this state as such is not a subsistent essence, existing in a celestial world. It is the telos or end of the movement of spirit or reason in man's social life. The philosopher can discern this telos in its essential outline, because he understands the nature of reality. But it does not follow that he is in a better position, as a philosopher, than is anyone else to prophesy the future or to tell statesmen and politicians what they ought to do. Philosophy always comes too late on the scene to do so one Plato may indeed have told contemporary Greeks how they ought, in his opinion, to organize the city-state. But he was in any case too late. For the shape of life which he dreamed of reorganizing was growing cold and would before long be ripe for decay. Utopian schemes are defeated by the movement of history. 10. Each state is in relation to other states a sovereign individual and demands recognition as such. The mutual relations between states are indeed partly regulated by treaties and by international law, which presuppose acceptance by the states concerned. But if this acceptance is refused or withdrawn, the ultimate arbiter in any dispute is war. For there is no sovereign power above individual states. Now, if Hegel was simply registering an obvious empirical fact in the international life of his time, there would be no reason for adverse comment. But he goes on to justify war, as though it were an essential feature of human history. True, he admits that war can bring with it much injustice, cruelty, and waste. But he argues that it has an ethical aspect and that it should not be regarded as an absolute evil and as a mere external contingent fact. Two on the contrary, it is a rational necessity. It is necessary that the finite, property and life, should be posited, as contingent. 3. And this is precisely what war does. It is the condition in which we have to take seriously the vanity of temporal goods and things, which otherwise is usually only an edifying phrase. For it should be noted that Hegel is not simply saying that in war a man's moral qualities can be displayed on an heroic scale, which is obviously true. Nor is he saying merely that war brings home to us the transitory character of the finite. He is asserting that war is a necessary rationed phenomenon. It is in fact for him the means by which the dialectic of history gets, so to speak, a move on. It prevents stagnation and preserves, as he puts it, the ethical health of nations. It is the chief means by which a people's spirit acquires renewed vigor or a decayed political organism is swept aside and gives place to a more vigorous manifestation of the spirit. Hegel rejects, therefore, Kant's ideal of perpetual peace. One obviously, Hegel had no experience of what we call total war. And he doubtless had the Napoleonic Wars and Prussia's struggle for independence fresh in his mind. But when one reads the passages in which he speaks of war and dismisses Kant's ideal of perpetual peace it is difficult to avoid the impression, partly comical and partly unpleasant, of a university professor romanticizing a dark feature of human history and decking it out with metaphysical trappings. 2-2. Mention of international relations and of war as an instrument by which the historical dialectic progresses brings us to the subject of Hegel's concept of world history. 
Hegel distinguishes three main types of history or, rather, historiography. First there is original history, that is to say, descriptions of deeds and events and states of society which the historian had before his eyes. Thucydides' history represents this type. Secondly there is reflective history. A general history, extending beyond the limits of the historian's experience, belongs to this type. So, for instance, does didactic history. Thirdly, there is philosophical history or the philosophy of history. This term, says Hegel, signifies nothing else but the thoughtful consideration of history. Three but it can hardly be claimed that this description, taken by itself, is very enlightening. And, as Hegel explicitly admits, something more must be said by way of elucidation. To say that the philosophy of history is the thoughtful consideration of history is to say that a thought is brought to this consideration. But the thought in question, Hegel insists, is not a preconceived plan or scheme into which the facts have somehow to be fitted. The only idea which philosophy brings with it that is, to the contemplation of history is the simple idea of reason, that reason dominates the world and that world history is thus a rationed process one as far as philosophy is concerned, this truth is provided in metaphysics. But in history as such it is an hypothesis. Hence the truth that world history is the self-unfolding of spirit must be exhibited as the result of reflection on history. In our reflection history must be taken as it is, we must proceed historically, empirically. To the obvious comment on this is that even if Hegel disclaims any desire to force history into a preconceived mold, the thought or idea which the philosopher brings to the study of history must obviously exercise a great influence on his interpretation of events. Even if the idea is professedly proposed as an empirically verifiable hypothesis, the philosopher who, like Hegel himself, believes that its truth has been demonstrated in metaphysics will undoubtedly be prone to emphasize those aspects of history which seem to offer support for the hypothesis. Moreover, for the Hegelian the hypothesis is redly no hypothesis at all but a demonstrated truth. Hegel remarks, however, that even the would-be impartial historians bring their own categories to the study of history. Absolute impartiality is a myth. And there cannot be a better principle of interpretation than a proven philosophical truth. Evidently, Hegel's general idea is more or less this. As the philosopher knows that reality is the self-unfolding of infinite reason, he knows that reason must operate in human history. At the same time we cannot tell in advance how it operates. To discover this, we have to study the course of events as depicted by historians in the ordinary sense and try to discover.